Hi, I'm Kevin Abosh. I'm here today with uh, Kenny Schachter and Kate Vass. Uh, Kate Vass is a, a gallerist, a founder of Kate Vass Gallery, an entrepreneur. Um, and uh, Kenny Schachter is a, an artist, uh, a writer, a uh, curator, um, and uh, lately general uh, uh, celebrity in the world of NFTs. I'm an artist. I've been working with blockchain technology since 2018. I've been making art for about 30 years. Um, and we're going to get into it. We're going to flip things around a little bit today. Uh, I'm usually I'm usually the one being asked questions, but I'm going to pose some questions today to, uh, to both Kate and Kenny, who are also uh, avid collectors of art. Uh, I'd like to start that off uh, by, by asking you, Kate. Uh, do you remember the first NFT you purchased? <laughs> well, that's a, actually, it's a good question. Um, I looked at, the, um, at my data and I found out that I'm not really in an um, extraordinary case. My first NFT was a CryptoPunk in 2018 um, okay. as a digital file. And I remember it was... Um, I was I was complaining because I was I was buying it with a colleague of mine and I said it's too expensive and it was it was about 0.3 ETH back at the time and I think it was like five hundred dollars and I was like mm, I'm so stingy probably I should not buy more than two so those those were my first uh, NFTs that I purchased. That was big. That was big money. Did you have you had appreh apprehension about buying an immaterial? I mean, had you bought immaterial like digital? Uh, art in the past um yeah i think some video works which are which okay. were still stored on uh, on as a videotapes um and i think you know some of the artists we still didn't find this um this way to transact from videotapes towards a digital file um so yeah i bought some back at the time um but um, since then since 2018 i've been collecting digital arts uh, quite intensely Sure. And what, what about you, Kenny? So, oh, sorry to cut you off. Were you going to say something? Else? No, no, sure. It's I'm fine. Gonna, I'm going to keep, keep this moving. We don't have a long time. Kenny, got to ask you, I know you were into digital art a long time ago, but uh, what was your first NFT? So I've, I've been making digital, like you, I've been involved for 30 years, more or less, uh, a little bit more. The first NFT I bought was by this brilliant young artist, Kevin Abosh. An amazing. <laughs> 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 I didn't know that. And, um, <laughs> and also, um, uh, Mika Johnson and Amoebit. Oh, great, great. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had planned this question, and I'm not even sure what the first one I got was. Oh, CryptoPunk, of course. I had a CryptoPunk, too. Uh, I, I actually bought five of them, uh, not for myself. I bought them as gifts, but I never ended up giving them away. Um, and then recently, I found myself uh, in a position where I... Well, I chose to divest myself of them. No, no hard feelings, Matt and John, creators of CryptoPunks, but uh, uh, they were just they were just too pricey. I had to get rid of them. Um, okay, so assuming uh, we here at NFT uh, uh, Tokyo, everybody uh, knows what an NFT is. Um, uh, I, I, we're we're going to move on a little bit into uh, into uh, a little more just kind of philo philosophical uh, discussion around 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 these. Uh, this technical structure uh, that is being used now and is so fashionable to deliver to deliver digital art. Um, Kate, uh, what percentage of the works do you think that you um, that you collect uh, in the collected in the last two years, for instance, are are NFTs? Is it a substantial portion of your collect your collecting these days? Well, obviously, you know, collecting NFTs is much easier than collecting physical art. 2019, 2020, partially, you know, it's been a year of NFT for me, you know, so I have more than, I used to have more than 300 works. I sold majority of it um, at the beginning of 2021. Uh, but uh, I mean, because of uh, the professional background that I also introduced many artists to the NFT space and I support them, I mean, it goes without saying that I also collect and support artists who I introduce. So I'm ending up buying anyway, um, whoever, um, whoever I, I represent as well. So it's, so it's, it's kind of, sorry, it, it's kind of um, tricky, you know, because I have to also separate my corporate and private collections. And if you ask about corporate collection, it's been mostly NFTs recently. Um, and in 2001, 
since the beginning, I've been collecting only physical works, vintages, unique ones, uh, some pioneers of digital art, um, because I also think, you know, NFT market now is a little bit overpriced and it's not really interesting to collect. And the last ones I've been collecting probably on Hick and Nunc with uh, Tesos, um, not with Ethereum-based uh, platforms. Right. I, collected, I shopped quite a lot for the last two weekends. I think I <laughs> purchased more than 30 works on Hick and Nunc because also it's affordable. Yeah, that's in interesting. Yeah, we're seeing alternative chains emerge for a number of reasons. We're seeing uh, prices go down for, I'm not sure exactly what's happening there. Uh, I'm, you have any insight into that, Kenny, this hick at Nunk? Why are the, why are the prices so low relative to the same artist's work on other, on other chains? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's a giant uh, misconception that NFTs and Ethereum are over, overpriced. I mean, there's been a market correction where since February, March, generally overall prices are down somewhere in the region of 80% which is a big move, oh. but, but they also rose substantially before that. So I That think, depends how you look at it. Yeah, well, I think Hick and Tunk is, uh, they're, rel they're less, I mean, because of Tezos, the currency is not as um, valued today as ETH. So generally, I think that's an artist run site from South America. And part of the ethos is that it's affordable, it's artist run, and because the currency is not yet, I mean, the NFTs, I said, like, the NFTs sort of suffered because of the success of NFTs, because it brought so much attention to Ethereum and the overall crypto market for Ethereum. Uh, NFTs fueled the rise. And then it got to the point where people say that NFTs are speculative vehicles. But in fact, the mm. currency, you know, it makes more sense to sit on the currency than to buy any NFTs today, really. Um, there's been a lot of vacillation yeah. in the prices. But so anyway, I think that Hick and Tunk is a good um, effort of a more environmentally friendly platform with, that's artist run. And therefore, it's they purposefully keep the prices down. And there's not sure. speculation. You know what? Currency. You know, one, one of my pet peeves, and, and it's been this way uh, for many years, uh, long before NFTs, is uh, I, I know with my own my own work, uh, I generally make news when there's a when there's a price tag uh, attached to to the story. Uh, you know, I sell this for this amount of money. This amount. It's, it's always leads with the with the money. And I'm seeing this now with all the headlines around fantastic NFT sales for millions and sixty nine million for this and two million for that. Uh, I I can't remember the last time I saw an NFT story that wasn't about the money. So what's going on, Kate? Like, are your are your client are your clients uh, collecting NFT works because they they love the art. They want to experience it uh, in some sort of meaningful way. Are they are they buying it as a form of social proof or validation, or or is it just an investment, or is it a combination of all of these things? That's a good question, Karen. Um, I think you know I have to divide them into into various groups. You know, there are some crypto collectors. They obviously collect because they're emotional about those arts, and they've been following crypto artists since it's uh, since uh, the foundation of the whole crypto space. So they are really passionate about what they collect and it's more kind of emotional purchases. When they talk about traditional art collectors who are coming into, into space and, and looking and trying to follow the trend, then probably, you know, it's just, you know, I would say 80% would be, um, um, you know, this kind of FOMO, you know, that they have, that they're missing sure. out on something big without properly understanding what's going on, but they still want to participate, you know, to go with the flow. And um, and then, you know, we start to dig into the topic and ask many questions. And, and I love those kind of collectors because they become also very passionate and, and start collecting. But of course, you know, they are more difficult because they they tend to choose artworks in a, in a sense of, um, you know, different way rather than the crypto collectors. And of course, you know, they're also flippers and investors, you know, pure speculators who are into the space okay. just for the sake of um, turning a, sh a short term profit. Um, fixing the prices as soon as they buy something, you know, they just start to flip. But uh, more so, more so, more so than the traditional art market. And 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 if so, has this been facilitated by the the platforms themselves? 
that's what I wanted to say. I'm lucky I'm not a I'm, I'm not a tech platform, you know, because for the tech platform it's kind of difficult to control. There are lots of bots and stuff like that, you know, who are bidding and 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 you know they have opportunity to buy everything and um, the platforms cannot really prohibit them from purchasing these NFTs. But me, because I have a personal relationship, and so I'm not going to click accept the button, you know, if I know that this guy is a flipper. And I try to make sure that those works stay at least, you know, for a couple of months with the same people, you know. And that's how I also ensure, you know, by selling digital and physical together, mm. you know, that um, if the person is not interested in physical work, analog over NFT, for example, um, that's a big um, kind of alarming sign for me as well. You know, it means probably he just wants to profit quite quickly. Mm. And of course, you know, it's a bit higher number because in physical world, as you know, it takes uh, much longer, you know, to flip the physical works with shipping, taxing, um, you know, dealing with the physical mm. Um, material uh, things is uh, always complicated, you know, rather than doing it digitally within the seconds. Sure. Uh, Kenny, you, you rub shoulders with some of the biggest names in the traditional art world and you have for decades. Uh, so I think you, you might have a bit of a barometer on this. Have they, are they fully bought into this? Just because we see NFT uh, auctions at Christie's and Sotheby's, are they fully bought into this? <laughs> I could answer for, in two hours, but... <laughs> I have never seen I have never seen such a polarizing um, phenomenon in thirty five almost uh, thirty three years. I've never seen anything like it. In fact, I would say ninety eight percent of the traditional fine art world is absolutely not facing up to the fact that NFTs are viable and will last more than ten seconds. So I would mm. say by far the majority of the traditional art world not only don't acknowledge NFTs, but outright reject them to the point that I've had people threaten to beat me up for espousing them so much. <laughs> so um, I would say yeah. there's probably a bell's curve of flipping going on, but in the NFT yeah. world, when you get your work flipped, the artists get a royalty, a residual payment. So for instance, I had to drop it at Nifty Gateway two weeks ago, and one piece was an addition of five, sold to five different I'm not going to say collectors because within a matter of days, every single piece had resold four of them to one buyer and one of them to a friend of mine who's a Google engineer, Devin Mitchum, and he's never sold an NFT. He's bought loads of them and he loves the art and has never sold one. Yeah. Well, you just opened the door here, Kenny. You, you, you've, you've enjoyed some, some rather, uh, you know, tremendous success in, in the last few months. Uh, I mean, you, you've been an artist since the 80s, uh, you, 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 uh, but I think for the last few years, you've you spent a lot of time writing and curating, and then suddenly you're like, uh, you're something of an NFT star yourself. How did that, was, did this, was, it, was this, did this start as a serious endeavor? Was it a joke? Like, it would, it, I mean, are you to be taken seriously right now? Tell, tell me what's going on. I'm a very serious jokester. No, I mean, I was dead serious. I mean, I don't take myself seriously in life because I'm not curing right. cancer, but I am right. I never mess. Art is my life. Art is in coursing through my circulatory system. And what I have to say is that the art world, traditional, is so hierarchical, so archly conservative, so backwards looking, so judgmental yeah. that, yeah. I mean, part of the reason that I've been dismissed, I've been, even though in the face of the fact that I've been making art for decades, is the fact that I do different disparate things to make a living. And because I love to teach, I love to write, and I've even dealt art in the past and had a series of single owner sales of portions of my collection to make a living, mainly because no one in the art world would, would take me seriously. Yes, they'll, they'll accept me as a writer after 20 plus years, but not as an artist. And in the digital sector, hmm. I jumped at the chance. I jumped on board when I first heard about uh, NFTs uh, almost a year ago. And I made a couple of thousand. It, it never even occurred to me that this would be a money maker for me. I didn't, that was when I first got involved, people had never sold a single piece of art in his life yet. And I was so grateful to get 4,000 at the time that, I mean, I already wrote then and there in, in, that came out in January in the art newspaper that NFTs were going to be a tremendous force in the traditional art world 
revolutionary, I would say, because it just absolutely transforms the nature of disseminating art into the commercial uh, stream of commerce. So I never took it as a joke. I mean, I take myself as a bit of a joke because humor is very important in the way that I communicate with people and make fun of myself and the whole art world. But the way they yep. react to NFTs is that's the joke, pathetic, small-minded, traditional art world people that just yeah. can't accept change yeah. in basic sense. Yeah, I, you know, since 2018, I've seen such a shift. Uh, I presented uh, some immaterial work that, that didn't even have a visual component. And and there were people who, 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 were, who were rather, ch you know, challenged by it. Uh, strangely enough, even cryptocurrency uh, investors themselves asking me, how can this thing have value? Uh, I, I, you know, it's something you can't hang on the wall, something you can't hold in your hand. I'm like, well, you can't put a Bitcoin on the wall and you can't uh, 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 hold a Bitcoin in your hand and yet you've invested millions of dollars. So in the case of my work, some of them were mechanically identical to cryptocurrencies and, and yet some, 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 some struggled with how something like this could, could have value. Three years on, I'm finding, I think there's, there's been quite a shift. Younger generation uh, of, of, of collectors who have experience perhaps with uh, with um, uh, digital assets and virtual goods and games, I think they uh, they understand this. I think it's really healthy this idea that uh, you know immaterial things can have just as uh, have, uh, have value. And there's and when people talk about value, by the way, I think there are different types of value, right? There's intrinsic value. There's yes, there's the financial value. There's so there's social value. There's so many flavors of value. Question though, for those who are concerned. Uh, I pose this to both of you, uh, Kenny. While you're there, I'll I'll I'll, I'll ask you first. Um, do you think that uh, these NFTs are going to hold their financial value over time? I mean, art is art, and great art holds its value. And I don't even believe that great art is subjective. In fact, I think if you take a Picasso that's 15 inches of certain color, certain composition from a certain year it has a concrete value. And if you put it in front of five experts across the world, they would come up with this value that didn't fluctuate more than five percentage points. So I think NFTs are, are a delivery system for digital art. Great. And also like a Vito Acconci or some of the great conceptual artists in the 60s were making video art in the form of VHS tapes and beta tapes. Absolutely. And there is yeah. absolute technology but the best art will always survive. So NFTs, it would be foolish to think the way that te technology time is, is basically like reducing the space time continuum, a half a year in technology is five years in the real world in meat space. Yeah. But um, sure, NFT formats are gonna change and the whole you know, pointing to the smart contract, pointing to a URL. Ultimately, we may see the art on the blockchain. Of course, there's going to be tremendous transformations in like IPFS and Arweave and all these other um, sit structural situations for storing the files. But NFTs or a digital marketplace to buy and sell digital art, forget the art itself, but this system will be here for the remainder of civilization in one form or mm. another. Yes, there'll be changes, Kay. but your art is art. I don't look at you as an NFT or a digital artist. You're a brilliant art artist. And Kate has been like on top right. of this phenomenon from the beginning. And she has the yeah. foresight and the wherewithal to be ahead of the curve. And I, one last thing, like the yeah. only thing worse than being behind the time is to be too far ahead of the time. But like technology, <laughs> technology is life. It's and this artificial yeah. intelligence comes from humans. So there's nothing really artificial about it. And I think NFTs and great digital art will last forever. Kate, good point. Kate, you were early. 2018, you put on a great show uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, the first uh, major major crypto art show I can think of. Um, it was really exciting, way ahead of its time. Do you find that all this technology needs to be explained to your clientele? I imagine you've got different you've got different types of clients, but is that a, is that a challenge for you? Uh, explaining the technology and also perhaps. Uh, mitigating some of the concern about uh, either longevity of the technology itself and, again, this value, the, whether or not the financial value uh, could take an unexpected hit. Yeah, definitely. You know, back in 2018, you know, um, we did host the, the, the one of the first blockchain shows, uh, Perfect and Priceless. Actually, the quote that I got from one of your works, Kevin, uh, in the collaboration with IYY, 
Um, but um, back in 2018, none of the works were presented digitally. You know, funny enough, it was about the blockchain and it was um, um, about technology, but none of them were actually, you know, an, as NFT. And um, even the, the crypto punks were also uh, printed and signed um, by the artists uh, for, for that type of exhibition. And yes, I mean, back in 2018, we had to spend much more time and we've been, uh, we've been hosting some educational sessions uh, through the exhibition period on a weekly basis, almost, you know, talking about the whole ecosystem, talking about mining, talking about Bitcoin, blockchain, because I remember many were not even um, differentiating the terms of Bitcoin and blockchain. For them, everything was just something with B, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, like also the way how you can acquire one, you know, by buying the crypto or, um, you know, selling with um, selling with fiat. Back in 2018, we had uh, only a couple of works which were priced at Ethereum. One work was by Terra Zero and it was priced for 77 uh, 7.7 ETH, and it was uh, one of the works which has not been solved, so sold because we didn't have a price in 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 fiat money, but the rest were all in US dollars, and um, you know it was more e easier for for people to also purchase. Um, coming back to your questions about education, I spent hours or on the phone on the Zoom meetings talking with traditional art collectors to explain the technology, how it works. Um, about cryptocurrencies, about taxation, about the um, storage and data security and how you can manage your collection and um, about all the details, you know, of understones that you actually can um, meet, you know, once you start collecting uh, digital art uh, as a form of NFTs. Um, because being a collector myself, I'm very, I'm challenging myself in order to also uh, make sure that I can also preserve my collection in the right way and um, do not have any problems with tax declaration or with uh, currencies or with uh, reselling the works if uh, that may um, happen. So I just, you know, I, I, I try to explain as I would explain to myself, to all the clients. Um, and I think, you know, with uh, all this tech um, progress, you know, like every day there is something new, uh, something about DeFi, something about uh, stable coins, some new kind of contract protocols introduced and stuff like that with new platforms coming in. It's an everyday job uh, in order to keep uh, yourself informed, in order to inform clients as well, that you have to always be a little bit ahead of the of the time in order to uh, to explain if the, the question pops up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here we are. So the NFT, uh, as we know it, is a crypto token associated with, um, uh, with, 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 with media, with content of some sort. That's sort of the, 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 the baseline. I'm interested in the future. I'm thinking that the NFT evolves into a node around which communities can communicate, they can collaborate, uh, they can leverage collective intelligence, maybe throw in a little bit of artificial intelligence in parallel. Uh, the boundaries between the artist, the artwork, uh, the audience, uh, this, this I, I, I think it, it gets really interesting when that's malleable. And, uh, and I think the NFTs of the future can, can leverage this uh, and take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, Kenny, any, any thoughts on the future of NFTs? I mean, even just like kind of, uh, you know, absurd uh, predictions or, or is there something in particular that you know is, uh, is, is uh, in our future? Well, I have this, I mean, Tupac Shakur recently went on tour and as far as I recall, he's still dead. So as a hologram and also in the Basel Art Fair in Hong Kong, uh, they, uh, many of the exhibitors didn't travel to Hong Kong because of COVID uh, travel restrictions. So there were holographic uh, projections. So I think that coming in the very near future, I mean, there's, like you said before, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the display, the physical display of this art. I mean, I don't really think of it as immaterial because I make, di I make digital videos and computer manipulated photographic work. And for me, they exist very much in the, as concretely as a sculpture or a painting. So, I mean, when you, like I mentioned before, like video art from the sixties, you buy a tape. People complain about NFTs. How do you view your, how did you view your videotape in 1969? You stuck it into a machine and viewed it on your television set 
And very much so, the same applies to an NFT. I mean, there are dedicated devices already where you can upload pieces onto your onto a tabletop device and you could view your NFT. So I think that there's going to be a lot of um, departures, a lot of progress made in terms of how you relate to your work. And this is beside the fact that the majority of the extant art in circulation is in freeport storages or museum basements. So we won't discuss sure. kind of uh, what gets seen and what doesn't get seen, but I could very easily see uh, you have a file in the form of an NFT and it becomes projected. And I'm sitting in a hotel room in Zurich and I could see like projecting some of my collection 3D, like in the middle of my hotel room, the way, uh, you know, Tupac went on concert and already artists have been employing holographic projections as a kind of ethereal sculptural form. So I think that there's gonna be a lot of crazy uh, progress in terms of how, instead of just looking on a phone or a computer screen or a television flat screen, there's gonna be some crazy inroads into how we interact with the physical love manifestation it. of our art. Yeah, love it, love it. Kate, thoughts? Yeah, I think so. I, I totally agree with Kenny uh, and with you as well, you know, but uh, apart from that, probably it's also will be a lot of interaction between physical and, and digital, you know, with the introduction of new sort of arts, you know, um, also exhibiting these NFTs in the decentralized virtual spaces, you know, where people can experience the same art that they can look, for example, I don't know, as an installation by one artist, you know, and if the, the same artist creates an NFT um, and it's exhibited in some sort of uh, decentralized decentral the virtual space you will have more kind of an artistic um, experiences you know like and you as a collector can actually feel about this work in a different way so I also think you know maybe that will be a direction to to go we don't have enough time so probably you we just want to yeah. pop up on our question yeah yeah I, I one more one more thing I'd like to add is in, in my last series 1111 uh, uh, 1111 NFTs um, uh, I, I've, I've, I'm trying to change the relationship between the uh, the collector and the artwork. Uh, we assume that the collector collects the artwork. Uh, I'm playing with the idea, perhaps, that it's the artwork that collects uh, the uh, collector, uh, and uh, and in that relationship between artist and collector, uh, which which I think up until now has seemed uh, rather simple. I like the idea that uh, over time. Uh, that that relationship can evolve in in unexpected ways, and with, through an NFT and with some clever coding, um, the artist, the creator, uh, or the community can uh, can 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 take advantage of that and surprise the collector in uh, in uh, in novel ways, uh, in meaningful ways, uh, perhaps even frightening ways. Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you guys on the spot here for a second. I spoke to you yesterday, uh, Kate briefly and Kenny briefly. I know we all are, are, are Nipponophiles, meaning we love Japan. Uh, I think that the three of us need to do something uh, with Japan. Uh, and uh, maybe, Kate, you have some thoughts on that. Because we talked about how Japanese art uh, has informed uh, European art, you know, from Degas to Toulouse-Lautrec to Van Gogh even, uh, the um, uh, ukiyo-e uh, uh, drawings, uh, for example. Um, and, 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 and how then the European art has come back uh, in various ways to inform contemporary Japanese art. What do you think? What can we do? What can we do in some, something meaningful in the next few months? Well, I think, you know, uh, what comes, what pops up to my, to my mind first, you know, maybe we can, you actually guys, you know, Kevin and, and Kenny, um, co-curate uh, some sort of uh, exhibition, you know, which, um, which can reflect, you know, this sort of um, influence of uh, Japanese uh, art um, towards the uh, Western art. Um, I also can refer also uh, for the Murakami uh, quote when he was talking about, you know, the founder of uh, Super Flat Movement. He was referring to that NFTs reflect the spirit of the times and and that it will fit it fits well with the Super Flat Movement. And Super Flat Movement is also. Uh, well, founded by uh, Takashi Murakami, and I don't know. I mean, we can look at that way, or we can just, you know, look at the history and 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 um, you know, see how Japanese art has been informing towards the Western world and Western art and backwards. Love it, love it. Kenny, you in? We're going to do something with great pleasure. In the meantime, Good. I have. 
there's I have some uh, there's a collaboration between Super Chief Gallery and uh, any Neo Shibuya TV and in Shibuya Crossing. Uh, in the next couple of days from this um, talk will be some projections on 88 screens of some work I've done and I'm working on a show with Blum and Poe. Um, but like I, you said, I think it's very important. I went to Tokyo to do a lot of it, travel throughout Japan to do research, uh, to incorporate cultural phenomenon and aspects of society in Japan into my work. And I would absolutely be thrilled to work right. with both great people in that capacity. Yeah, Great, we're we, going to make this happen. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And I think, you know, um, Japanese culture, like animated movies and manga and video games, you know, had a great, great impact on cultural impact, you know, also on NFTs and the artistic, uh, you know, visualization. Yeah, I, 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 I hadn't even thought about it. I, I, I'm collaborating on, a, on, a, on an anime and a manga pro project in, uh, in uh, Japan for the last uh, year or so. Yeah, and yeah. That, yeah. The, my yeah. crypto senshi, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's... Uh, as Japanese as it can be. I mean, I, I went, you know, it's funny in a little known fact, when I was around 10, 11 years old, I went to a, a Saturday Japanese school with my Japanese American friend. His mother sent him to learn how to do sumi uh, drawing and uh, um, to learn a little bit of Japanese. And so I used to go with him too. So it's deeply embedded in my, in my DNA. And I think we're out of time and it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kenny, uh, Thank you. for joining me uh, for NFT Tokyo. Yeah. In pleasure. Okay, bye everyone. Bye. bye. Hello, I'm Skirmantas, CEO and co-founder of TapRider. And I want to tell you what TapRider is about and what we do. So who we are? We are the number one global DAP store. We want to make exploring, tracking and managing your DAPs easy, insightful, convenient, and rewarding for everyone. So we started back in 2018, bringing high quality, accurate insights on decentralized applications. And we do it to a global audience and we rapidly became the go-to place for dApps and dApp data. Today, we are the starting point for dApp discovery. We're hosting over 5,000 dApps from over 20 different blockchains and protocols. We offer comprehensive NFT evaluation and portfolio management and lead the way in actionable industry reporting. That's what we do. And we are a app store. And you know, an app store sounds like an app store, right? But when you look deeper, they're so much different. See, dApps are not just for fun. It's an open economy and almost every single dApp has something to offer. Is it collecting NFTs? Is it playing to earn, is it investing in some protocol or application? All of that requires more than just a nice image, nice logo, you know, to attract that precious user. That is why we at DappRadar provide not only a way to discover those dApps, but also we provide the highest quality accurate data. And this is important to understand how a specific dApp is doing, you know, how healthy the ecosystem is. How is this blockchain doing compared to another one? Which one should I use? All this data, together with our unique insights and authoritative reporting, makes a great combo. So you can always head to our blog to get a better understanding of, of the latest market developments. And the last but not least, we are offering an expanding suite of tools and a developer hub. So if you're a dev developer, get there and enjoy the outcome. Now, for more than three years at DappRadar, we believe that the future is multi-chain. There is no single chain that will satisfy everyone and every use case. So the future is multi-chain. We don't have any doubt in that. And that is why we're tracking over 20 different blockchains already. We're blockchain agnostic. That means whichever dApp or blockchain you're using, you can find relevant information about it on that radar. Is it Ethereum? Is it Binance Smart Chain, Polygon, Wax, Flow, Avalanche? You name it, we have it. So the future, of dApps, DeFi, NFTs, or any other vertical you can think of, it will be multi-chain. And similar to being multi-chain, DappRider is also multi-vertical. The market is always moving in cycles. You know, we had kind of a experimental DeFi cycle, then we had DeFi, now we have NFTs, and the market is always moving in these cycles. In some phases, some of those cycles 
you could be mistaken and think that only this specific vertical, this specific category matters, like it happened last summer with DeFi. It was all about DeFi, nothing else. But we at DevRider, we always knew this is just another cycle. And eventually, all the verticals are going to be very important. We're here to help you understand what is going on with blockchain games, with DeFi dApps, NFTs, various marketplaces and exchanges. When the health or energy sector or any other vertical comes to dApps, we will make sure to reflect these developments as well, because this is what we do. And now I'll bring you a quick overview of our products. As you know, we started with just general DAP rankings, but we have expanded it further uh, so much now. So let's begin from just rankings. This is how we started having rankings, but uh, as I said, uh, we went from just having traditional rankings towards having a separate rankings for DeFi and what's more important now for NFTs. So we have integrated over 50 different applications to be able to summarize and display NFT market status at any point in time. And what you can find here on the screen is our NFT rankings. So, you know, you can find top collections, you can find top NFT marketplaces, top NFT sales happening live. So is the market on fire? What is the number one collection in terms of trading volume now or in the last month? How much did the most expensive NFT cost last month? All of those questions, you can find answers to all of those questions on our NFT rankings. Um, going forward, it's about NFT valuation. It's a pretty hard thing to do. You know, it, this is an uncharted territory. So unlike fungible tokens, NFTs are unique and it's much harder to put a price tag on them, but that's not impossible. So what we do, we are analyzing market movements. We're tracking, you know, the cheapest NFTs available on the market. We're looking at the last sale price. We're looking at, at the ways how to estimate the value of your NFTs. So if you want to know how much your CryptoPunk is worth nowadays, head to that Predator portfolio tracker. This portfolio tracker that we have is built with the vision that it has to be complementary. It's not about one vertical. It's not just for DeFi. It's not just for NFTs, it's not just for fungible tokens. It's about all of that. We think that's crucial to have a proper portfolio tracker. So what you can currently find on that Predator portfolio tracker is this. First of all, it's fungible tokens. What kind of tokens you have? What's the dollar value of these tokens? What can you do with them? Second, DeFi investments. So keep track of your DeFi investments. Is the value going up or down? Reactive needed. Then we have a My DApp section, which shows you which DApps you have used, how much money was involved, how much did you spend, how much did you receive? Then we have gas statistics. Sometimes when gas prices are high, that's a pretty sad metric to look at but it basically shows you how much gas fees you have paid for using various applications. And you can see it per DAP. And finally, the NFT portfolio. So you can look at your NFTs and find an estimated last sale or a floor price attached for a better evaluation of your whole NFT portfolio. All of that, what I just said, and much more is available right now at dapradio.com. So head there and try for yourself. But why don't I just show you how it looks like in reality. So let's start with one of the biggest DeFi and NFT whales out there. One of the well-known DeFi whales, which is V1. And this is the one that we're looking at. So if we go to an overview, what you can find here is total amount of holdings in fungible tokens, how, many, how much value you're holding in terms of NFTs and DeFi. And what's also interesting, you can check how much gas that specific wallet spent over the lifetime. And you can see that this specific wallet spent almost $1.4 million just on making transactions on Ethereum, which is pretty crazy. But overall, what you can find here, you know, this is an overview, so holdings, historical holdings, what kind of NFTs you have and how much money, how much savings do you have in DeFi and loans but apparently this wallet has no loans right now. So you can look at your assets in depth, what kind of tokens you're holding, how much value there is. You know, you can see the token price, you can see how much that is worth in your wallet, and you can see all of those tokens out there. 
So, but that's the, the most basic kind of feature. When we get further, for example, for NFTs, you can see all those NFTs out there that the wallet is holding. You can select from different collections. Uh, you can look at what's the price. So currently on these NFTs, we have the last sale price available and we show it. In some cases, uh, there is also an estimated price or the floor price, um, you know, so all of that is possible and you can find it on that Raiders portfolio. Now, if you look at DeFi, it also shows where exactly you have invested certain amount of money and what kind of assets you put in there to work. All of that is possible because we look at the portfolio as a complementary solution. All of that has to be there. And you know, as the last point on the portfolio, we can look at my dApps section, which is basically showing how much money, how much value have you sent to the app or received and how much gas you have spent over time. So currently it's sorted by the gas spent and you can see that this app spent almost $200,000 gas just on cream and almost the same value on Uniswap. So all these insights you can compare, okay, I earned this amount of money from this app, but okay, how much gas did I pay? Was it worth it? All these kind of insights you can find on that Raider portfolio. So head there, try it out. You don't need to connect. You can look up anyone's wallet and that's pretty dope. Then if you want to look into a specific NFT and how much it's worth and so on, you can look at our NFT value estimator. And what you can find here, for now we only support CryptoPunks, uh, more collections to come soon. But let's say you own a CryptoPunk number 22 and you can get an estimated price out of this tool pretty easily. You would also see it in the portfolio, but if you are considering to buy or you don't know what would be the estimated value of that specific punk, you can just go to our NFT value estimator and look up these crypto punks very easily. So you can see if you want to buy in crypto punk number nine, you can see that we estimate it at around $68,000. This is definitely not an investment advice, uh, but we're looking at the previous sales uh, about the current market developments, about the attributes. Is it you know some rare attribute or is it a common one? And we do that judgment based on those attributes and values. And the last point is our NFT page, NFT rankings page. So if you want to know what's happening around NFTs, if you want to know how is the market developing right now or what was the what was the trend in the in the past, this is where you should go. So you hop on this page called NFTs and you can see the overview, you can see top collections, top sales and marketplaces. If you just look overall, this is what you can find, all of that in one page. So if you choose last 24 hours, you can see that X Infinity is the leading one. Then we have also the Board Yacht Club, Board AP Yacht Club, and some top sales that were happening in the last 24 hours. And here you can simply select what kind of time range you want to look at. So if you look at 30 days, again, something that you can see is that in the last 30 days, what I was mentioning about, well, mainly all the collections lost their volume from kind of 20% to 70%, but there are some either newcomers or some that are doing really well, like uh, the newcomer is the board AP Act Club, look, plus 50% volume in the last 30 days. For Axie, that's a phenomenon. That's a phenomenon. Look, if you, that was basically tripling the volume, more than triple the volume. And that was based because they launched Ronin and they moved all the axes and, and, and all the items to Ronin, which is a gas-free environment. So really an open economy, uh, no need to pay high fees for the protocol and have really working. We can see it's working. So let's just wait till more dApps uh, move towards, you know, kind of gas-free or cheaper protocols. And then we'll see the true power of NFTs and how much volume we can have in there. And if you're interested, you know, in kind of all time sales, uh, what's the highest NFT price at, at all times and so on, you can hop to the top sales page where basically you choose all time and you see, okay, what were the most expensive NFTs of all time sold on chain? And you can see that, okay, CryptoPunks are the two most expensive ones, but then there are a whole ton of different NFTs. So it's not just collections. It's some art, it's some real estate down there. It's really interesting to look at that. 
and do your decisions. So that's how our products look like. Go give it a chance. And you can always share feedback here. If you like something, if you don't like, if you think there is something we should add, use that chance. We can make it work for everyone. And if you think that everything I just showed you, you know, and, and the industry is still small, look at those numbers. Uh, well, these are, these are our numbers. We're growing very fast, but that's reflecting majority of the ecosystem. So over 5,000 dApps are already on dApp radar and new ones are appearing daily. We have more than 20 blockchains and protocols integrated, so you can find apps on all of them, no matter which ones you're using. And finally, we are now serving more than half a million users every month. So this is the biggest dApp distribution place in the ecosystem. If you want to know about new dApps, about new big dApps out there, go on dApp radar. If you want to have your dApp listed and get lots of traction, lots of visitors, customers, get onto dApp radar now. And this is what we currently have, but that's not all. We have a very exciting roadmap ahead. So we're going to add social trading functionality. We're going to have enhanced app reporting and exclusive market intelligence. And, you know, there is one special thing for our community that I will not disclose now, but stay tuned and join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Discord, Instagram, Telegram, whichever you prefer, get there and let's chat. And now, thank you for your attention. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Non-Fungible Tokyo 2021. So next session is 2022 NFT industry forecast. And we have amazing speakers here. And so I think it is very, very unique situation because NFT platform all start gathering together and discuss and talking about the uh, uh, NFT industry forecast. I'm very excited. So yeah, everyone. So <laughs> thank you for joining this session. And so first of all, please introduce yourself shortly. Uh, please start from uh, Kayvon. Thank you for having me. I'm Kayvon, uh, the founder and CEO of Foundation. Uh, we are an NFT platform. We, we focus on single edition NFTs. Um, we are very new to the scene. We only launched um, a few months ago and you can visit us at foundation.app. Thank you. And Alex? Uh, hi everyone. Thank you for the invitation to, to this amazing conference. Uh, I'm Alex Salnikov. I'm co-founder and head of product of Rarible. Rarible is the NFT marketplace, one of the leading NFT marketplaces out there. We focus to more or less all NFTs. We really try to make the website beautiful. That's why it's appealing to creators. Um, the multiple editions are what's the most popular on our marketplace. So it's like the people's exchange of NFTs. Amazing. Thank you, Alex. And Danny, please. Hey everyone, thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Maker's Place. Uh, so Maker's Place, uh, we're a premier marketplace for rare digital art. 
our NFT art. Um, and our focus is on authentic and curated artworks uh, by the world's uh, very best and leading digital artists. Um, on Maker's Place, you can discover artworks from uh, single editions, multi editions uh, on, our, on our open marketplace, uh, as well as you can discover from weekly drops uh, where we work closely with some of the world's best artists to feature uh, only a handful of highly curated artworks um, on a weekly basis. So uh, definitely check us out at uh, www.makersplace.com. Thanks. Thank you, Danny. And so, yes, let's start this panel. And uh, first, um, before we talk about the NFT industry forecast, I want to understand the current situation. And what does NFT trending look like today? What do you think? Okay, but there, uh, wants to go okay Alex, please. <laughs> Sure, it's always difficult to understand who should start, but uh, I guess we've seen the like 2021 being the best year for the NFTs. We okay. started the year with all the craziness about and the top shot. They they beat all the charts. They draw drove the massive audience to the market. Um, there was like publications about NFT market in all the medias like Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, just, just every major media made a publication about NFTs, educated a lot of people. And that drove like super, super top talent to the, to the market. And we had the peak in March. Uh, I guess we did like somewhat of $60 million in March in volume of on Rarible. And um, right now, the current trend, I believe, is a little bit oversupply. So like literally everyone is trying to sell NFTs now. And, like all of my friends, all of the colleagues, all the business people that I know, they are all somehow are touching the trend and trying to sell NFTs. So I guess uh, for the coming months uh, the, in the real spotlight would be the buyers of the NFT. Like who are the buyers? Because there is a, lo a lot of supply. Now we need to understand like who are the long-term like consumers of that is. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to hear the uh, K1 and, and, and Danny's opinion on that. Yeah, I, I can I can jump in really yeah, quick. Please, please. Um, yeah, I, I think like obviously, uh, you know, like, but the NFT market really started in 2017, uh, late 2017 with CryptoKitties. I think that was like the 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 first hype cycle or the sort of the um, the inception, the big bang moment for NFTs, which was very exciting, and then. Um, and then we had a couple of years of a bear market, which was very fun. But at the same time, um, I think it was necessary for the NFT space. Um, a lot of technology had to have been built. Um, it's very nascent um, over, over the last uh, like three years ago. Um, it was very hard to create as a creator, uh, very hard to buy as a buyer. Um, a lot of education was necessary. So I think like, yeah, over the last two and a half, three years, there's a tremendous amount of work from a lot of the platforms, um, obviously the, the folks represented here today, as well as a number of other players. And um, you know, on, uh, from, the, from the perspective of Maker's Place, that's really what we've been focusing on um, over the last few years, just um, all the above, just making it super simple, um, waiting for that moment where um, you, know, you get that, that next hype cycle, which we are very familiar with in the crypto world. I think that uh, the NFT space is um, not immune to that same sort of um, market dynamic where you see in the crypto in the in the cryptocurrency space where you know certain events happen in the macro uh, world and um, and the space sort of just explodes and so um, yeah the last couple of years have been a lot of investment a lot of just like to to be honest just grinding it out um, a lot of education building literature building. Um, getting getting more artists, getting more um, collectors in the space, and um, obviously late last year uh, and early this year, there were some pretty key moments. Um, 
you know, at least in the digital art space, there were some major, uh, major sales. You know, uh, we had some um, big sales like the Trevor Jones um, sale, and then they had the Beeple sale. And then obviously in 2020, uh, earlier this year in February, we had the, um, you know, the, the Christie's Beeple and, you know, we partnered with uh, those two parties to introduce the massive um, uh, $69 million um, sale, which, which really propelled. Um, obviously, a lot of uh, macro trends are trending up. The um, overall crypto market was trending upwards, which, which definitely helped. But uh, that moment was definitely a watershed moment for the NFT space. Um, and the great thing is a lot of the technology had been built out. Uh, which allowed uh, the market to really capitalize and, and introduce a whole new generation to this collecting, this, this concept of digital ownership, NFTs and authenticity and, and, and collectability of digital assets. And, um, you know, I think uh, that was just hype cycle number two. <laughs> and, you, and with any hype cycle, you, you kind of see a huge bang and then uh, a, come, a come down moment. That's sort of where we're going through right now. Um, but the great news is we're seeing that the... Uh, um, where we're ending up is at a higher, higher um, uh, baseline than it was, you know, a few years back. So great to see that the industry is, is holding strong. Uh, we're making strides and continue to grow. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of our viewpoint in terms of what happened and sort of what's necessary in this space. And we're very excited about uh, what's to come uh, and, you know, happy to share more about that later. But that's, that's sort of, you know, how, um, how we kind of see the, saw the last couple of years. And from, you know, from my perspective, and obviously Alex and, and Danny um, covered covered plenty of things that I, I could share as well. Um, but just to add add um, a little bit more color, it's you know I think it it in the NFT space, I think it, it focusing too much on the market can potentially be very distracting um, because markets inherently go up and down. And and in reality, if if you know with NFTs, I think there are fundamental things happening that are kind of irrespective of markets, which is um, NFTs are really a new like ability for people on the internet and the abilities that it offers around ownership and control and property rights and royalties. A lot of these forces are very, very real um, and they can't really be, they, they don't exist without NFTs. So, so NFTs are this breakthrough innovation. And so the market will inherently go up. It will go down. You know, I think that there's there's a lot of um, psychology in in play there with just how humans humans kind of react to markets. At Foundation, we we almost we really don't spend any time thinking about market cycles. Um, we're very very focused on on really just onboarding people and creating creating community, and and whether or not the price is high or low is something you know. We price everything in ETH. So ultimately, you know, the, the price of Ethereum will go up and down, but we really try to onboard people into crypto um, fundamentally. And so they really, you know, we're not, we're not hoping that people are going in and out of crypto, right? We're really trying to create a new crypto economy. And, and so I think that's, that's really our focus and our vantage point. And so I think you'll see, you've seen a lot of high profile headlines about sales and sales numbers. And I think that's great because that it gets people's attention um, but people and that, you know, $69 million sale is not really what's happening. Like that's just a headline, right? In reality, you're seeing lots and lots of people really kind of now share their work and interact on the internet with really new rules. And, and I think that's unstoppable. There's, you know, the market cycles will come and go, but you NFTs are not a fad. They're a new, they're a new layer to the internet. Well, thank you, sir, you guys. There, uh, I obvious. There, I understand. Is there obviously is there market has been changed? Is there new market and also in the hype cycle? So I would like to ask, is there uh, next? Is there um, what does NFT? Uh, sorry, the, what will the NFT market change? And also driven by the NFT marketplace, because there are two right now today is the uh the market industry with nft is booming and also down and up again but is there i would like to hear is what marketplace like you guys will change the this industry or over the crypto industry i i want to hear as well 
So the who wants to go first? Okay, Alex, please. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess the the role of marketplaces is is important in in the industry. Uh, like we've seen this in 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 2018 and 19. Because before that, uh, you actually couldn't create NFTs without deploying your own smart contracts. So in order, uh, the market was like, there was CryptoKitties, then all the other people who wanted to create their NFTs, they needed to create smart contracts and to deploy it to the network, uh, to mint some NFTs programmably, and then uh, like to sell them in the primary market, like the central MD or like, uh, CryptoCuties, some other games, Axie Infinity, all, all these all this NFT projects, they were like created by developers. And then came like several marketplaces that started to allow people to create their NFTs by like just without uh, coding skills, by, by simply interacting with the, with the front end. I, uh, I suppose SuperRare was one of the first uh, marketplaces that allowed uh, people to create NFTs. Um, before they even had uh, their own project that was just tied directly to creating NFTs without without the crypto art segment. And then uh, probably Bearable came, OpenSea had some ability to create NFTs, but what we've really seen this in 2019 is like several platforms uh, started to be like really popular on creating more NFTs. And, and this creating part is uh, one of the hardest parts actually, because as soon as the item is created on chain, then all the provenance and ownership rights and everything concerning the product is tracked on blockchain. But this, this first touch to the blockchain, when you put something there, you need to understand that that was a legitimate uh, item that was brought on chain by the author. You, I, you authenticate the author, you give him the private key almost because you need, you need to him, for him to have a wallet. So uh, that's, that's the onboarding phase, the onboarding of authors and, and people in, in the crypto. And it's done by marketplaces today. It's, it's marketplaces who onboard authors who make sure that basically the author now can have a digital signature. So crypto art is like you, you take a lot of artists, you give everyone a digital signature, they sign their works and they put it on blockchain. Uh, and, and that's the really important like part of the marketplaces. So marketplaces make this first touch, they, they curate, they onboard people, they bring them into the, uh, into the spotlight, they, they make distribution. Uh, it's almost like exchanges are working for the cryptocurrency markets uh, that are fungible. We, we, they, they are like this powerful, points of, of contact uh, between like blockchains on, on Binance, you can, you can buy, uh, I, uh, you can buy cryptos from, from 10th of blockchains. So uh, marketplaces would be like hubs of this, of this NFT world. They, they solve a lot of, uh, uh, they, they are doing a lot of work, uh, that, that is in the space and they are all interconnected between each other with this blockchain, uh, where NFTs live. So, um, I guess we can say a lot, but basically marketplaces are just key players. They, they, have, they're, they are working hard. They, they are solving problems for the space and um, they, they are actually the ones who expand the space as well by, by introducing something new to the users. Okay, yeah, thank I, you. <clears throat> I, I second a lot of that. Um, I think another, I think another, the other thing that I would add, but also just to kind of reiterate, you know, on our end, we think about uh, that thing, that in a very similar light um, in terms of, you know, and, I'll, and I'll speak specifically from um, a digital art lens or an art perspective. Um, you know, I think we like to think about <clears throat> three necessities um, that uh, come with building a, uh, a ecosystem like a marketplace, um, especially for NFTs and art, and spe uh, specifically art. Um, and we like to think about um, the need for accessibility um, in the NFT space, um, trust and community. And so, you know, I think like 
one of the things that's really important, especially at this stage, uh, uh, is the ability for um, anyone and anyone to be able to collect um, NFTs, collect digital art. I think like um, you know, the, the there's like two constituents there. There's the uh, the ecosystem of uh, you know crypto crypto native crypto um, crypto aware. Um, you know, having uh, the really understanding the ethos of decentralization. So um, there's, that's, a, that's a big part of the movement. But at the same time, you know, the reality is like the vast majority of the market, people that have a passion for creating and a passion for collecting, they're, they're, they're not in the crypto world um, or crypto where. And quite frankly, a lot of them probably won't um, want to manage their own wallets and things like that. And I think like looking at central ex- exchanges and cryptocurrencies is a good good proxy for that. And so a big part of what a marketplace, um, what we believe has to offer is the ability for pretty much anyone and everyone to be able to create and collect at the end of the day. And I think that's something that, you know, we really try to focus on. Um, and, and, and so that's something that's, that's pretty, pretty important. So, you know, obviously offering all the crypto on ramps, but also offering options for non crypto natives, uh, fiat options, uh, custodial options, as well as decentralized wallet ownership options. And, um, and I think that's a big part of what the space needs. Um, trust is something that is extremely important. I think like uh, early on, there was this kind of this feeling that, um, you know, you create on the blockchain, it's permanent and it, it's secure, but, you know, that doesn't really mean anything if you, if you create provenance over something that has no authentic um, background or, or, you know, it doesn't really have hold value, uh, that actually, um, causes, uh, even more damage to the ecosystem, especially someone that's trying to collect something. And also the creator that's trying to, um, you know, leverage this new, new, um, mechanism for, um, for, for their success and, and sustainability as an artist. And so, um, having, um, some semblance of, uh, whether it's, an authority or the community, some way of ensuring that there is uh, authenticity and trust behind the things that you're um, looking to collect from a digital ownership perspective is extremely important. And I think that, um, you know, just if you think about the landscape for creators in the, since the dawn of the internet, that's been one of the biggest problems. Like creators have been creating um, out of passion and they've been struggling with things like attribution and authenticity for since the very beginning. Um, and, and that's something that really needs to be solved. And, um, you know, a part of that can be done obviously in a decentralized manner, and that's really important, but also having um, some sort of authority kind of jump in and, and work through the nitty gritties of, of, of figuring out whether or not someone is um, who they say they are is an important part of that process as well. And then sort of when you have all that um, together, like then, then it's about like, you know, the, the network effects of creating a, a vibrant community where you can come, you know, you can trust in a community, you can feed off each other, um, you can grow as an artist, you can grow as a collector and engage with the community and engage in a trusted and, um, uh, 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 a single trusted location to, to engage and collect and, and thrive. And so these are all the things that, I mean, I'm, I, and I'm sure there's a ton of other things, but those are three that I really, um, I think it is really important. The things that we try to really hone in um, as a, um, as a North star here at, at Makerspace. Danny, can you help me? Like, what, what is the, what is the, what is the question exactly? I think it was like um, my my understanding was um, you know how uh, how marketplaces and, and the things that at least <laughs> this is my viewpoint how marketplaces and things that you know we we've, we've been doing in our respective areas help um, evolve the NFT ecosystem. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think that there's the technology has been around for a few years, right? So I think you've heard from Alex and Danny. It's like we we've, we've had NFTs for years now. Um, and so it's not just the matter of having the technology. It is, there are many, 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 many social problems that come from, from really creating a vibrant ecosystem. 
And there actually is a lot of human coordination and human effort that has to go in. It's not just enough to have the blockchain and tokens, right? Because as Danny mentioned, as Alex mentioned, you know, anyone can create anything, um, but that doesn't mean that the NFT is valuable or is correct or is authentic. And so it's really the, the, the a lot of the work is, um, is beyond just the NFT token there. That, that is something that I think is actually very straightforward right now. And there's not much, we've already, we've already done the work there as an engineering community. And really what's now needed is a lot of, of, of other layers. So curation, um, collector relations, uh, design, user experience, um, you know, helping these markets develop provenance and history and attaching context. These are, these are problems that are, that are, I don't know, they're very, uh, very involved. And so I think what you're seeing the platforms do in the space is they're, is they're, get, is they're really solving those problems uh, at scale and they're investing in those problems to help the community really find its footing so I think that you know, in a few years, we'll all we'll all we'll all have a world in which there will be lots and lots and lots of NFTs flying around, and you'll you'll be able to value them, and artists will know how to get into this world, and it'll be very straightforward. Um, but you know, it's been the platforms that have gone out there and like you know educated and created the user experiences and built the the communities that have started to rally around that, and you know, without that social element. NFTs are meaningless. Um, they're just data on a blockchain, right? Um, and so I think it's really important not to value just the NFT itself. Um, that's not meaningful. The, the thing that's meaningful is the community and the social context around the NFT. And that takes a lot of work. Um, and it's not, it's not as simple as putting something on a blockchain. That, that actually is, is now at this point very, very straightforward. Uh, anyone can do that from a variety of places. And, and so that, that's not a problem anymore. Um, and it's fun. I think it's fun. It's, it shows that we're moving forward as a space where we're not obsessed with the root mechanic, right? Which is like, oh my God, I put something on the blockchain, right? That, that isn't, you know, at the end of the day, that's a very technical feat. Really what we need is the, you know, societal, social layer to come and value these things. And that's why I think these headlines around, you know, people and, and the high profile sales, you know, we did a, a high profile auction with Edward Snowden. Um, these really help people understand where the value is, right? You know, the, the headlines about Snowden's auction weren't that there was an NFT on a blockchain. We've already had that happen millions of times. What it was was, wow, there are collectors in the world that valued that art piece by this very celebrated figure for millions of dollars. And then all of that is now on chain. And there's this now community that's formed around that art piece. Right. And that's the story. Thank you, okay. Danny, for, for the assist there on, on <laughs> like, I just wanted, I wanted to make sure I was answering the question correctly. Yeah. That, that was uh, uh, answer is correct. So the, thank you for the all answers. So to be honest, it's still about six minutes left. So I would like to um um finalizing this session. The the I the we hear a lot of opinions, is there uh, issues and the all marketplaces you guys is solving the problems. So I would like to ask okay first, Danny, is the one two minutes is to kind of messaging to the uh, audiences beyond the screen, and uh, wants to tell that those people is the uh, about your product or is the about market or beyond the uh, NFT market for society. With anything you think you want to say, anything. Um, let's see, yeah, I mean, I think I like. I think that this is an extremely exciting moment um, for the digital digital landscape. Um, you know, I guess uh, you know NFT has sort of been a headliner, and you know, I, I think that a lot of people look at NFTs in a different from a different perspective, and you know that's okay. I think like right now, there's there's a lot of moments people are kind of getting into the space. Um, but but the thing that you know, really looking through the lens of um, 
a platform in a community like Makerspace and where we come from is like, this is literally a life changing technology. It's, it's a new operating system. It's a new platform that's going to boost the creativity of the entire world. And I think like that's extremely exciting because, um, you know, there's this, you know, the reality is like we've, we've been growing up in the digital age for decades. Um, you know, I have personally, and we're spending more and more time in a digital world. Um, and the future is going to be even more digital. And it's like, when you think about it, it's like, it's crazy to have imagined um, a world where there's no sustainable future for any of this. And I think that um, with NFTs, it's literally given, a, it's created an economy out of thin air. Um, and it did, what didn't exist. And, and what's really exciting is that this ecosystem, everyone that's getting involved in this space, like we're literally going to create a, in a, like we're, we're at the forefront where the entire uh, future for digital creativity is going to change. And I think like we're going we're gonna to look back in a few years or decades from now and realize like this is like a, a renaissance for creativity for, um, for everything digital. And it, this is going to be, you know, the moment where we can finally um, evolve and, 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 and take advantage of, of everything that's, you know, the digital age has offered. And so, you know, I think like obviously there's, a lot of excitement around the types of NFTs and collecting, but I think like that's been something that's been extremely um, exciting to be a part of, to see uh, for the first time creatives um, be able to find a sustainable path. Like I couldn't tell you the number of times artists in our community are like, Hey, you know, I, I'm, I was able to quit my, you know, dreary day job or my contract job doing sort of what someone wanted me to do, to do what I actually want to do. Um, and, and you're seeing that every day. And I think like when you, when you get enough of that momentum, um, the future is going to be extremely exciting. And I think that's a, you know, a thing that I just wanted to mention about what's happening here. It's, it's more than just, um, a technology It's more than crypto. Uh, it's, this is a movement and, and a renaissance for creativity. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's really important to us. Okay. So, uh, Kayvon, can you tell a short message to the audiences? on the screen? I think I would just reiterate what I said before, which is um, I think really trying to pay attention to the market cycle is not the point of NFTs. Um, and I would really encourage the audience to actually um, dive into this world and look at, look at what's happening outside of a market cycle because it, whether or not the market is going up or down is very short term. Um, and it's, and it's, there's not actually a lot, there's not a lot to learn from that other than like, you know, basic human psychology. And what I think is much more interesting is engaging with the community that's here. Um, you know, there are many phenomenal Japanese artists that are sharing work, um, on foundation and, and the work itself is valuable. And there is this new way for them to kind of express this work online that is not going to go away. It is impossible, as far as I understand, um, before NFTs, for someone to sell a file on the internet. Um, and and that's, that's not going to change anytime soon. That is just a, a new reality that we live in. And I would really encourage people in the audience, whether or not they're wanting to be NFT creators, to realize that this is really new and powerful and you don't want to be tied to the market. You want to be tied to your own creativity. Um, and this is, this is, this is here to stay. And then if, a, if you're, you're a collector, um, you know, really starting to explore and understand what's happening here and finding the people that are really um, imagining this new world, you know, I think that's going to be very, very fruitful journey because I don't see how the internet doesn't become entirely reshaped by NFTs. I think in the future, um, there's a future where everything's an NFT, right? Um, and, and that future is, is, is starting now and it might seem like it's, it's not here or it's going to take a long time, but these things happen much faster than people imagine. Um, and so I would very much encourage people to not, not think about this as timing the market or, or thinking about the market, but more about, you know, potentially really supporting an artist that they're really excited about or really owning something that they feel really proud of, right? And 
the market, if that's, you know, the market's one part of that, but it's really not the most important part. Um, and, you know, many people in this room have worked, you know, for example, when I started foundation, Ethereum was $70. So, you know, for me, the price of Ethereum is not something I look at really ever. Um, it's just, it's just part of the ecosystem. Uh, and it, it's gone up and down wildly. And so I really encourage people to focus on their passions and the creativity and the artists and the, and the people that are really trying to build something new here. That's the story. All right, thank you. Alex, is there a final message to their people? Yep, uh, sure. So like what Kevin just said really caught my, 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 my attention here. Like it, it, it really wasn't possible on the internet to sell a file before. Like my, my girlfriend is a digital artist and she couldn't do it. Like before uh, NFTs, all the creative economy lived like on Instagram, on social networks, and you were only able to monetize through advertisement. And um, this is how the world, the old world looked like. And the new world like add, added a new, just the new set of economic rules to it. You can now sell files. And I know, just, just try to think about it. Like how many digital items do you have in your life and how many physical? Like, for example, I don't know, out of the physical items that I have, it, 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 I don't know, it's hardly uh, go beyond uh, out my computer. I, I really like, uh, I don't know, love this notion of digital minimalism. And, and I have a ton of things online. It's like, I need to catalog them. I have a lot of files. They, they live on Dropbox, iCloud, backups, and all sorts of stuff. So <laughs> the world is rapidly turning digital and we didn't have a, a digital economy for like actually owning something digital before. So NFTs, what they really did, they, they moved the digital ownership down the stack before that, there was a user, then the platform, then the content that you created on top of that platform. And now it's the user, it's the content, and then goes platforms. Uh, you, you, can, you can create something on Rarible and, and then send it to, to OpenSea and sell it there. So um, I would, I would, my message to the audience would be just try to experiment with this new reality. It's, it's so much beyond just art or, or some, some digital creative economy. It, it's anything digital that can be delivered digitally. It's, it's the new world when, when you don't have your physical items anymore, but you have a lot of digital items and, and you can operate with them with the new technology. Thank you. Thank you, all you guys. So my the um, end of the session, there's uh, anything, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you to the old the, the, the panelists. Thank you so much for, for having us. And then the one thing I would just also share is many, many Japanese artists are, are very active in this new community. Um, and you should check out their, their work. Uh, May and Minoru, I'm happy to share a few of the profiles um, so people can understand that this is already happening uh, in a very big way. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so Cheers. much. Yeah, so my name is Benjamin Ramo. Uh, I am founder of uh, the Jenny Metaverse DAO uh, with my co-founder, uh, Jay Chung. So uh, the, the background about the, the story between me and Jay goes back uh, about four years. Um, I was, uh, my, my first step into blockchain was uh, with block one and with uh, the EOS community. And today we know that EOS is not a very good blockchain, but four years ago, it was attracting a lot of very intelligent people. And I bumped into Jay during the hackathons and he was a high school student back then. He was 16 years old and he was uh, debugging the code and they nicknamed him the, the Ghostbuster. Um, and he was uh, actually quite uh, influential in the, uh, the the whole launch of uh, of EOS. Um, and he just really struck me as a as a very intelligent person. It was take friends, and uh, now it's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, work with him on on the Jenny DAO. 
My step into NFTs um, is, is quite interesting. So I've been working very closely with a company called Animoca Brands, which has been very stubborn for the past three years and has been really pushing for digital ownership within video games. Uh, and today, NFTs is a very glamorous space. Um, crypto kitties and today uh, but Animoca was just kept on going at it and uh, making a footprint uh, within the whole NFT ecosystem um, and they've been uh, very supportive in in, uh, in this launch so I think we had uh, some very good partners from day one NFTs themselves I think are extremely interesting uh, because we've seen lots of creative use cases within art and music um, and I keep on finding new ways of seeing new ways where people add layering to NFTs and where where we can um, really push the boundaries of art and creativity by um, adding a, a layer of technology which is really cool uh, but this is really just the beginning and I think that NFTs are also going to become the bridge between the real world and the blockchain world um, everything in the real world is unique and should be represented as an NFT if we want to represent it in the, in the virtual world, world. And I think the innovations in the financial NFT space are going to be amazing. Um, so we've already seen, um, you know, the, the Nexus doing uh, insurance products on NFTs, Uniswap V3, um, uh, creating uh, LP positions represented as NFTs. And very quickly, what you're going to find is that the NFT space is, you know, people get impressed when, when a Beeple is, sells for six to nine million dollars, and that is very impressive. But that's just the beginning. And NFTs is going to be a multi trillion dollar asset class. However, there is one problem. In order to become a trillion dollar asset class, we need the infrastructure to support it. And currently, I feel that the NFT space is very much like crypto was in 2017. So 2017, people were raising a lot of money and they had very creative ideas and very, you know, teams with, with all the best intentions. Um, but we got close to a trillion dollar market cap for crypto and quickly things fizzled away and crashed and we got a two year winter. And the reason for that, I believe, is that there wasn't the infrastructure which was able to support a $1 trillion, uh, $1 trillion asset class in crypto. Um, it's really only during uh, 2018, 2019, that people built DeFi, where it became possible to create synthetic positions, uh, lending, borrowing, using collateral, rehypothecation, yield aggregating, which supported the current market, which uh, the current bull market we're in, uh, which is much bigger than the initial bubble of 2017. And my personal view is that, you know, if, if TVL peaked out, to, you know, a month ago at $90 billion and is now at about $60 billion, that trend is going to continue and we're going to see DeFi TVL probably hitting 200, 300 billion dollars by the end of the year. Um, and, and this, this trend, uh, within, uh, supporting the crypto infrastructure is, is going one way, I believe, and it's going up. Um, in NFTs, we don't really have that. People buy NFTs. Some NFTs have utility. You know, you, F1 Delta time allows you to race their cars and, and, and compete with other NFTs. Um, there's a D canvas allows you to, to participate in collaborative art. There's people are finding cool use cases for NFTs, but there's from a, from a financial standpoint, there's actually nothing you can really do with your, with your NFT and, uh, you know, lending, uh, using NFTs as collateral is something that's really lacking, for example. Um, and so there's what we're, what we're seeing right now is that there's no NFT infrastructure, which is going to support a $1 trillion asset class. And my view is that to get this infrastructure, everything will start with fractionalization. So once you get fractionalization, 
of NFTs, you get liquidity, you get the ability to obviously trade it, but also to use it as collateral, to stake, to rehypothecate, to yield aggregate, to do all these things that people love doing in DeFi and are currently not able to do with NFTs. And the initial building block will be fractionalization. And on top of fractionalization, lots of other things are going to be built. And there's a few fractionalization platforms uh, out there. Um, and they've all got their advantages, but they also all have some kind of game theory problems, which makes them impractical um, outside a very limited uh, scope. So the existing fractionalization platforms, at least the good ones, will work for either single NFTs or for very similar NFTs within a pool. Unfortunately, every NFT in the world is different. And some NFTs are very different. And we've, um, we've been very interested in the space, so we've really been looking at what people have been doing, and we came across Uniquely. And it struck us that Uniquely is really the only platform uh, for NFT fractionalization, which involves games where people can have a whole variety of NFTs within pool, um, not just that originate within the same uh, contract address, but that can really be, for example, ERC-721 versus 1155. Um, and, and there's um, the, the, yeah, the, a lot of the, the game theory uh, problems have seems to have been resolved in, uh, in Uniquely. Uh, and so uniquely potentially could really be the building block for the whole NFT infrastructure that we're going to see over the next couple of years. Um, and on top of uniquely, then you're going to get staking and all the, all the other stuff that I, I just already mentioned. So uniquely seemed like a very promising platform and we wanted to build on top of it. And so we built the Jenny Metaverse DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization, which raise money and which is going to buy NFTs and um, use the fractions which have been created on the Uniquely protocol to govern the, uh, the actions uh, of the DAO. So the funds are held in a multi-sig by a sort of council of elders who, who represent the community, who are there to enact the wishes of the community, which itself goes through community votes. Um, so, so far, there's been one very interesting purchase uh, of an NFT from a collaboration between um, Steve Oki and Blau, so two very cool DJs, who made a custom-made song called Jenny. Um, so, it's a really cool song, you know, the, the beat builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up, you get a crescendo, and then finally it stops, and then you get a robotic voice that says, hello, my name is Jenny, and then the music starts again. Um, so it's a really cool song, you know, it's a song that people could actually listen to in nightclubs. Uh, it's going to be played, uh, I think, by Blau at, at Bitcoin Miami. Uh, it's going to be a, a Jenny private party. So if you guys are there, I should definitely try to join. Um, and it's really one of the few uh, song NFTs, which I think could be uh, uh, also a, a big um, commercial hit. So it's not just a 30 second soundtrack like some other NFTs have been, but it's a full length song that where the, uh, the artist put a lot of, um, a lot of heart into it. Um, so this, this went through a community vote, uh, for the, for the future purchases of, uh, of the Jane Dow. I actually don't know what's going to happen. Um, I've lost control of the project, which is a very good thing. And it's really in the hands of the community. And, uh, it's really up to them to decide how we spend the budget and, uh, and, and continue populating the, uh, the NFT vault. Uh, the Jenny Metaverse DAO launch was very unique in, uh, in a number of ways. Um, so it was very unique because we did not have a public sale. Uh, we did not have an IDO. Uh, it was a community based, uh, liquidity launch, which I've never seen before. Um, so what happened was that the, the pre-sale investors, uh, or pre-sale token buyers, um, about 80% of them voluntarily, uh, voluntarily decided to match their UGENI tokens with ETH and stake it into the, the uniquely pools. 
Um, and from day one, there was about eight or nine million dollars, I think nine million dollars of, of liquidity of uh, ETH depth um, just in the uh, just in the, the Jenny pool. So about 18 million dollars total liquidity. Um, so this was really a community led launch, which I've never seen before in my um, in my experience of blockchain. The other special thing about the Jenny Metaverse DAO was that the there was zero unlock. Personally, I think that lockups are sorry. There was zero lockup on, on the tokens. 100% vesting from day one. Uh, my view is that lockups are complete BS because you end up with an artificially inflated price uh, where buyers are not able to realize any gains even if they want to. And, just, and, uh, and we're really just postponing the inevitable, which is having weak hands dump their tokens whenever they feel like it. And I think that if these weak hands are not going to contribute to the network, we might as well get rid of them as early as possible. And that's why from day one, they had the opportunity to sell their tokens into a, a nine into a pool with $9 million of ETH depth. And surprisingly, very few people actually sold. Um, you know, we had some, uh, some KOLs who, uh, who participated in the presale. Uh, the majority of them, uh, did not sell. They, they, uh, they've been involved in, uh, in yield farming. And I think they personally, I think that they did the right decision. Uh, and it's what I'm doing as well, because when you stake your Jenny tokens, you're able to yield farm for, uh, the unique tokens and unique tokens are the governance token for the uniquely platform. And my view is that uniquely will become a very significant part of the NFT infrastructure. Uh, really not just over the next six months, but I think over the next 10 or 20 years, uh, because NFTs are here to stay and will become a very, very big part of our global economy. So that's it. So thank you very much, uh, Non-Fungible 2021. Uh, thank you, Maison, for allowing me to participate in this event. Um, you know, I'm available on uh, Twitter. You can uh, follow the Jenny Metaverse DAO on jennynft.io and we'd be very happy in uh, having you participate in our uh, in our decentralized organization thank you very much Hi everyone, this is Steve uh, from Block Tower speaking. Sorry, my video uh, setting is not uh, good right now, so I'll be just not video mode. So uh, Block Tower is a crypto investment firm based in New York and Miami right now. And I'm happy to moderate with my old friends, Gabby from YGG and Scormantis uh, from <laughs> Dev Radar. Uh, I'll, try to, uh, I'll try my best to pronounce his name correctly. Um, so first I'll let the Gabby and Scormantis uh, introduce themselves. Uh, what do you do? And what, what's your role at the current projects that you're working on? Sure, um, I'll go ahead. So my name is Gabby Dizon and uh, I am a co-founder of Yield Guild Games or YGG. So Yield Guild is um, a play to earn gaming guild. So what that means is that we invest into NFTs of different uh, game projects where the NFTs um, have a way of earning yield or some kind of resource. 
and then we lend out these uh, NFTs to our player base who plays with uh, on, on the games uh, using these NFTs, and then they earn some kind of uh, yield in the form of uh, uh, currency or tokens from from these games. So the the game where we are most active in right now is Axie Infinity, where we have. 1,000 players, or we call them Axie Scholars, earning somewhere between three to $500 a month playing the game. But we've also invested in NFTs in different games such as Sandbox, uh, League of Kingdoms, uh, Illuvium, Star Atlas, and many more. And I'm Skir uh, So I'm the CEO and co-founder of DevRider. I founded DevRider a bit more than three years ago. And you know, DevRider itself is an app store. It's an app store of the future, so-called app store as well. And you know, when it comes to the future app store, we're thinking about it in a way that it's going to be really, really different than what you see now in the traditional app stores. So it's going to be around, you know, it's not just going out there and finding a new app. It's it's more than that because the, the whole blockchain, the app concept, is about kind of playing to earn, investing, and keeping your assets there. So imagine you go to an an app store. Uh, you pick some DAP, you use it, but then you come back to see some statistics to see how your portfolio is doing. It's, it's all going to be, you know, a circle. So you come here and uh, you try the DAP. Uh, you get to know about the economics of the game. And eventually, yeah, as Gabby probably will uh, evolve and talk in the future, it's about kind of play to earn and, and even more than that. Great. Um... So I think this panel for the audience, I think this panel will be a great panel for you to understand how NFT has evolved till now. Okay, so first question uh, I, I wanna start with is, since you guys are one of the OG in the space, um, and I wanna hear your uh, opinion about how NFT has evolved and what you have seen for last few years. So maybe it's, it's gonna be helpful for audience that or what have been basically what you have seen and where we are right now. So let's start with the Gabby. Sure. So yeah, I've been in the NFT space since basically early 2018, and the space has unexpectedly evolved in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of the early popular NFTs were really around collectibles, and then after that, it was games. And then a little bit after that, it was art. And all, of all of these, I think it was widely ex expected that art or that games would be the one that would really drive a lot of adoption first. And I think it was very surprising to a lot of people, even myself, who was heavily, uh, I was heavily into crypto art, that the art one would be the first to go mainstream and really kind of catch uh, worldwide attention because of uh, artists like Beeple and Pac, for example. That was pretty surprising, but I guess for games, it's because you kind of have to draw people within the game world. So um, having that functionality and utility, which I think will be long lasting, needs to be kind of, uh, I guess, proven out over time as you draw more people into your game. Whereas with art, like in, in a sense, what you see is what you get and then people kind of uh, fixate over the high sales number. So it's kind of easy for people to, uh, to get into it. Yeah, what I can add is, is, is more about from the, let's say, data perspective, but for, for humans, you know, it's about there is different protocols and verticals that are emerging. So, you know, when we talk about the protocols, kind of one year ago, uh, everyone was just talking about Ethereum when it comes to NFTs. But now it's, it's kind of Wax, it's Flow, it's Binance Smart Chain, Polygon. All those chains are kind of going also into NFTs. And that's a pretty interesting development because one thing you can do on Ethereum, you know, with more expensive NFTs, let's say more secure and so on. But on Wax, for example, you can have an NFT for kind of one cent. So that's not possible on the other chains. And even more important on that note is, you know, is verticals. So when we talk about, uh, as Gabby mentioned, kind of art and, and games, those are, let's say, now they're pretty much obvious to us. Uh, but, you know, uh, in five years time, you know, we'll see kind of health, energy sectors, real estate coming here. I can say it's going to be madness and we'll have to deal with kind of making sure we, we understand what that is, making sure we, we have the right tool sets for that. And we'll have to all work together to make sure that this kind of ecosystem, you know, works together with those NFTs. 
Great. Um, I'll add some points uh, on it. So what I see, so um, we Block Tower has been looking at the NFT space since 2018. Um, and then basically maybe a few things that I'll categorize since 2018 to current uh, the NFT stage. So first, I think I've seen a lot of the gaming people uh, who are basically not gaming people, but a lot of people are trying to uh, implement blockchain NFT into gaming. So I've seen tons of tons of gaming projects back in 2018 or 19. But the thing is most of them are either non-gamer or super, super smart uh, tech person who's trying to build a gaming because they saw the opportunity. Be because of that fact, uh, a lot of the projects that uh, reach out to us is they're mainly talking about technologies or scaling, scaling, uh, scaling um, solutions or how fast their uh, blockchain technology can be rather than focusing on content or the fun aspect of the game. Therefore, I, I think that's why we didn't see any adoption of blockchain gaming in 2018 or 19. And then second phrase is, some people are uh, coming from traditional gaming industry, UI UX designers uh, who designed uh, one of the popular games uh, coming into space. So I think quality of the game projects are getting much better. And then, um, so that quality of gaming, it, a blockchain game is project is much better in 2019 or uh, so. But still, I think there's some scaling issues uh, or many other kind of, uh, lack of the fun aspect that makes the gamers addicted uh, was lacking. And now 2020, we've seen, we've been basically NFT space got benefit from DeFi booms. So I think that um, hype came over to collectibles and art pieces, which is um, great because there was easy act, easy kind of uh, raw hanging fruit for NFT to get the more tractions. Now we are at the stage that uh, all those kind of um, speculation or around collectibles. And some people, of course, uh, try to own the collectible for the real investment of collectible pieces. But large portion of this NFT uh, craze is, I think, is um, speculation. And basically, people are just betting on things that they think is going to uh, appreciate in uh, value in very short period. So now I think uh, with the market has been muted a little bit, I think it, this is a great time for uh, those developers, entrepreneurs in NFT space to think about where we should go from here. So I think that's what we are, uh, we are at right now. Okay, so um, uh, by the way, any, if you guys have any comments on, on each other's uh, perspective, please share, uh, share now if you, if you have. Well, the, the one thing I'll add is that I think good games also just take time to make. So even for the projects that launch NFTs in 2018 or 19, but are only hitting their stride now. So Zedron and Axie are good examples for that. Like those projects have been there for a while and their NFTs have been around for a while, but it's only really now that a lot of the development uh, that has taken years is really coming out and they're seeing the results of it. I would also add, you know, if we look three years back when basically when everything around NFTs, let's say, just started 2017, 2018, if you told us, you know, in three years, uh, there is going to be a game that has 100,000 daily active users, we would probably be laughing. So we should not underestimate the power of, you know, the evolution, let's say, in that case. And I believe that, yeah, in the next three years, we simply cannot see it how powerful it's going to become. Understood. Uh, maybe we can talk about it later, but I, I completely agree. I think um, also the gaming uh, pieces of NFT can be actually internet, interacting with the broader metaverse theme that a lot of people are excited about. Yes, metaverse is sort of buzzword, but uh, I think gaming kind of projects will be still the pioneer or leader to basically uh, bring this whole um, gamify NFT space into a broader kind of adoption uh, phase, I think. Okay, um, so next question uh, will be around more 
uh, general kind of commentary for the NFT space right now. So we've been seeing massive bubble or excitement around NFT space for uh, last few months. As Gabi mentioned, it's more around collectibles and art pieces. Uh, but a lot of my friends who are who, um, who are not in crypto space yet uh, just you know see the headlines you know volume increase like five x now last week they said volume it decreased fifty percent price decreased fifty percent Steve isn't this NFT just bubble just people are just betting on whatever it is kind of art pieces so I think a lot of people are either excited about NFT or skeptical about NFT because of this NFT sort of um, excitement or craziness so i want to hear uh, from you guys the, how you think about this whether is nft bubble or if not why do you think so let's start as as, as usual let's start with gabby wow yeah yeah i think i think nfts might have gotten ahead of themselves in uh, in the last few months, especially when it comes to pricing. But what was really exciting for me was that um, NFTs have actually crossed over and become culture. And this is important because when you look at crypto, it's really technology. And for a lot of people, it's trading that, uh, that they, they take a look at. And when crypto and NFTs uh, in particular has crossed towards culture, that means there's a separate set of people who thinks that NFTs are cool. There are lots of new and exciting applications being built on top of crypto. If you look at all of the innovation that's happening on top of social tokens and NFTs, these are things that have nothing to do with, uh, I would say, the original uh, use case of crypto, which is basically uh, just maybe currency or store of value, right? A lot of these are being used to coordinate community. And there's a lot of use cases that frankly probably weren't really thought about until just very recently. So this, these are the very exciting things to me. And I think with every new technology, it's inevitable that you kind of see the prices gyrate as they have in the, in the last couple of months. And you know, people get too excited, might over invest, and then the prices pull back as uh, people get burned. But I see, I see this as uh, basically inevitable. Yeah, I would just second that, you know, NFTs are still in the very kind of infant phase. That's how I see it. Even though we're, you know, seeing those volumes of millions and millions of dollars, uh, obviously lots of that is speculations, but overall there is a big growth in that. And, you know, uh, there is so much to do. Like if we compare the last few months, yeah, there was massive growth, uh, but then kind of last month, uh, most of the NFT projects uh, basically suffered kind of 20 to 70% in terms of their trading volume. But then we look at one specific uh, project, which was mentioned already, the you know, X Infinity, and they tripled their trading volume in the last month. So kind of how does it work, right? And the thing is, um, I believe it's all about the user experience. And as soon as you know, they move to Ronin, the gas, there is basically this, no gas, it's all free. So you can just buy and sell, buy and sell. And, and that's, that's an open economy. You know, Treated as like Steam trading, uh, Steam marketplace, uh, globally, kind of without any any restrictions, and I think and I hope that that's going to happen with you know majority of the projects going forward, because that's how it needs to go. Uh, if you look at people uh, playing you know Fortnite or CS:GO and they're paying for those skins and digital assets, and they basically burn the money, you know they're not able to do anything with those assets anymore. Where if you move that to the blockchain, you know, after five years of playing, you can pay for your uh, rent or for university, whatever it is. So that's the future. Got it. Um, speaking of, uh, both of you mentioned sort of um, the tractions or growth of an empty space that many of retail people maybe do not easily have access to, or maybe they don't know how to kind of see kind of traction. What is the one or two things that you recommend for our retail uh, people who are interested in NFT to look at things uh, to understand uh, other than collective and arts, um, the activities or traction we are seeing? What are the one or two sources do you recommend for them to look at? 
Okay, so I'll, I'll talk here about the what we're doing at YGG with this, which is what is called a scholarship program. So what it is is actually a lending program for play to earn. And we're doing this because if you play and win games in Axie Infinity, you earn an, a token called SLP, which can be exchanged for Ether and then eventually for Fiat. And this is driving a lot of our user growth, wherein a lot of our, uh, a lot of our players are able to earn basically more than minimum wage in the Philippines. And we have thousands of players uh, every week who, who want to join our guild and then start playing the game. I think this is very exciting because for the first time you can get into the crypto space and earn crypto with your time and your skill instead of with money. And now it's actually uplifting the lives of a lot of people around the world and not just maybe the few thousand people who are crypto rich. So I think this is a very groundbreaking thing and it's also still in its very early days. I can't wait for the time when uh, the metaverse of different games and virtual worlds are fully built out and people can really find their own jobs that interest them, interest them where they can earn crypto. Yeah, that's a good point, kind of, uh, all, all the metaverse. That's, that's where we're going and you know, I think with NFTs, um, let's say not the very first step uh, when you're kind of on, on boarding to, towards NFTs, but when you actually decide, okay, I'll buy NFTs, and uh, there's a question, you know, what to buy, where to buy, and so on. But you got there, you got your first one or two NFTs. Okay, what to do then? You know, and that's the that's the problem what we're trying to solve in a way that you know it can be a kind of a DeFi NFT like Uniswap, be free. Uh, it can be some gaming NFT, you know, and collectible. And it's really, really hard now to kind of looking at your portfolio, you know, I have those NFTs, but what to do with them? So one of the ways how we want to contribute to the community, to the ecosystem, is allowing you to understand what can you actually do with that NFT. Okay, if it's a CryptoPunk, you can, you know, put it in NFTX pool, you can start earning some money. If it's X Infinity, you can lend it to Gabby for, for the scholarship and start earning some gains, you know. All these kind of things, they have to be communicated. And because everyone is focusing on building, that's really good, but somebody has to do the kind of informating part. And, you know, that's what we're trying to cover. And I think that's really important. Got it. So this, I think, naturally evolves to the next question. So I think um, Gabby is YGG's amazing job on building community. And basically, Dirt Radar is basically one of the top basically data providers in NFT or, of course, many other things. But in NFT space, there's so many data as you guys are providing for people to analyze and use. Um, so my question will be um, next, next stage of NFT, let's say. We talked about this can be happen, this is exciting, this can happen. What do you personally expect that um, NFT sector will be kind of focusing on or interested in or major traction will be in next maybe six months? Where, where are we evolving from here to what kind of, what kind of NFT aspects? How are you guys excited yes. about? I'll, I'll, I'll start first because my, to me, is like uh, one of the things that I'm excited about NFT is maybe we are going to uh, the stage that maybe real, real world assets can be some sort of integrate with NFT. That's something that I'm personally excited or looking forward to uh, seeing it. Gabby, please. Yeah, on my end, what I'm really excited about is uh, meaningful interoperability between assets and different projects or virtual worlds. We've always talked about interoperability since 2018, but I think since a lot of the games and projects were concerned about their own, uh, their own game or their own project surviving, the interoperability hasn't really happened at a meaningful level, but now you're seeing things such as uh, universal avatars and clothing, collectibles that are trying to be in, in sandbox and in Decentraland and in crypto voxels, um, artwork that you can see in uh, like different virtual worlds. I really love to see that kind of seamless interoperability where the assets that you own can really travel and do something in, in different virtual worlds. I would really vouch for, for the metaverse. I think that's something actually, you know, back in 2018, in the very first crypto conferences that were happening kind of about uh, crypto games and so on. I think at that year, the Ready Player One was released and it was a really hot topic. So kind of seeing that Oasis 
in, in, in crypto combined, you know, VR and crypto. I think that's a perfect combo. You know, we already see play to earn happening. What if we, you know, move it to the, to the VR and that's it, you have the full scope. Obviously uh, for that, we have those scalability issues, uh, we have user experience issues. But again, uh, as we spoke back in, back three years ago, we couldn't see 100,000 daily active users possible. So in the next three years, who knows? Um, still, we have about uh, nine minutes to go. So let's take another one more question. So, oh, so as I mentioned, maybe this is more question for your specific projects uh, for the audience. So how, maybe first question of sub question will be, what you guys are focusing on right now? So on your project, what you guys are uh, spending most time on build stuff or at least try to meet the demands uh, from crypto world? Let's okay, start, go. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So there is just so much demand on our ad on, uh, on the Axie scholarship side. So there are literally thousands of people in our wait list that wanna come in and start playing the game. And it, it took us uh, from November to May, so seven months to get from zero to 1,000 scholars. And then from one to 2,000, I think it's gonna take us three weeks. So we're actually starting to move faster. And it's amazing to see how crypto is changing the lives of those people that are onboarded into Axie uh, via YGG, earning SLP that they're changing for fiat. Like they're putting food on the table, they're paying off debt. Some of them are able to buy a car. Some of them are able to buy a house. And then once they care of, take care of their basic needs, they actually turn into investors where they might start buying different crypto. They might start buying ether or they buy virtual land or other types of NFTs. So it's really great to see that this kind of crypto adoption is able to make the lives of a lot of people better at scale. And yeah, we're trying to do this as, as fast as we can. Uh, before move to uh, before move to uh, the radar, uh, let's pause here. So uh, the for audience, the first thing uh, maybe Gabby, you will share with the Mai about the link of documentary that you make. Uh, maybe you can Mai can put on below this YouTube when we basically release it. So definitely, audience, uh, I recommend you guys to watch this twenty minutes or less. A documentary where what the Gabby mentioned is you can basically visualize it. One, the second is maybe the audience might not familiar much with the how YGG works. So maybe scholarship program and such maybe it's not too familiar with them. So maybe in plain language, basically, can you reiterate what YGG does? At this scholarship thing is very plain language. Sure. So so YGG is a game community, and it starts with our Discord server at discord.gg slash ygg and from there our uh, community plays a lot of different games uh, there are actually over 20 games that are all play to earn that our community is playing but there are some games that we focus on specifically uh, to offer the scholarship or lending program so the people who come into our discord they apply to uh, receive axes from our account so we, so YGG has thousands of axes that we lend out to players so that they can play on one of our accounts and then they start earning SLP and they have a community manager that, uh, that uh, trains them in how to play the game and helps them out. And when uh, they've earned enough SLP, then uh, they request for a cash out and then we, we have smart contracts that do an automatic revenue share of the SLP earns. And yeah, so the, the player or the scholar receives 70% of the SLP that they, uh, that they earn. Uh, their community manager gets 20% and us, the guild, YGG gets 10%. So this is how the scholarship program works. And because players can start uh, playing the game without any upfront cost, this has proved to be massively popular. And there's a just really huge demand on our end. Um, thank you. Let's go to... Uh, um... Uh, score Montes, uh about the, my audio question. With, with where do you see the demand? Uh, where do you focus, uh, spend your most of time right now? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously we spend most of the time on, on making sure that our data is accurate and reliable, uh, but kind of talking about something 
something new, something that we're always you know, figuring out how to achieve that is the, again, getting back to informing users, uh, making them understand. And you could say that, you know, one of the ways what we need to do is to allow those users uh, to find about YGG, right? If they are into Axie, let them find about scholarships. If they are into other game, let them find about something else, what they can do there. Because uh, again, the dApps are a lot about building, 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 but not so much about informing. So we are getting into, okay, we have our blog, we're writing lots of articles, how to, how to invest, how to figure out this, how to use this app, all about that. Uh, plus, uh, one step forward is about actually allowing users to interact. So because of the nature of dApps, you know, you can integrate anything anywhere. Uh, we can say, okay, if you want to invest your, you know, put your axes to work, lend them here right away to some scholarship. These kind of things uh, we're working on and excited to see them live pretty soon. Thank you. Um, so for the, for audience, so DevRadar has massive comprehensive data provider, but for NFT perspective, what, what kind of maybe top five information do you think that what users can get out of your website around NFT? Well, um, currently it's, it's about, you know, uh, NFT collections, NFT marketplaces. And uh, then we talk about kind of trading volume, number of traders, number of sales. You know, these are the main ones, the main points. Uh, but stay tuned because there is uh, so much coming in the next Awesome. So just to add on it, so basically that radar, you can see that what kind of dApps are getting traction in terms of users, in terms of volume, even, and then they categorize through the, the apps between gaming, DeFi, uh, marketplace and such as such. So I think uh, users can basically have broader perspective, not just on NFT in broader sense, on within NFT, you can see specifics with the data. So last question. So we have just two more minutes. So uh, maybe you guys get, got the 30 seconds, uh, but I always want to do, uh, give the these questions at the end of the panel. So for those who are hesitant, uh, whether I should get in NFT or crypto uh, or not, uh, many, of, many of them might be watching you guys and then basically try to get out of like what you guys share. So maybe one advice or one your comments for those people so that they can make a right decision for whether they want to get in or not. Maybe a device slash commentary. Let's start with the Gabby. Okay, so uh, a lot of people who are skeptical about NFTs um, feel like you know there's no real usage uh, of, of NFTs. They don't really provide any real value. So I would invite them to watch our uh, play to earn documentary and see how NFTs are actually changing the lives of people in the real world and they can see how much value is being given by uh yeah by people who are earning money who may not necessarily have the opportunity to do so otherwise i'd say you know focus on what nfts can do versus what they cannot do uh, because that's often how it's done you know and what they can do you know we can think of many examples one simple example we all know that at concert tickets, event tickets, there is a black market, huge black market. And when you go to, to a venue, you know, to, con to a concert, and if you don't have a ticket, you want to buy it there, who knows what you're getting. You know, you can get a kind of ticket that's already used, you can get just a piece of paper. NFTs can solve that. Event ticket NFTs, you always know you have the right one. So one use case, that's why it's worth it. And there's probably thousands of other cases. Got it. Um, thank you, guys. So for our audience, please engage with Gabby or YGG to be actively participating in this community-driven gaming space. Uh, XCA is, XA Infinity is kind of major one right now, but they are working with many different projects. So it's uh, to be uh, uh, a lot more kind of opportunities or, or experience you can get. Uh, for that radar, uh, visit their website to see that a lot of different data analytics that uh, I think it's important for you to actually you check the data and numbers rather than uh, swinging around by headlines. So the headline just pick it up the extreme cases on very narrow scope, but just check with the data yourself and then make the right decision for investment or building. Uh, thank you so much, Gabby and Scarmentes uh, for joining our, this panel. Hope that this panel gives uh, the audience uh, 
basically to understand how NFT has been evolved, not just born uh, last year, but it has been evolved gradually since 2017 or so, and where we are and what we are excited about in next stage of NFT. Thank you, everyone. Block Tower, uh, Steve from Block Tower. Hi, guys. My name is Kohei Nakamura. I'm co-founder of Token Pocket, which is the Japan number one eSIM wallet and Web3 browser application. I'm also a huge fan of NFT game. So far, I invested about 500 ESRs for the NFT game. Today, i like to talk with the Aryan World, the fastest growing NFT game project. Next up, we have Saro, who is the co-founder of the project and talking about how she got started with this project and how Aryan World works. So please welcome Sao. Hi, Kohei. Thanks so much for having me today. It's really great to be here with all of the viewers. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking with you. So Ritz, I ask about some question. So could you answer the question? Perfect. First, can you please introduce yourself with the reason why you dive into the blockchain game industry? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kohei. So yeah, so Alien Worlds is um, is not only the fastest growing NFT game, but we have now become the largest blockchain game in history. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. Has, no, no, it's fine. I mean, it's it's sort of happened quite quickly. And um, so we have over 2 million uh, lifetime users. Wow, and, uh, amazing. Which, yeah, in blockchain terms is about 10 times larger than the next nearest uh, blockchain game. So it, it really did grow uh, very rapidly and we've been incredibly um, excited to see that. And every day we have about 225,000 users. So for, um, again, for a blockchain game, wow. uh, that's kind of pushing, pushing the numbers up there. Um, <laughs> It's been an incredible experience. And um, so how did how did I get into it? How did our team at DeCoco get into blockchain gaming? Well, it really began because as a team, we've been building DAOs for a number of years, decentralized autonomous organizations. In fact, back when we started in about 2017, 2018, we were calling them DAX. Uh, mm. And since then we've, we've begun to use the more standard terminology DAO. Uh, we built the, um, the block producer called EOS DAX. Uh, which was uh, one of the largest uh, decentralized autonomous communities at the time, uh, and also a very successful token. And we also advised and helped other projects that wanted to be DAX to create a tokenized DAX for themselves. So we could already see the power of uh, DAX as tokenized projects that allowed people to come mm. together to track power, stake, reward, value, and work. You know, DAOs are organizations that allow lots of people to contribute their own effort and their own labor. So at the same time as seeing the power of DAOs and having built them and coded them and, and also created the communities around them for some time, we could also see the power of NFTs beginning to, to grow. You know, this <laughs> new type of blockchain token that represents unique things rather than fungible things. Um, I must say that I actually didn't see the vision of it as much as my co-founder Rob initially did. He was, he was looking at the market, he was seeing what various blockchains were doing, and he said, I think we should look at WAX as blockchain and, and NFTs in particular. So we kind of fused those two concepts. Uh, we created Alien Worlds, which is um, a DAO-based NFT DeFi game mm. <laughs> uh, in which users can mine. Yeah, it, can, it contains a few different elements, but is that we, we have those elements there so that it's, it's rich enough for people to play a lot, you know, because it has to be simple to start, but difficult to master. Otherwise, you wouldn't get people wanting to play it, mm -hmm. you know, every day for years. So it contains a few different elements. Uh, users start with mining, they mine the fungible token Trillium, uh, and they can also discover NFTs through their mining. And then they use those NFTs to, to mine more on different lands on different planets. And each of those planets is then a decentralized autonomous organization. Thanks. Do you suppose to create the uh, alien world Thanks. so and we, we really found it we founded alien worlds to um yeah to, to give everyone the chance to start proof of work mining and to begin to use nfts in their own lives so you know these days it's quite hard to begin to become a bitcoin miner isn't it it's, ah. it's for your average individual to become a Bitcoin miner. But on Alien Worlds, you can you can do proof of work mining. You actually have to supply a proof of work um, 
you know, the, the, the result of a, of a previous transaction. So, yeah, so we, we founded it to allow people to discover crypto, to discover these different elements of what crypto is all about, DAOs, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens. Um, and it's really been because of the community, because of those decentralized structures like the DAOs that lots of people have gotten um, interested in the project. It isn't just the founding team. It's all of these DAOs and all of the different people who have now come in and are providing services and um, are getting to know each other and creating collaborative and competitive communities. It's really because of that level of activity that the game has grown and become successful. Thanks. I'm, it makes sense. So mining is very uh, enjoyable uh, attraction, I think. So So the game is very fanable. So Okay. Exactly. <laughs> and the next question I like to uh, ask. In fact, there are many players who praise Alien Worlds in Japan. What do you think users find interesting about Alien Worlds? You know, I, it's a really good question. You know, I think different users have different reasons why they love the game. I think some people love the game mm -hmm. to get. To, to, to have to use the strategy of figuring out which NFTs, which land gets them the best payout. Some oh. players really enjoy forming these competitive and collaborative communities, getting to know each other. They create their, their own websites, their own Discord and Telegram channels that I'm not even in. Mm. And they strategize about how to take over a planet or how to maximize their rewards. So some players like that. I think that um, many players have wanted to get in to something new when it was just starting out. You know, when you play Alien Worlds, you can feel that you're using a product that's still in development. Like there no. are still bugs, you know? Yeah, no. It doesn't always work perfectly. You have to come onto the forum and ask each other, I thought that I'd mined an NFT, but I can't see it in my wallet. Why is that? And then another community member shows you a block explorer and says, no, no, you actually do have the NFT in your wallet. Just go to the block explorer. And so they're learning about crypto. I think that people really are very um, interested, obviously, in blockchain and crypto, but they mm -hmm. need to find a way in. And NFTs are, are more human than um, just pure, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum for many people, because they have this quality of being individual and unique, right? You can look at the particular NFT, right. it might represent an avatar or a tool or a piece of land. That's something that you can relate to. So I think they, the human emotional component of NFTs, it, it, there's more connection with them. Thanks. Yeah, good. And also I question, I have questioned about, I heard that many non-paying users pray Alien World for the reward. How could you reward them? Is there some kind of brilliant mechanism of the game or not? Yeah, so the play to earn dynamic is very powerful in Alien Worlds when you- awesome. uh, yeah, when you mine within Alien Worlds, you're earning Trillium, the token, and also non-fungible tokens. But also by getting involved in the DAOs, the decentralized autonomous organizations, you are participating in the governance that has control mm. over a very large treasury. So each of the six planets, when we open them to governance, will be controlling millions of Trillium. That has a pretty high, pretty you know, serious market value today. And so uh, when you stake to a planet DAO and you vote for counselors, there, there are going to be five counselors on each planet DAO. Mm -hmm. Those counselors will get to decide what happens to that treasury. And every week the counselors mm -hmm. change. So as an individual player, you have a lot of power to direct how the strategy of that planet goes. You can also run to be a, a counselor oh, yourself. <laughs> Exactly, and so we've got a lot of competitive dynamics between people that are run to, running to be counselors. They're forming these slates together where they're promising to support each other. Uh, oh, really okay. interesting dynamics. That's awesome dynamics, so. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so we will move on to the next question. Cool, yeah. Uh, is there anything that you feel it different from other countries when you enter the Japanese market? Uh, well, I've been really enjoying getting to know um, Japanese members of the Japanese crypto community, <laughs> the tech community in general in Japan. Uh, for starters, everyone is extremely polite and lovely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. Um, 
obviously very sophisticated uh, users in Japan, you know, people who have oh, been sophisticated, using... sophisticated, thanks. Yeah, I would say definitely compared to some other markets where um, maybe people are still expecting to kind of make a quick buck or whatever. I think the Japanese users uh, realize that the technology has substance mm -hmm. behind it. They're interested in it. Um, there have been a number of tokens that have come out of Japan. And um, of course, there's a lot of, you know, mining activity. And so, yeah, I think that people are interested in the underlying technology. Uh, they want to understand where the real value in the tokenomics is. Uh, so it's very, very satisfying to be working with Japanese colleagues. Um, obviously, the Japanese aesthetic is a little bit different from in the West. You know, there's particular characters and particular... Yeah, I think. Yeah, and so I think it's really important, the kind of localization, the, the sort of really partnering with um, people in Japan who can help to guide us to what would be popular in that market and what people are, are looking to see is important. But um, in general, there's more in common uh, with Japan and, and I would say the West, except I would say it's, it's quite a, a well-educated, sophisticated mm. market already for crypto. Thanks. I'm here. I, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so next um we're real time so <clears throat> next question is i also like to know the chain selection there's several blockchain like ethereum flow a polygon or something like so why do you choose the wax blockchain yeah so we chose wax for the game that's where our gaming logic is residing so the dow smart contracts for the planet the mining mechanism the way that trillium flows to the different mining and dow activities uh, but our token itself is on ethereum the binance smart chain and on wax uh, and that's because we understand that people want to use you know different chains have different benefits so if you're storing high value assets you might want to do that on ethereum because that's a chain that you know and it's very decentralized and <laughs> you have metamask set up already and that's great um if you want to trade the token on binance you can move it onto the binance smart chain and then yeah, you can it's do very that. good to use experience i think that's right. So we so exactly it's the user experience that is driving um, where we put the different uh, aspects of the metaverse. But it, I think we're probably one of the only projects that uses three blockchains um, and the, the blockchain construction is, has been very we really thought about that um, in order to give users what they need. Now, recall that if we had tried to locate if we had tried to build everything on Ethereum, it wouldn't have worked, you know, the, well, you just can't put the game, the type of smart contracts that we have powering the game on Ethereum, but that's okay because, you know, we have a layer two solution in WAX and then we can put the token itself on Ethereum. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, we are running on time, out of time. So this is the final question. Please let me know what is the future vision of the alien world? Oh, wow. So we have such a huge roadmap. I mean, we're only about a quarter of the way through our roadmap. <laughs> uh, so we are just day and night, we are building. Uh, so we have the mining and staking functionality out. The Planet DAO governance will be opening soon. We have Planet Binance opening soon, which is our gaming logic on the Binance smart chain. Uh, we have uh, questing and fighting dynamics. So these are two new entire games that will use our NFTs and where users will be able to earn uh, and, and, and strategize uh, to earn NFTs and Trillium. I would say the so one of the biggest kind of things that we will see is this opening of the competitive dynamics between the DAO, the planet DAOs. Mm -hmm. No other project is putting DAOs in competition with each other for the single scarce resource, which is Trillium. And it's a very exciting dynamic. Uh, and this will unleash and has already begun to unleash um, a lot of user generated activity. So we call it user generated DeFi because users themselves will be able to select where the, the planet treasuries will be allocated. So, uh, and in addition to that, we have a land roadmap. So land uh, is an NFT in our metaverse and that will continue to be developed out. There's various functionality that we have associated with that. But I would say that that's just what we as the central team are doing. Our community is busy building out so much stuff all the time. We have people who have created their own websites, communities, services. Um, I expect that will actually be where most of the activity happens in, in future is, is from our community itself. Yeah, that's very exciting. And I'm very looking forward to 
seeing the future of alien worlds. So Thanks, we, are, Kohei, yeah. we are running out of time. So <laughs> uh, thank you for listening and attending at this meeting. Thank you so much for having me. Um, really, really lovely to connect in with the Japanese audience. And um, Kohei, maybe you'll run to be a counselor on one of our planets. Yeah, I will run the counselor and one of planet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> fun. Thanks. We'll show, we'll show you around. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks. So, bye. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Pleasure meeting everyone here. Um, this is going to be a really exciting panel. We will be discussing about asking the world's top dApp developers and within the blockchain uh, gaming industry. And I'm attended by really stellar speakers we have today. And just to, before we go ahead and ask for the speaker introductions, I'd like to kind of quickly introduce about what we're doing at D Station. So we're building the internet of NFTs. And our goal is to connect all NFTs across any blockchain. We foresee that in the near future, crypto wallet is going to be a commonplace. And we also believe that NFTs are going to be in every single crypto wallet as well. And with all that said, and all the different blockchains issuing different NFTs, we see the opportunity to connect all NFTs across any blockchain, just like how um, uh, the growth of NFTs has been remarkable over these years. And thanks for um, the blockchain gaming industry for pioneering all the different aspects of this entire NFT revolution. So with this said, I'd like to pass on to the panelists today and do a quick introduction before we dive straight into the panel questions. Matt, would you like to kick it off? Sure. Um, so I'm I'm Matt. Um, from uh, I'm the the Rev Motorsport brand lead. Um, in my last life, I actually was a was a racing driver myself, and so that's how I kind of um, got into the space. Um, I'm from Hong Kong, uh, so I got in touch with Yat at Animoca Brands, um, and uh, kind of fast forward to now, looking at sort of ways to kind of connect the uh, the Rev Motorsport platform um, and ecosystem with the greater kind of motorsport uh, that real life motorsport uh, world. So. Yeah, that's that's me, and very excited to be here uh, in you know amongst such a esteemed panel. Jeff. Hey everybody, I'm Jeff, or uh, also known as Gho's. I'm a co-founder of Sky Mavis. We build Axie Infinity. Uh, yeah, Axie Infinity is a kind of cute game where you can battle these pets. I think we're the number one uh, NFT project by daily volume right now. We have around 94,000 daily active users. It's nice to be here. Awesome. So we have Saro. Hi, it's great to be here with all of you um, and connecting with, with your audience in Japan. Uh, so I'm Saro McKenna. I'm a co-founder of Alien Worlds. Uh, we are a DAO-based NFT uh, game. We are uh, the largest uh, blockchain game by users. Uh, we have over 2 million uh, lifetime users and about 225,000 daily users. Um, yeah, delighted to be here and to, to chat about this topic with you. 
Great. And we have uh, Sebastian coming up. Hi, everyone. A lot of familiar faces here. Really happy to connect again. Uh, I'm Sebastian Borget. I'm the CEO and co-founder at The Sandbox, which is a gaming virtual world on the Ethereum blockchain, which enables creators to monetize their 3D asset and game experience through the use of NFTs as well as Sand Token. Uh, we I'm also the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance, which regroups over 235 companies in the space from various corners who are promoting and pushing for adoption of blockchain technology within the video game industry. And then, uh, yep, really excited to see the growth in the space. Uh, we believe we are one part of it uh, with virtual lands. We are by far the largest and most decentralized virtual world in terms of landowners and recently in terms of transaction volume around land as well. Okay, great. So we're going to break down the questions into four different phases. In the first phase, going by general trend, and then secrets to traction, and then real gamers versus speculators. And in the fourth phase will be DAOs of the future. So let's kick off the first phase where we ask, so given the surge of the excitement in the NFT space, what's the biggest difference you've noticed in the market for DApp gains between last year and now? So we'll have Matt and the same um, round of circle speakers to kick it off the question. Sure. Um, so I actually, I'm very new to the space. Uh, well, new. I was here, uh, I joined in um, around October last year. So right when the Rev Motorsport platform was kicking off, uh, right when, you know, we had a lot of traction coming with uh, our officially licensed um, game F1 Delta time. And in the nine months that I've been in the space, you know, the growth has been incredible. And I think, you know, just on a, on a daily basis, we're seeing new projects, um, new ways of, of interaction within the space, whether that's, um, you know, in a, in a gaming sphere and, and kind of just a lot of buzz and a lot of noise and attention. Um, and I think people really kind of seeing the value of, of how gaming or gamification in the space, um, had, you know, builds true utility for the NFTs. And, and that's, I guess, you know, in, in the sort of the, the medium to long term, I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the projects thrive is, is in that utility and how, how the NFTs can interact. So in this short time I've been here, it's, it's just it's been an absolute journey. It's been amazing. All right. Jeff, would you like to add some comments? Sure, sure. So I think we're starting to see product market fit for a couple of select projects. I think we're starting to see playbooks emerge, right? Like for example, play to earn is becoming a term that people use and are excited about. Uh, we're starting to see real users impacted and helped um, and having you know really awesome experiences that can impact their lives uh, through NFT games. So I think there is a path forward. And I, I think we understand more about what's needed, uh, what we need to build. I think like up and coming game developers, right? They have some kind of playbooks to follow. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's, you know, that there is a market here. There is a, some demand. Uh, we, we're starting to see the interesting behaviors that emerge when you give gamers property rights, right? At two, three years ago, it was like, okay, if we give gamers property rights, right, so it's going to be better, right? Like that's kind of, you know, all we had to go on. Um, we knew that it would be good, but it was actually very difficult to pin down and articulate exactly the benefits um, that freedom for gamers would, would, uh, would bring. Um, but we're now starting to see, okay, like if people can freely trade their in-game resources, right? You start to see things like play to earn uh, emerging and uh, kind of basically these digital economies that are helping real people. So um, yeah, I, th I think it's, there's a lot more clarity actually. Uh, but I also think that there's still a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work to be done. Um, but I think it's just, you know, that's just a, a compounding, uh, compounding thing where, you know, we haven't had enough you know, enough time, um, enough runway uh, to get some of these effects going for a lot of the projects out there. Yeah, definitely brought up a pretty interesting topic, um, play to earn, and we'll definitely circle back uh, a little bit. Sarah, would you like to chime in? 
Yeah, I mean, I think like if we look back a year ago, the, the main feature of what's happened is just growth, right? And growth of so many things, growth of users, growth of the tech, growth of the amount of finance that, that is in the space, growth of the different platforms. Um, you know, the, the fact that fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens are now working together in order to provide different types of experiences for users, different financing into, into projects. And that growth, I think, is, you know, the product of innovation and is also spurring a lot of innovation. And I don't just mean from projects themselves. I think actually users are becoming, are learning about crypto through gaming. And I think that's really, um, really a special sort of time that we're in right now where users are learning about how to interact with wallets. They're understanding, you know, how to use block explorers and see that they have real cryptocurrencies, real NFTs and other things in their wallets. They're helping each other, you know, communities are forming and, um, you know, really decentralized bilateral communications between community members friendships forming, you know, these are all real, this is the growth that is actually occurring. And I think um, it's super exciting. I think we'll look back on this time as being extremely special and a time when a lot of sort of pure creativity is happening, um, in part because there's so much value that's come into the space, you know, and therefore new talent, um, but also perhaps because we haven't yet <clears throat> reached the phase where it's becoming highly commercialized and highly professionalized. So we're still kind of in that in-between phase where there's just a lot of technical and, and community-based creativity and innovation happening. Uh, definitely community is another topic we should definitely talk about here. Uh, it's been a massive growth uh, all across all games. And Sebastian, would you like to share a little bit? Yes, uh, I couldn't agree more with both uh, Jeff and Sarah. Like, we've been pioneers in the space uh, together. We've seen for the past three years, the momentum, the growth around it. And a lot of what we used to be just preaching as like, okay, this is what's coming. This is all the possibilities of true ownership of digital asset. Now it's happening for real. There are people who are earning a living uh, through play to earn and through gaming and NFTs, which is fantastic. Uh, and I would like to really reinforce the idea that this is really community driven, putting the user first in this rather than the developer, the platform uh, at first. And these are, we are just still at the beginning phase of what as an ecosystem we can offer to those communities, those users in terms of new jobs, in terms of revenue earning possibilities, either through the creator economy or through the play to earn economy. And I just can't wait to make it go even more global uh, behind through all the digital jobs that will be created and um, leveraging games such as Alien World, such as Axifinity or the Sandbox to be played and, um, and earned through them. Right. And I also want to touch about the elephant in the room, which is gas fees. Because yes, last year, this time, the Ether price was not nearly as high, but now we're seeing some really intense um, price upward movement. And on top of that, gas fees has been quite a problem for a lot of blockchain users. Now, I really want to touch about this topic. Um, so we'd like to ask the speakers here, uh, what's your take on um, gas fees? So I think, so with Axie, I think Axie is a really nice laboratory to look at because we just recently moved all of our activity, all our marketplace activity from Ethereum to Ronin, our Ethereum sidechain. And so in one month, uh, volume has increased 310% to 37 million. Uh, the number of traders, NFT traders in our marketplace has increased by 177% to 22,500. The number of NFT sales within our ecosystem has increased 500% um, to 134,000. Uh, so it's clear that, right, I think scaling solutions, whether they be side chains or layer twos, are going to be really important for the future of NFTs. Um, I think that, yeah, that's also been part of what's been driving the growth um, in the industry. I think, uh, yeah, we're, there's a lot of experimentation to be done. Um, there's still a lot of kind of wars um, to be fought. Uh, and, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very promising to see that, right? Like people, we developers used to say like, oh, users, 
you know, they don't care if, uh, you know, they just want the benefits of blockchain, right? Uh, this used to be a hypothesis. <laughs> this used to be something that, you know, people would say when they're, you know, making a justification for why they're moving to something like a side chain that's more centralized, right, than Ethereum mainnet. Um, but it's now, it's now basically been proven by the market that it's true. Like, users would rather uh, access the benefits of blockchain, right, being able to sell to anyone anywhere in the world to be able to earn money to participate in this awesome digital economy, they're not so concerned with, okay, like uh, making sure that, you know, their their assets are on um, Ethereum mainnet, which, you know, some people thought, right, like uh, users w- wouldn't want to use side chains or layer two. So I think that's, it's been a really important uh, experiment. And I think, uh, yeah, in, in order to reach the next stages of this revolution, um, we're going to see a lot of uh, developers, yeah, experimenting on either ETH scaling solutions or uh, even alternative layer ones. Yeah, I think in um, I think I believe that uh, um, Matthew or Rev and Sebastian Sandbox are both on the Ethereum, while Sarah was on Wax Blockchain, which is a little bit different story here. Before we're gonna. Um, Jump in back to uh, Matthew and Sebastian. I'd like to hear a uh, Saro's take on yeah. blockchain. Well, is, exactly. I mean, the blockchain construction and how the architecture of that is so crucial to scaling, which is something that we've absolutely found with Alien World. So, in fact, our gaming logic and our NFTs are all running on Wax, which means that we have all of our DAOs. We have six planet DAOs that are all on chain tokenized DAOs uh, with full multi sig permissions. Each has its own fungible token. Uh, with stake rated voting. That's all on chain because we've located that on WAX. Our NFTs, which have gameplay utility, which can be read by our smart contracts and have attributes that are you know, fully on chain, that's all on WAX again, which is a great chain to do that on. Uh, but our fungible token, Trillium, is actually on Ethereum and on WAX and on the Binance smart chain, uh, which means that users can trade it on Binance. Uh, they can store it on Ethereum, which is a brilliant chain for storing you know, high value assets, or they can use it within our game on the Wax blockchain. And we have a teleport uh, function that, that allows them to, to move between chains. So, you know, I think that it's really the, the, the structural design of, of how the blockchains interact with each other and, and using more than one chain, I think is really important because you can't do everything on one chain. And we have an invisible blockchain ideology, which is where we want users to be able to you know, have their assets and their functionality on the chain that makes most sense for what they're trying to do at that time. Um, obviously, that requires a certain amount of agility. I mean, we were lucky that we started, you know, building already when we could see that trying to locate everything on Ethereum was probably going to create a scaling challenge because of gas fees. And so we, you know, we were able to, to bake in a different design into our construction. But for projects that have been around for longer and that, you um, you know, have have everything on Ethereum. They have had now to catch up and 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 have layer two solutions or you know other solutions. I think that's really um, a crucial design feature is that kind of constant agility with using multiple blockchains and having the technical capability to do that. Yeah, and for the interest of time, we'll segue to the next phase of discussion. So, which is the secrets to traction? Do the rest of the blockchain game developers struggling to get user traction? What were some of the best decisions you've made or the team has made that gave you or the team a breakthrough to achieving such a major user following and strong community state? So I was going to ask Sebastian uh, on this. Uh, it was very, very recently we saw Dead Mouse and uh, Richie Halton uh, doing concert in Sebastian uh, Sandbox. So I'd uh, love to kind of get Sebastian's take on this. Right, very interesting. We haven't done yet the concert. We just announced them and they are landowner in you know, our metaverse. We will launch those concerts within the next six to 12 months as we're still building the platform and the different experience that will populate those land. I think one of the best decisions we took was really to embrace the idea of like uh, the, NF- the metaverse culture, the NFT communities, which are really strong and powerful this year in the way that they are already engaging into NFT collection. They are driving adoption. They are driving the use cases as well. And we want to become the virtual playground for any NFT at the end of the day. So moving a little bit from um, still keeping the vision of turning any 
players into a creator and allowing anyone to make their NFTs with Sandbox tool, but also finally being that open NFT metaverse where just anyone with their NFT could come and play with them. So if you have like a Formula One NFT from uh, F1 Delta time, it could be represented through interoperability and an NFT bridge as a real 3D racing car into Sandbox. If you have an Axie, it could be your pet companion for your avatar. If you have an uh, Alien World ship or planet, it could represent you something. And that could be true for any CryptoPunk, MeBits, uh, and some other NFT collection like Bored Apes, Voxodeus, and so other that we already have been working with really closely. And that amount of collaboration among all the different projects and communities in the space is just amazing, something we've never seen before. And that we are glad to be that place where anyone can socialize, play, and interact with their NFTs in new manner, adding speciality to the original utility of the NFTs, and then uh, giving value to the users, to all projects in a win-win type of collaboration. Yeah, and I uh, just want to pass it on to Matthew here. When F1 Delta came about, uh, everybody's really, really excited about these sports cars. Love to hear what's the secret to traction from your end. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, Sebastian really hit the nail on the head there, um, you know, with with a lot of these big IPs and, and kind of celebrities and stuff being involved. I think that's really what drives the kind of user engagement. And I think it's 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 fascinating to see, like, you know, for example, recently we just signed uh, Juan Pablo Montoya, who's, a, who's an ex-Formula One driver around the same era as, you know, Michael Schumacher and, and Fernando Alonso. Um, and, you know, Mon Montoya is going to be kind of one of our, our lead figures in, in kind of driving the adoption with Rev and with, uh, um, you know, with our, our motorsport platform. So I think really having the, the big IPs is a, is a, was a, a fantastic, you know, kind of the, the pillars of our, um, of our ecosystem. And I think for, the, you know, the same goes for, for a lot of other, um, you know, for a lot of the other, you know, metaverses and, and stuff like that, where I think, you know, it's key to have strong IP um, behind you that drive the project forward. Um, and then um, obviously, you know, that's where the, the initial traction comes from. And then it's, it's off the back of that, building a strong experience for the community, for the users and players. And I think that's, uh, you know, you start to build something quite special. Right. And I want to circle back to Jeff. Uh, I think when Axie released the uh, governance token, it got quite a lot of people interested because you guys are really pushing this play to earn incentive in place. Could you kind of share a little bit more how play to earn has increased retention across all users and kind of growth in general? Yeah, definitely. So we launched our play to earn feature in December of 2019. And at that time, right, it was, it, you know, ERC, the combination of ERC 20s and NFTs, people hadn't really done this experiment yet. Uh, some people were even like, why are you, why are you doing this? Like, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but what we saw is that when you have for a token with actual real utility within your ecosystem, it creates this, I think, very rewarding mechanic where people can earn a resource by playing the game and then they can sell it, you know, immediately on a DEX or later something like Binance. And they're able to basically feel like there's this wage for playing the game. So it's a very concrete benefit that makes sense to people. Uh, you know, they don't have to be like kind of nerdy blockchain people, right? They, 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 they might never have used blockchain before and something that really makes a lot of sense to them. So, yeah, you know, obviously Binance and doing the IEO, that helped, uh, you know, catapult us. Um, but the only reason that we were selected for Binance in the first place is because we already had a very strong base, right? So I think, yeah, Axie is a product of, you know, just we started early. I think we started with the right philosophy. We believe in empowering our community. Um, you know, I think we speak directly to our players. We make sure that they really understand the vision. And I think that also helps where, right? Like community is our only distribution strategy. So what do I do as the growth lead? I just make sure that our community understands the vision so that they can tell their friends and family you know, what Axie is about and why they should start playing. Um, I don't think that, yeah, like, you know, I think, I think for NFT projects, community is really the only distribution channel that, you know, you have to focus on. 
Um, and yeah, I think like it's really about getting it to the point where your community members can start onboarding their friends and family. If you can get your product and your ecosystem to the point where that happens, then you're going to start to experience viral, viral growth. Um, if, if that doesn't happen and you have to rely on like press or uh, I don't know, like, yeah, kind of different one one off events, it's not sustainable. You might see a, a spike, but uh, you're not going to have uh, strong enough retention to keep compounding that growth. Uh, so, yeah, with Axie, we see 40 percent D30 retention, uh, which is, I think, 4x the, the industry average for mobile games. Um, you know, some people think that this is really surprising, but it's, it, you know, it's a different type of data because it's a different type of game, right? It's like, it's, it's more like how many people show up to work every day, right? It's like, that's more like the, the, yeah. the data that we should be comparing to rather than like traditional mobile gaming industry data. So great. Yeah. yeah I know that actually has changed the lives of many, I've seen a lot of heartwarming photos of people over there in the Philippines and playing the game daily as a social income. I'll just take this opportunity to segue to the next phase of discussion here. This is real gamers versus speculators. So we can all agree squawkers, squatters, and speculators ruin the fun for most passionate gamers wanting to own their digital collectibles. Nevertheless, they do play a role of driving the DApp gaming economy. If you can share what are some insightful user behaviorism and analytics you and the team have discovered over the past. Sarah, would you like to share a little bit about what's happening over at Alien Worlds? Yeah, I mean, we have experienced extremely uh, hyperbolic growth. We added about a million users within a sort of two week period um, over the spring. And um, what we found actually was that um, the metrics across all of our different platforms were growing roughly in sync with each other. So our, our Lifetime users were, of course, growing. Our daily users were growing. But also our Twitter, our Discord, our Telegram were growing roughly in step with the overall growth that we were seeing in, in on-chain activity. Um, additionally, the trading volumes of our token were kind of also really high in that period. And so, you know, we were kind of seeing across every single area of the metaverse, you could say at that time, we were seeing that kind of growth and activity. So that suggests, I think, that... Um, you know, real users were coming in to play the game, we're learning about it, we're trying to understand how it worked, we're asking questions. Um, we've since had to scale up our player support and, you know, everything a lot in order to be able to, to really engage with people. And I think one of the things, you know, that's really important when, when you see that kind of growth is to help people graduate from the sort of the reason why they first come to the game, which might be a play to earn dynamic, or might be, you know, in general, because someone told them about it, we see pockets of, of growth happening, you know, amongst students or amongst certain geographies, and then it kind of mushrooms out from there. But helping people to graduate from that, that initial reason why they join the game to then being, you know, far more involved at a fundamental level. So for us, that would be involvement in our planetary DAOs, which are, you know, DAOs that you can run to be a counselor on, you should be voting for the counselors on those planets. The DAOs themselves have massive treasuries, actually, right now, they've, they've accrued treasuries of millions of trillion and will have a lot of sort of power in themselves, a very, very decentralized structure that really incentivizes people to get involved at that, at that level and gives power to our players. So yeah, we're really thinking about how to help people to understand how they can get involved in the next level um, so that it isn't just a few leaders, but is everybody who's getting involved in our planetary DAO dynamics and, and graduating to that level of, of being involved. Great, speaking of DAOs, great time to segue to the next phase of discussion here through the interest of time. So DAOs are the future. It has always been the game creator's dream to produce a game that can outlive his or her own life. And given the rise in information of DAOs and governance tokens, what are the challenges ahead for DApps to transition control to a community leadership with the goal of reaching complete decentralized sovereignty? Matt, would you like to share a few opinions on this? Sure, yeah. I think, um, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, Saro and, and Sebastian would probably answer this a little bit more eloquently. You know, right now we're obviously, you know, we're still in, in kind of, I guess, majority control of our game and, and how our uh, kind of communities and, and, and sort of the, the rev economy works. Um, but I guess, you know, it just my two cents, I, th I think, you know, the, the, the struggles that, 
you would see in a in a DAO structure are, are kind of the very human side of, of the DAO structure itself with the way that voting works and and you know whether the the votes get passed that that you know the kind of representation of each you know of, of the different parties um, and I guess maybe sometimes it's it's you know good representation uh, good representation or, or participation and getting people all involved in the actual um, you know in the actual DAO structure so I want to pass it off to to you know maybe Sahar or Sebastian who who are actually seeing these um kind of have a play in their uh, in their ecosystems. Sebastian, the mic is yours. All right, just uh, several things about DAO. Definitely, there is I would say that the main platform or game DAO where you owner of the token or owner of the NFTs can participate in the governance, and that can be put in place progressively, starting first very centralized, like the developer, the platform still takes. Made most of the decision and progressively introduce decentralization as part of its roadmap. That's what we plan to do with Sandbox. But there's something more interesting happening as well in terms of DAO is like how uh, external communities, external, uh, I would say, entrepreneurs are using the NFTs of the different platform and games, pulling them together into a DAO and then leveraging them as part of creating an active community of interest such as owning a pool of land, hiring artists and creators to build those lands and sharing among them the revenue generated from the, um, the playing and uh, content creation, for example. And we also see similarly DAOs of players who are going to do that for play to earn, to uh, improve the skill of everyone, have scholarship training and uh, leverage play to earn business model across one or multiple games as well. And I, that is uh, the future, in my opinion, of blockchain gaming, like how those DAOs are going to involve, bring users and, and be the next step I into leveraging the games and that we are. Sure. And then I'd like to kind of have uh, Jeff and Sarah each for one minute on this topic of DAOs of the future. Jeff, would you like to fire it off? Yeah, sure. So... Yeah, I think I think basically this DAOification. Um, so right, so now we're okay. We're, we started out NFTs, and then we added ERC twenties. Started getting into DeFi, and now it's like okay, we started, we started adding these governance tokens, and we're getting into DAOs. Right? I think it makes sense. Right? It's about uh, I think the future uh, applications. The only way that we can reach our true potential is by adding all elements of the stack and kind of harmonizing. Uh, but yeah, it's it's gonna you know take a lot of experiments, um, probably done by a lot of the people on this call to to figure out the best kind of pass forward uh, when it comes to to governance, right? I think like the end goal is to create games that are owned and governed uh, by the community uh, that the kind of by the, by their players and users. Um, I think user generated content um, goes really well with this, right? It's like, okay, you may have one main entity building, um, but then also slowly over time, right? You decentralize like who's actually building content on top of the game, um, just as you're decentralizing who's actually owning the game. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it makes sense. And there, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, experiments to be done. I think, you know, the, the proper way to do it is to start small by saying, okay, like maybe we're going to let the community decide on this small thing, right? It's like, what is the NFT marketplace fee on uh, our marketplaces? Should it, should it be 4%, 4 should it be 3.9%, should it be 4.4%, Some, something small like that, right? Yeah. What, what is the uh, breeding fee? Um, it, it, you know, sh uh, maybe for battle games, like, you know, a little decisions on meta tweaks, yes. things like that, things like that. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. And I think there's a lot of experiments that need to be uh, attempted before we have like real clarity. All right. And the last minute is yours, Saro. Kick it off. Thanks. So this is a topic so close to my heart because we were building DAOs before we were building NFTs or any other type of thing. So that's actually our heritage since 2018. We've been building at that time. We were calling them DAX, actually. Um, and we built a product called the DAC Factory. And it's why our company name is DeCoco. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we see this as an absolutely integral uh, way that, you know, blockchain games have to build. And it's sort of the corollary concept to play to earn from a kind of token perspective, it's that, but from a community perspective, it's really giving um, power and autonomy to people. And when you do that, you do 
have to unleash control. So actually, we have these six DAOs that have big treasuries that will be controlled by people. I mean, quite frankly, as one of the creators of the game, I find that a little scary, right? Because <laughs> one of the planet DAOs could go off and do something that maybe we would prefer that they not do. But there are self-regulating mechanisms in place. So each of our planet DAO counselors are only in for a week. And they have to get reelected. So, you know, when you, this is one of the really important things about DAO building is you have to calibrate each of the variables very carefully so that you get self-regulating mechanisms. And that's how crypto is designed to be. Decentralized autonomous organizations are designed to be self-regulating. So if they run themselves into the wall one time, you can actually, they can actually bring themselves back because the voters should then vote in a new set of uh, people in, in a delegated dem, dem, uh, democracy system who would then change the direction of the DAO. So uh, be prepared for it to break is what I would say, and then be prepared for it to sort of resurrect itself. Um, that's what crypto is all about. Sure. And this wraps up to the end of the discussion. My pleasure to be moderating this panel and uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks so much. That was really fun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone for inviting me and, and kind of wanting me to, you know, interested in listening to what, I, what I'm going to have to say. Uh, so as a quick intro before I dive into basically uh, a bunch of slides about what we do. Um, I'm Sean. Uh, I'm basically uh, a VP of product at Animoca. Uh, that means that I'm also the product lead for Rev Motorsport. Um, and also I'm connected in helping a lot of the other Animoca brands family in their blockchain projects or as they're bringing their projects towards blockchain. Um, I'm hands-on with trying to help them think about blockchain as a design concept for their kind of their gaming platforms as they bring them in, into this blockchain space and how they can really start to leverage and think about NFTs and, and blockchain as a, as a tool for creation. Um, so to get started on kind of, you know, who we are, I'm just going to share these slides and then I'll run through who we are as Animoca and uh, we go from there. So, okay. Right. And there. Okay. So, the, I will go into more a little bit about Rev Motorsport itself, because that's kind of um, a bit of an area of speciality, but I'm definitely going to talk about what we are as Animoca and what we have as Animoca as well. Um, so Animoca, uh, we've been around for around seven years now. Um, we've predominantly focused prior to the last three years or so, we mainly focused on building um, blockchain applications. Uh, on, on games, but over the last three years, we started to leverage blockchain um, to build these same game experiences. We've always, as it's in the name, uh, been focused on using brands and bringing IP into uh, fans and gamers' hands. Um, you can see right here in this slide how you know we work with the likes of Formula One, with Scooby and Peanuts, um, some Disney IP there through some of our applications that we that we operate today, Power Rangers, and, and then obviously sports is is kind of integral to what we're building as as we move forward with how we leverage blockchain. Uh, as Annie Mocker, um, we've been. Again, like we've been in this space for quite some time. We've been building games for more than seven years, even though Animoca has been around for seven or eight years. But the history to, to the company that kind of spawned Animoca was also very much in games and been building games for you know, 15 or more years, at least in regards to publishing and then into development. Um, but we've been familiar with building games across PC. Um, early up, we experimented in Facebook. Very early, we jumped into mobile, uh, building games and distributing early across you know, Google Play as a platform. Obviously, we were obviously early on the App Store as well on, the, on iOS. Um, but then over the last few years, we started to really focus on blockchain. Um, blockchain allows us to do a few things that we find to be very integral to how um, ownership can change in the future for, for players and how kind of it can change the way that we create content and the incentives or reasons that people will engage and play what we build. A core premise of this is what we refer to as play to earn, um, which is a way for players and gamers to engage with the same content that they're familiar with, but walk away with something 
in a tangible commercial manner from the back of it. So they're earning, in some cases, real dollar value for spending their time playing games. But our position right now is that we've been able to build ourselves up as a leader within this space. Um, and it's been a path that has been basically um, incentivized or, or allowed to happen through our ability to create partnership and our ability to work with others. So this is our path over the last three or four years um, where we grew to what we are today as this current, you know, um, established company within blockchain gaming today. And it's through developing partnerships. It's grew due to being very early and wanting to work with and knowing the people who were building crypto kiddies and what that was, but then also kind of, you know, building out our network of, of people who are building products that are technologically important to blockchain, you know, the likes of Wax, who built something that became very widely accessible to a lot of people, um, you know, leveraging IP that people can be familiar with, with, you know, starting early with Atari, but then Formula One, MotoGP, and our own brands, bringing in companies who have a vision to be able to build and leverage blockchain in very interesting ways, such as, you know, when the acquisition with the gaming company who does hyper casual games with the sandbox and their vision for a true collectible, creationable metaverse. And then with companies such as Quid and Limpo who have are, are almost primed on day one for a blockchain ecosystem where Limpo has a foundation in, in early crypto with the concepts of sports as being a leverage point and then Quid being kind of the biggest collectible platform uh, that's available. But three years with lots happening is still very, very early days in kind of what we're trying to do ultimately. So to touch on some of these, uh, these companies, firstly, it's the Sandbox. So the Sandbox is um, essentially a combination of a creator's space built within a voxel aesthetic um, where players can own every single asset down to the land itself. Um, within the land that you own, you can build and create your very own games, your own world within it. And all of these exist and connect together as well. The Sandbox is an incredibly exciting platform and it's been able to leverage and bring in numerous partners um, from you know, IP that people might know outside of the Sandbox, outside of the crypto and blockchain world, such as you know, groups like um, you know, the Care Bears, the Smurfs, um, F1 Delta Time is, is, is what has a land uh, within, within the sandbox. Uh, we're building for the sandbox as Annie Mocker. Um, two kind of more crypto uh, known properties as well with you know, Binance having land segments themselves and, and companies along those lines. So the sandbox is a true metaverse and probably the, like the one that has within the concept of land within blockchain makes it so much sense. And people kind of understand this concept so very well. The sandbox has been able to kind of make it presented its land concept in a way that feels more tangible because people understand play within how it's been presented so far. They can say, oh, it looks like Minecraft. Oh, it looks like Roblox or kind of the feeling is there. So they understand it. The leap is not far. Gaming is a hyper casual gaming platform that is playable from browsers and through Telegram as well. Um, it has a huge audience of engaged people who are playing to earn at this very moment. Um, but this is being modified and blockchain integrated with the gaming token and taking it one further step to, to what that kind of play to earn world and economy could be. These are games that anybody can enjoy and you can enjoy them within 30 seconds or 20 seconds, 10 seconds if you're a bad player. But obviously, you know, they're, they're, they're viral games, they're multiplayer games, they're community games. And it is important that they're hyper casual because the idea is access to all. Um, and that concept ties in very well with wanting to kind of bring in so many more people into, into blockchain or the possibilities of what blockchain can bring. Another is, is Quid. So this has been mentioned a couple of times, but Quid is currently one of the largest digital spaces for collectibles in, in the world right now. Um, it's currently an app that's, that's available today on the App Store. It has, there's a brand in there that every single person will recognize, one in there that everybody will probably love. Um, and they are collectibles in the way that you, you would think. They're, they're a sticker, they're a card. 
They're an object, they're an item, they're something that people understand what, how to collect and what that means. And then considering that that is already understood, attaching a layer of blockchain to it only increases the value con concept to these assets that people already understand. Um, it's, it created an incredibly exciting platform and it's already done a concept of mintable sales in, in regards to a promotion that they recently did with Atari, which again is, is a partner we've been working with for some time, Annie Mocha, where essentially people were able to buy richly rendered 3D uh, versions of known Atari classics, such as you know cartridges from back in that time, and arcade cabinets from back in that time. And it's the first few steps towards where Quid can ultimately go when it starts to really leverage blockchain. Another company that we have, so again, like Animoca, we're very diverse um, and we try and be as diverse as possible. And one of the companies that allows us to do that is, is Enway, who are building titles in a space that exists within the, the traditional AAA. So they, their titles such as Power Rangers is a game that is playable today across all of the existing consoles that people can go out and buy right now. It's also an app uh, on the app stores as well. But the great thing there is that with them being connected to the Animoca brand's kind of family and the knowledge that we have and the track records that we have so far in being able to bring these, these you know, gaming experience on blockchain means that um, there is a richness of experience that we can already build through Enway and also then tie that to what blockchain can allow from a different layer of, uh, of, of richness in, in ownership and in asset. So jumping into Rev Motorsport. Um, so Rev Motorsport is operated um, out of our Hong Kong hub, um, and it is focused on, as the name says, motorsport. We have four major partners right now, um, Formula One, MotoGP, Formula E, and Veloce. Um, Formula One is a, a game that's playable today. MotoGP is building out its experience as we speak and has already gone through collectible car packs sales. Formula E is a management game that's going to start blossoming towards people in the coming month. And Veloce allows us to connect to esports and athletes and bring those to blockchain into our ecosystem. We recently also uh, announced that Juan Pablo Montoya is part of the Rev motorsport world as he's going to come in and basically help us spread the word of rev and he had one the icon right there on his helmet as well during his uh his indie uh which he ended up doing pretty well in that race as well f1 delta time is a fully realized racing game it's playable today inside your browser the qualifying phase of it is playable today every single core asset within f1 delta time is ownable as well so all of these cars are ownable nfts everything exists as an nft on ethereum we also have tracks that exist or event segments as we refer to them in f1 delta time is too again they're a core asset that exists within this ecosystem and F1 Delta Time today has a true play to earn economy that runs every single day, every single week. This week, right now, if you go and play in the time trial right now, there's 10,000 rev that you can go and win. Up to date, through our staking concept and through the rewards that we've allowed people to earn and through the ownership of event segments, we've rewarded our players with over 12 million rev tokens. MotoGP begins as a collectible world where essentially we are build, building the traditional space of cards and enhancing them with what we can do within the digital space. It is also the first steps towards a management game that will leverage assets similar to the cards, but also new assets that allow people to have full customization and play experiences within a management type of gameplay experience. But we're taking what the digital space allows and lets us kind of create cards that are a step beyond what people would have when they hold them physically. So as a quick look, this is essentially what one of our tiers of card looks like. So it steps outside of that 2D centric world and allows us to really leverage what 3D digital spaces can allow us to do. Above all of this or within all of this is Ref Motorsport. Rev Motorsport allows cars, drivers, tracks, and other collectibles such as cards, merchandise, other items, trophies, and videos to become ownable assets. And it pulls 
original content created by ourselves or by others and lines it up alongside licensed motorsport icons. Not only are we creating content, but also players will be able to create content. And all of this content will be able to exist on marketplaces, within game modes, within tournaments curated by ourselves, as well as tournaments and events created and curated by players. The very first NFT airdrop for Rev Motorsport is happening in around a week's time, where essentially, if you are able to play in the F1 Delta Time game mode in the, at the week ending of the 11th, you will be able to have a shot at winning one of the first F1, uh, one of the first Rev Motorsport NFTs. These are Polygon NFTs that will be airdropped to you by following a certain set of rules. If you miss out on this one, there's more to come. To not miss anything in regards to what we do within Rev Motorsport, be sure to follow us across all of our ecosystems and social networks. We have plenty more NFT airdrops to come and plenty of more news as well. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you're excited about what we're building because we're super excited to be building it too. Um, stay tuned for Rev Motorsport and what we're building within that ecosystem as we bring a new variety of motorsport NFTs to you. Keep your eye on the metaverse of the sandbox. Be ready to get hyper casual with the gaming environment. And I hope you're hoping to uh, start your collections as you can take a look at what we're building in Quid as well. We're only just getting started, so be sure to follow us everywhere you can. We've always got something to announce and something to tell you. Thank you, everyone. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sergei Medvedev, uh, I'm the moderator here, and I'm really glad to be here. So um, I'm ex-CBDO at Cointelegraph, I left a month ago, and I've started a uh, new digital label, Metashift, so for, and we are experimenting with NFTs and creative stuff with big, uh, often like music, uh, uh, composers and music creators. So, um, and for me, it's interesting to understand with our remarkable speakers how we uh, could implement NFTs in long-term perspective and do not like only you know, drops uh, on wearable or Mewtwo Gateway, but do something interesting. And let me introduce you our uh, speakers. So, Michael Bramlich from Quid. Uh, Mickey Maher from Day Prolapse and Daniel Crothers from Weavy. Uh, guys, could you introduce yourself, please? Michael, you first. Hi, uh, you bet. I'm the uh, co founder and CEO of Quid. We're an online marketplace to buy and sell digital collectibles and NFTs. We've been around now for about five years and have about 325 uh, brands to collect on the platform. It's great. Thank you. Mickey, your turn. Hi, I'm Mickey Maher, the uh, SVP of Platform Partnerships at Dapper Labs. Uh, I've been here for uh, three plus years. And if you don't know Dapper Labs, we are the essentially creator of NFTs on Ethereum uh, with CryptoKitties. Uh, we've created NBA Top Shot, as well as the first uh, layer one protocol flow, which was designed uh, with uh, NFTs, collectibles, and uh, entertainment ex dApps and experiences in mind from the ground up. This is great. Thank you. Daniel, now you. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Crothers, uh, the COO and co-founder at Vivi. 
Uh, VB started around uh, three years ago. Um, we recently launched into the market um, uh, back in uh, early January. And since then, we have acquired over 300,000 users. Uh, we have 100 plus brands on board at the moment. And the product was really created by collectors for collectors. Um, and it's, for us, what is most important is about creating an immersive experience, an immersive environment that collectors from the from the real world of collecting already know and love and bring this into a digital environment. It's great. Thank you so much. Um, and my first question, uh, I think, will be for all of you, but Daniel, you will be the first uh, because I saw physical collectibles <laughs> like uh, behind you. And uh, so organizers put these questions like this. What is the difference between collectible NFTs and existing collectibles? I disagree. Like NFTs exist as well. So my main question, so what's the difference between collector's experience with NFTs and physical collectibles? What do you think? Sure. Uh, well, I guess from our perspective, um, they are all collectibles, right? And uh, I think the opportunity that NFT has provided is moved the physical world of collecting, which you know is a $300 billion industry every year, and has allowed that to move into the digital space. And uh, I think really, you know, the difference that we've experienced on our side is it makes uh, collecting far more accessible to, to many, many more users. Um, you know, like for example, these bare bricks behind me, very hard to get. You need to know people in certain countries. But the great thing about being digital or, you know, operating from an, from an app or, you know, from a web platform uh, is it makes it far more accessible to users. And I think that the, the experience uh, of the community can be a lot more uh, involved as in users can easy, more easy connect with each other, participate and buy, sell trades and, and so forth. That's great. Miku, what do you think about it? Because um, like NBA top shots, you know, like for people, especially in the US, uh, it's so popular to have like these cards in their kind of childhood. Uh, and what do you think about uh, collector's experience? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times I equate it to my experience of collecting physical sports cards uh, when I was a kid. Uh, the most you could really do is go to the, the card shop, buy some packs of cards, go open it with your two or three friends in their basement and, and trade amongst them, each other and, and show amongst each other. Maybe you would even bring some cards to school to show to 20, 25 people. The digital world allows this to happen across millions, if not tens of millions of users or uh, you know, community members simultaneously. What also enables is tremendous liquidity for those assets as um, not only can you showcase it to those tens of billions of users simultaneously, but you can do and enable permissionless trading of those assets. Uh, so I, I think the permissionless trading uh, in such a wide community and the social and uh, showcasing aspect, such a wide community and it, it can, um, can enable in digital are huge um, benefits of doing it digitally versus uh, physically. And then I would say to even, and maybe I'll expand on this point later, uh, but digital also allows you to bring utility into the mix for the collectibles in a much larger scale and much easier than uh, you could in the physical world. Okay, thank you. Michael, uh, so I heard that Quid is backed by Animoca brands. So what do you think about like additional mechanics of like gamification or something like, uh, because you know, this kind of experience uh, yeah. for collector, okay, you can touch it in like physical world, but uh, in digital world, maybe you could have some additional mechanics. What do you think about it? Yeah, I, I think all those are possibilities. Um, similar to what sort of Mickey said, I actually grew up collecting physical sports cards. And I have a unique vantage point in that after about a decade in a traditional high-tech career, I went to work for Tops, the old American baseball card company, and essentially uh, built a business off of selling pieces of cardboard, right? 
So I have this perspective of uh, not only being a physical card collector, but also sitting on the other side of the curtain and actually being part of a team that issues physical trading cards. So I think the comparison of the two, uh, you know, Mickey nailed it, Dan nailed it. Um, you know, if you have a list of what it means to own something made of cardboard and compare it with owning something that's purely digital, there are some areas where it's clear the digital experience is 10x better than a piece of cardboard or a piece of plastic, right? Mickey talked about liquidity. I think uh, Dan talked about accessibility. Those are entirely true. There are some other aspects, though, where maybe we're not quite there yet as an industry, where you can truly take your physical baseball card anywhere you want. And maybe yet that's the promise of NFTs, but it's yet to be fully realized. Um, but to your question about about the you know the mechanics and 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 the gamification of it, I actually like to think that we are uh, terribly clever. We actually observe what it's like to collect pieces of cardboard or pieces of plastic in the physical world. And if you really analyze what's going on at a card convention or at a place like Comic Con, you actually have pretty nuanced metagames happening, right? You've got you've got status and prestige associated with having the best collection. Well, you can obviously create that in a digital environment, right? You can do things like raffles or repacks. That actually can now be done in a very authenticated way, in a highly liquid, highly efficient way, if it's done digitally. So ultimately, I actually think that digital collecting will evolve. It will match all of the characteristics of physical collecting, physical collecting. but then there will be some attributes where it's so utterly clear that because the form factor is digital, because it's entirely done in a digital context, that it's going to be 10x, if not 100x better. Nobody touched on it, but there are obviously physical limitations to producing things out of cardboard, paper, or plastic. The medium has to be corporal. But in the world of digital collectibles, the medium is anything you can dream up with code, right? So Top Shot is an amazing example of bringing almost like a traditional physical basketball card to life with a full moment, with a full clip. I think we're really only at the early stages of imagining what a digital collectible and NFT can be when you truly get artists and programmers to do innovative things with this entirely new canvas that otherwise couldn't exist in paper or plastic. That's great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mickey, uh, like this maybe question for you. Uh, so how big brands are looking into NFTs? So right now, are they um, kind of preparing a long-term strategy or are they just doing some PR on trendy market? What do you think? I, I would say it, it really depends on the brand uh, and depends on the IP. Um, a lot of them do have pretty formulated long-term strategies and interesting ideas. Um, I would say though, um, they all recognize that they're novices in the space and I'm sure that the other panelists have the similar experiences, but they come to someone like me or someone like Dapper Labs or, or, or uh, Ecomi or, or, or Quid potentially uh, to have us help them with their ideas, help us uh, have us help them with their strategy and how to bring their, their brands to their fans in this medium or this space. So we're doing a lot of educating and helping brands and IPs formulate those strategies. Yeah, that's great. Daniel, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think uh, Mickey really hit the nail on the head in the sense that uh, there are a lot of IP companies that we work with who have a long-term strategy. Um, they, they saw and understood the opportunity in the space um, you know, last year. Um, but uh, since the, this whole NFT boom has happened, uh, obviously many, many licensors want to, you know, get involved in the space. So, um, yeah, I, I think that it is, that there are many, many people who want to get in. Um, there's obviously opportunity for many brands to participate in this space. And that, um, you know, I think the, the best thing to do is to reach out to, you know, companies that are like on the, on the panel right now. Um, and use their advice, use their expertise to, uh, yeah, understand how to how to best tackle their product in this new uh, medium. Okay, that's great, Michael. What about you? What What about your experience with the big brands? Yeah, I think it's case by case to, to what Mickey was mentioning. There are certain some media companies, sports leagues, etc., that that are novices to the space and are looking for a trusted partner to sort of translate the world of NFTs into terms that they can understand. 
There are, however, some media companies that have been studying this for about a decade, in large part because the physical collectibles ecosystem, I think, still leaves a lot to be desired. The physical collectibles, you have to manufacture it, you have to ship it, there's a supply chain, there's raw materials, there's logistics. It's simply not fast enough, right? Uh, there are too many inefficiencies in terms of the production of that, that physical you know, collectible. Uh, additionally, a lot of these media companies have looked at physical collectibles over the years and kind of lamented the fact that a lot of the activity takes place in the aftermarket. So this notion that a licensor or media company can participate in a secondary sale of the collectible actually squares a lot of the problems that these same media companies saw with products made of paper or plastic. I, I think initially, too, those that are innovative at the media companies, they actually see that it's not only an additional actual revenue stream, that there are implications of having that additional revenue stream, which actually can fix the market. You know, one of the problems with collectibles is oversupply. Right? And oversupply exists because licensors and licensees traditionally only make money by issuing more content, right? The ability to go along for the ride with an NFT over the next 10 years or 100 years and participate in those aftermarket sales is a wonderful incentive to fix issues that exist at the primary market. So it's not just this sort of first order implication of, hey, it's a new, new business category or hey, I can finally participate in aftermarket sales if an asset appreciates in volume. It's actually the second order implication, which is, hey, maybe we can actually do better drops as a result if we know this thing can last for 10 years or 100 years. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so, Mickey, uh, question like for you, for example, what do you see like uh, the biggest barrier now for NFT mass adoption? So you work with uh, big brands who are like uh, Dave Labs one, like the first one who created like NFTs and do it messy. But um, what do you see? So the main well, barrier? Yeah, we, we, you know, have built CryptoKitties and we are some of the most experienced DAP or consumer application developers on, on the Ethereum blockchain, maybe even the most experienced. Uh, so we have been thinking uh, of that question for uh, quite a long time. And in part of what, well, part of that question is solving it. And what we set out to do and what we intended to do with Flow is solve some of those uh, problems that existed on Ethereum that would prevent mass adoption or weren't uh, wouldn't necessarily cater to a mass market audience. Those things um, are essentially, um, we think about abstracting the blockchain or the cryptocurrency uh, overall, meaning a user comes in and ha they have easy uh, UX, UI onboarding payments uh, where they don't even have to touch crypto if they don't understand it or they don't want to. The experience looks much like a traditional e-commerce experience or, or app store experience. Uh, so that was a big innovation that that we did, and I think, given that plus you know scalability of our blockchain is really allowing and showcasing um, brands and, and mass market experiences to come in. So I think really the main barrier today would be just time for developers, uh, brands, IPs to experiment on these new platforms uh, that have been built. Uh, to support or cater to uh, those experiences. Okay, that's great. Daniel, for example, what blockchain you use in Vivi? Uh, in uh, Vivi, we've just announced uh, we will be moving to a blockchain called Immutable X. Uh, for the okay. reason being, um, uh, as Mickey mentioned, you know, uh, uh, Immutable is also based on Ethereum. Uh, you know, for us, it was about a few key things. Number one, we needed gasless environment. Uh, number two, uh, it needed to be environmentally friendly, which is a big concern for many licensors these days. Um, and that number three, it needed to be interoperable in the sense that you were able to move your assets around. And, uh, you know, Ethereum, while it does have some, uh, some issues, uh, I really believe, and, you know, the wider team here at Vivi really believes that Ethereum will be the uh, the sort of the number one platform moving moving ahead into the future. Okay, that's great. Michael, what about you? What do you think the main barrier for the mass adoption? That, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, 
you know, ultimately to, I think Mickey's, Mickey's response. Um, I think you have to be there because you love collecting and you love the underlying asset. It's almost an afterthought or an enhancement that, that, uh, not just the ownership record, but the rest of the entire collectible can live on chain and get those benefits of decentralization and eventually true, true digital ownership. So I think um, actually across the panelists and across other companies in this space, there's an emerging sort of hybrid approach where the front door can be incredibly accessible. It can appeal to no coiners. It can appeal to individuals who don't have a crypto wallet, don't hold cryptocurrency, might not even have a credit card. But it's about getting them comfortable with the mechanic of owning these objects in a digital only format. And then from there, I think largely the blockchain becomes an enhancement uh, to that experience. Our metaphor is ultimately that not everything you own on Quid should live on chain. There are plenty of collectibles you have that are fun to store in your digital binder, but might not rise to the value of warranting going through the minting process, right? Or may not rise to the, um, the sort of... Uh, you know, um, the, the connection with the collector that they want to own it for 10 years or 100 years. So in our model, it's really about being collector-led. You can own objects off-chain on Quibid. Those objects that you really love, that you, that you fall in love with, that you want to pass down to your grandkids, and you want to get the benefits of interoperability, et cetera, those are the ones where the collector chooses to which chain they want to mint. Either Ethereum or Harmony, potentially Wax, potentially Flow, ultimately making it the collector that has the agency to, to determine where that collectible should reside long-term. Okay, that's great. And uh, um, now we are preparing a uh, drop, uh, like uh, unreleased song of David Bowie. So, and uh, we saw audience, so it's mostly no coiners. <laughs> so, uh, because now a lot of people buying NFTs and 98%, I think they're like from crypto industry and they hold crypto and it's, it's nice. For them, it's an understandable thing. So, and for us, like, well, how we should do this? Uh, and it's kind of a uh, pretty mm, a mature audience. Uh, they have money, they can buy, but uh, they don't know how. So what do you think about it? You said about no coiners, <laughs> how you solve this problem. Is that, that to me? Yeah, let's continue. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Well, well, look, I don't mean to get too, too sort of technical on it, but obviously it, it depends largely on the scarcity. It depends on the sales format. If this is meant to appeal to a high-end premium market because you're going to issue a one-of-one one of one NFT featuring this unreleased track by, by Bowie, uh, I think a lot of it depends on how you want to uh, sort of architect the drop. If it's going to be extremely scarce, if you're going to sell it perhaps via an auction format, you're probably talking about like a sort of art collector or, or music collector memorabilia uh, type of market. But I think largely with, with more and more drops that happen, with more and more sort of exploration of the high end, the mid tier and the low end, more and more exploration of different scarcity models, different collecting mechanics. I think one of the real... Um, sort of process of these incremental drops is going to be who ultimately wins? Who, who, who owns it? Is it an O-coiner that was brought in? Or is it the crypto whale that has largely been investing in this? And so I think if you can do the former, I think that's a huge sign of success, not only for the drop, but for the broader, the broader industry. Yeah, because for me, it's kind of quite pretty interesting because to create wallet automatically after payment or something like it's, it's kind of, I just, I'm talking about uh, <laughs> hot questions for me, uh, even uh, in our audience, I think they will be interested in this because it's kind of use cases that now it's really important. I see this barrier, like no coiners, they see, it, they see activities like in NFT world and say, okay, how can I participate? Crypto, wallet, Ethereum? Flow, what is flow? Like, okay, how can I do this? Okay, so um, we don't even, create and, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we don't even promote or, or talk about flow or or our cryptos, um, you know, flow or, or any, any of the other cryptos uh, that you can pay with. Uh, they're there to support the core crypto community and you can go and find them if you wanna pay with Ethereum or flow or, or anything else. But we felt like the mass audience of NBA Top Shot and, and these experiences are those fans, uh, passionate fans of the brand that want to come in and collect. So we cater to them, at least in terms of the um, default uh, UI, UX, or the default payments being credit card or fiat, uh, so they never have to see or touch crypto. 
Um, and then we still heavily support the, the whales, which come in uh, through crypto typically, uh, you know, in the community and, and, and purchasing, et cetera. But I think it's a, it, it, they're not mutually, or, or, or you can have both, right? So you can have that uh, top down approach with the mass market of the fans of the brand and that bottom up economy building approach with uh, the crypto folks. And, and I'll just add to that too, because I think, I think Mickey is absolutely right. I, I think that's where each one of us wants to evolve towards is you have an ecosystem of collectors where the, the driver of demand is different, right? If the, if the sole driver of demand is, let's say, speculation or a quick flip, that's going to peter out fairly quickly. But if you have a robust group of buyers generating the demand and each one of those buyers kind of wants it for different reasons, that's where you can ensure long-term, long-term liquidity. So this, this blending of fans who love the IP, this blending of completionists who want to collect and own every item in the set, combined with a, a group of core uh, crypto enthusiasts who obviously see sort of a different form of value in it, that's really where I think the healthiest ecosystems will emerge. That's great, thank you. And Daniel, for example, what do you think about uh, music collectibles? I think they're underestimated because, uh, especially music NFT, there, I mean. So, um, and have you seen interesting use cases or maybe on your platform you like want to integrate these or tell us, yeah, please? Absolutely, I mean, I think <clears throat> um, music is sort of one of the, uh, the, the underrated, uh, you know, NFT opportunities out there at the moment. Um, we get approached by musicians um, all the time, producers, um, and, and, and maybe it's not necessarily just about, uh, you know, dropping a music track. But for example, uh, you know, in our environment, um, you are able to add music to certain things, or maybe you bring out a, like a, a beautiful 3D collectible uh, of, say, Ultraman, and that might have the Ultraman theme music associated with it. Uh, or for example, you know, maybe within the virtual showrooms that we offer, uh, you can have a stereo system in there. And within that, you can have your music sort of offering. So uh, I think it can go beyond, uh, you know, just the music itself, um, it, you know, into sort of a wider experience. And again, at the end of the day, it's about, you know, making sure that the, the, the fan who is collecting that item um, is, is having a, a very immersive and collective experience. I'd say up till now, music hasn't been really that collectible because it's been so ubiquitously available. Um, so I really think it's about, you know, some innovative ways to bring that music in and to offer it in a, a, a you know, in a slightly different format that, that fans may enjoy. It's great. Thank you. And um, yeah, Mickey, maybe you have some thoughts about music NFTs. I do have some thoughts. Um, I think music NFTs, you know, I, th I think the ideas and the best use cases around them are still being formulated. Um, things that I think uh, music NFTs should represent is exclusive social capital of your favorite brands or artists, right? So what do I have that's exclusive to this medium, exclusive to me, uh, that I can brag to my friends that I'm, you know, the biggest fan of this artist, or I was first provenance, right? I was first to I I discover this item or this artist, et cetera. So building up your social capital around your music fandom um, is, is one. And then what do those NFTs then open up in terms of access to those uh, artists? Is it, you know, tickets in the physical world? Is it uh, a um, exclusive YouTube video of that artist thanking you for owning the NFT, which is an NFT in itself? Uh, probably not a YouTube video, but a video nonetheless. Uh, stuff like that. And then I also um, think that there's this interesting revenue cash flows IP ownership model where um, say you're an artist, you're launching your new, your new album. The rights to that album could be fractionized into NFTs and uh, users could buy up pieces of uh, pieces of those rights. And depending on how the album does, they can earn off of those rights. So if I buy one 
300,000th of the new Taylor Swift album, um, I own a piece of that. And however that does revenue wise, wise sales wise, I get a portion of that through my NFT ownership, stuff like that. Okay, thank you so much. And final question, Michael, tell us about what do you think uh, the main challenging um, I don't know, task for whole NFT market right now? Um, uh, wonderful question. I, I would say it is, uh, everyone likes to say mainstream adoption, which then becomes a discussion of accessibility. You know, I think ultimately we all want to generate multiple sources of demand. We want to find different, uh, you know, sociological, psychological, emotional, economic, all these different desires. We want to find ways that an NFT can meet those desires in order to create the biggest tent opportunity, right? Because the biggest tent opportunity, again, will create ecosystems that are healthy and sustainable long-term, and that will ultimately produce the most liquidity for the most diverse set of reasons possible. So I actually think to get to that big tent scenario, I think it's less of a technical challenge about making interacting with the blockchain um, more, more friction-free and more efficient. I actually think it's instead about the demand side of the equation which is not reducing the pain, but making the pleasure once you get through even higher. So it's really about making the average person on the street desperately lust after this, right? To be willing to go through some technical hurdles that will still exist for the foreseeable future. So again, it's all about generating a diverse set of demand to make sure that uh, pretty much every collector's itch can be scratched by the NFT. Thank you so much. We have like a little bit of time. And Daniel, what do you think about the most challenging thing on the market right now? I, I think the most challenging thing is, you know, really to be able to resonate with connectors, uh, collectors, <clears throat> similar to what Michael said, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in, in the sense that it really, you know, at the end of the day, you know, why do collectors love to collect? It's because they love the brand, they love the product, they love the experience. Um, and for us, you know, while it is, it is a big challenge, it actually comes down to something quite simple, and that is creating something that fans absolutely love. Um, and, and, and around that, providing an experience that is, is very similar to what they already know and love uh, in the physical world of collecting. So the transition is not too difficult. Um, and as the other panelists have also touched on, you know, it's, it's about making it completely accessible. So I just think accessibility experience uh you know and, and and also potential upside and potential liquidity although that's you know collectors collect for a whole range of reasons you have some who want money others who just absolutely love the brand or character so really i think it's about creating the experience that that fans uh love thank you so much guys we just made it It was an amazing session with you. I'm really great to be here. And thank you, Mai. Thank you, Minoru, for having us here. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. And uh, this is Suji and from uh, Mass Network. I'm CEO and co-founder of Mass Network. And the team is called Dimension. Uh, we've been focused on change the web for the past four years. And more specifically, we're trying to bring more people from the traditional web 2.0, which is like platform like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, to a new, better open internet. That includes some blockchain technology, peer-to-peer -peer technology like, like um, Ethereum, and also include NFT. So that's why I'm here today. And I want to share you uh, our story about the bring more people to the new internet and also how it related with the non fungible token NFT and how it related with Tokyo as well. Okay, I'll share my screen. <clears throat> So let's start from the idea of change the web. We, we basically heard of the, we all know the terminology Web 3.0. It, it might be around for more than five years, uh, originally from uh, Sir Tim Russ Lee and then adopted by the Ethereum and many other blockchain about the concept, a uh, better new open web. So what is the, the, the better new open web mean? 
uh, it means that in this new open internet, you can uh, do a lot of things uh, you cannot do in the old internet. For example, it's an open one, so you can send information freely uh, in a privacy way. Uh, you can send money freely in a, in a in also uh, in a also very open way. There's no middleman. There's no government trying to stop it. That's how Bitcoin and Ethereum work. And later on, you can do other things on top of it, right? You can send over um, contracts, like smart contracts. And later on, you can say, ah, I want to send a special thing that become an um, NFT. But the problem is, the problem since we joined this industry around 2006, 2017, we noticed the problem and it never solved. Problem is, how can we do this uh, on the old internet? So this is the, the what is the mass network about? So assume, uh, which is true that today, most of the user are still on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on those major platforms. They heard of the um, Web 3.0, they heard of the NFT, but the problem is uh, maybe my friend, Mr. Bitcoin, my, how can you send me my favorite NBA card, NBA NFT card? You have no idea and you cannot send it because the NFT itself, the Web 3.0 element itself is decentralized. However, the platform is uh, we're gathering are centralized. There's a gate that try to, um, it's really hard to um, connect to, to work. So we figure out this problem and we think, okay, we should do something to connect it to work. It's like in the United States, you have the Nest Navigator browser that allow people to use the open internet at that time in the Windows uh, machine. Today, the mass network trying to do is, hey, you use whatever you want in Twitter and Facebook. So we, uh, in order to do that, we become a standard member of the ECMA TC39, which is a standard committee that uh, include a lot of great uh, people in the blockchain world, such as MetaMask and Coinbase, uh, and also a lot of giants from the traditional internet industry, including Sony, uh, Alibaba, uh, there's around 35 to 40 uh, members. We're one of the members have the power to say one set new standard and uh, uh, push the limit of the web. We want to push the limit of web to make it more open. That's why we joined the ECMA. And then here comes to the NFT. Before that, I actually want to show you guys how the product really works for one minute. It's going to be amazing. So uh, assume um assume i'm on twitter right i'm on twitter and assume uh my want to send me some cryptocurrency well first cryptocurrency and super hard to do that why because as i say this is centralized and the blockchain new web is decentralized There's no way to connect but if you install the mass network the plugin on the browser extension uh, there's also a mobile version. Once you install that, you are connected to work together. How? Uh, one example will be, I can send a special welcome message to the non-fungible Tokyo. I can say, hey, hi, uh, non-fungible Tokyo. Um, and feel free to decrypt my message because uh, if you install the mask, you can able to see that on my Twitter. And this is a special message for you guys. Um, and it will be encrypted into something uh, only my friends or my recipient can see that. So this is an example. Um, after I send this out, it will be automatically decrypted into the message I sent, like here. Um, hi, non fungible Tokyo, right? It's decrypting itself. Yeah, hi, non fungible Tokyo. Later on, you can see that. And my y'all can, for example, my and other people like, for example, Vitalik can also send me money. So here's an example. Uh, I send over some money, a red pocket for the Lunar New Year. And uh, Vitalik Putin also send over some red pocket uh, on Twitter. That's amazing, right? You can just send on Twitter. So if you can send that, we can also send NFT because NFT is just another 
form of token, right? So I can just say, okay, um, this is a tweet and someone is talking about a link, um, an NFT about, uh, this is cool, I don't know what it is, maybe a game, really cool. And the mask able to render what's happening in the blockchain on the traditional internet platform like Twitter and Facebook. And I can see, oh, this is a cool uh, real-time engine character NFT. I can make an offer. I can say I will choose my best token, Ethereum, DAI, or depends on your jurisdiction. You can even use your debit card or credit card to buy it. So that's something we able to achieve. And the first I was seeing we did, uh, as I said, uh, is more not about only about uh, um, you know selling NFT. It's actually about creating impact. Let people in the traditional world know that okay, you can do a lot of things about NFT, uh, and that's going to be available on the traditional uh, uh, platform. Everyone can able to access it. So <clears throat> the this is one example we achieved. We partner with Rallyball and OpenSea. And in the Earth Day, which is the uh, uh, April 22, uh, we partner with the uh, Chinese Green Development Foundation and many other NGO to auction this Ilia Pika uh, animal NFT. So Ilia Pika is a very you know, cute animal. It's the uh, original uh, animal of Pikachu. So Pikachu is from this animal. It's an it's an endangered animal, uh, a species of mammal. Uh, in the real world, it's it's uh, it's endangered and it needs a lot of help from different NGO and the the massive uh, um, general public. It needs attention. So we we say, hey, let's sell NFT. And this NFT is on Twitter. And once you sell it. We can able to uh, uh, we were able to donate all the money to the NGOs and that's really cute uh, Pika and in Twitter on Twitter it's actually have a GIF you can see it like moving it's really cool uh, then there's many other animal like uh, the the black face phone bill uh, it's also being auctioned and uh, uh, this is called uh, I don't know how to pronounce Gazi. Well, um, it's also endangered animals. They are all very cute. The the Chinese Great Foundation and the WWF and there's many other NGOs we are partnering with are trying to use that to solve the problem, not only for um, for uh, monetization IP, but it's also going to help a lot on um, monetization IPs, especially those ones are not really be viewed as uh, uh, valuable assets. How, uh, for example, do you think a tweet is an asset? I, I do think so. Like, like uh, I'm, I, I do have a lot of fans, and I believe a lot of audience, a lot of other speakers have more fans on Twitter uh, than me. And the problem is, the tweets are controlled and stored on the Twitter server, and seems like there's no way to make a centralized thing become an NFT and monetize it. Uh, but through the mass network, you can do that. So in that case, we partner with a company called uh, Valuable, uh, Valuable, and uh, their product is called Scent. So Jack Dossie, he he was the founder. He's still the CEO of Twitter. He, he's the founder and CEO of Twitter and Square. He's super supportive of the crypto industry. He sell his first NFT, his tweet as an NFT for $2.9 million through the Valuable Send platform. And we partner with the Valuable Send platform, integrate the Send platform. So when you browse on Twitter, uh, when you see Miss Bitcoin's tweet, you can say, hey, I think this is uh, uh, something very unique. I want to buy that tweet. So you can make an offer. Uh, and people make $2.9 million offer to judge off these tweets. Because it's unique. It's the first ever tweet treated by Twitter founder. They have historical meaning. And this money is all goes to the charity in Africa. And this is his first tweet, just sitting at my tweet. <laughs> and um, uh, Mass Network is also a strategic investor, uh, shareholder of the Sent team. 
Uh, but more importantly, we are trying to do partnership. We try to say, hey, um, what if you can do all these amazing things on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram? So people don't need to learn all these uh, fancy, you know, geeky terminology. No need to code. No need to learn what is the CRM. You can just buy your favorite tweet on Twitter. Maybe later on on Instagram. Maybe your best IP. Uh, I know Japan actually are famous for its, you know, um, anime IP and, and there's many other IP related with the creative culture in Japan. And most of them are most of the creators on Twitter. So what if they can all become an NFT creator? I'll be huge. And uh, we want to be a decentralized middle world that achieve people to uh, help people and empower people to achieve that. And uh, for now, we don't charge anything. And we believe that it's like in long term, in order to do that, we also try to become decentralized. We don't have any patent. We don't patent anything or things we do. Uh, the mass network is open source. We are a standard and donate standard to these great foundation like ECMA for setting up the new web standard. The, the ultimate, the ultimate, um, the ultimate ideology behind this, uh, this, uh, these attempts, um, you know, with the endorsement of the CMA, with people like MakerDAO, Uniswap, Vitalik Dream, as we all share the same ideology, we all share the same vision that we should view the platforms as an infrastructure, as infra. And infra means that you uh, still have a lot of power, probably still become somehow monopolized, uh, you still control a lot of things. But you're a public infrastructure, so you cannot do too much evil thing. Today, Facebook, Twitter, Facebook is bad. Twitter is a little bit better. It's a large factory of our digital content. When we upload something to them, they actually will earn money. They, they take a cut from the advertisement or many other way to monetize it. Um, if it, we view it as a huge factory, you know, why can't we do something within it, right? Because it's a factory. We, the digital laborers, we, the creator, can connect each other. We should become something uh, united inside this digital factory. And we view the platform as infra, and we create some content and become NFT and monetize using the way we feel comfortable. We feel being controlled. We are in control, not the platform in control. So that's the ideology behind all these achievements and all these endorsements. It's not about just you know investment, just about partnership. It's more about a movement, try to bring more people in the web too, especially the creators, especially those people who are creating the web and, and give them the ownership back. So that's the, um, the thing about the mass network. We believe in the web 3.0, in the future web, we can have huge union within the huge platform, huge factory. This union is about the creators. It's about the content owner. It's about the who generate idea and value in the internet. And it will be uh, endorsed and be supported by technology like NFT and many other technology related with the blockchain. So um, that's that's my speech today. And if you are interested, please check out Mass.io. Uh, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can also follow us on Telegram, search Mass.io. Mass Network, you can able to join our Taiwan group. Um, we're also setting up our Tokyo office. So besides North American, um, Tokyo is actually uh, the first and very important, you know, I'd say very important place for those those content creators for the new internet. A lot of things will happen here. So thanks for inviting me for the non fungible Tokyo. Thank you.
Okay, hi everyone, and nice to be in the conference. I'm Alyssa Tsai. I'm the founder and CEO of Pannoni, and we are an invest, investment firm and incubator and media company based out of Greater China and South Korea. And I'm pleased to be moderating this panel about an NFT investment and ourselves have been an active investor since early and investing a lot of NFT, NFT projects already like Eternity, Opulus and High Street, Hozoi and Korak among many others. So I think we have a, a lot of like experience and a lot of knowledge across this panel to share to everyone and NFT is quite a hot topic right now. So I hope that everyone can enjoy this panel. And so for now, I will just rotate uh, everyone for a quick introduction and especially uh, mention uh, when did you make your first NFT investment and how many NFT projects have you invested in by far. So I think that's quite crucial for this panel. Um, we will start from uh, Ray. Okay, hi, uh, this is Ray. Uh... I'm the uh, general partner of Boom Crypto Capital, a venture capital fund investing in blockchain cryptos. I'm also the vice president of uh, Gumi uh, Inc. It's a public mobile gaming company in Japan. Um, so, uh, you know, from the fund, we already invested in several uh, NFT related projects, including OpenSea, that marketplace, including uh, Yield Guild Games, that's a uh, NFT uh, match, a DeFi, concept projects. We also invest in Curio recently. That's a, a NFT insurance uh, and marketplace project. So uh, we do have a lot of experiences in this area. Um, so OpenSea is the first project we invested. Uh, that was the early 2019, uh, you know, when the market is still very small. But we do have a thesis and vision that NFT is going to be very huge uh, and a marketplace will be the fundamental feature and, and uh, part of this market, so we make that investment. That's cool. it. And Ethan, yeah. Yep. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Ethan. Uh, I'm one of the co-founder and partner at Hashed. Uh, Hashed is venture capital based in Seoul and San Francisco, uh, investing in the companies and projects related to blockchain, decentralization, and protocol economy. Uh, before co-founding Hashed, I used to work as a software engineer for the past 10 years in startups, uh, including online gaming, uh, advertisement technology, and mobile messenger companies. So uh, thanks to my background of software engineering, uh, I got interested in Bitcoin and blockchain technology in early days. And uh, in 2016, uh, I started investing in crypto, including Bitcoin and Ethereum. And about the NFT projects, uh, I was luckily able to invest in several NFT projects in 2017 and 2018. Uh, during that time, uh, I invested in Decentraland, Xe Infinity, uh, The Sandbox, Wax Protocol, and uh, Mythical Games uh, with the current co-founders of Hashed. And at that time, uh, most of NFT projects were related to games and metaverse rather than artworks, uh, which are current main trend in NFT spaces. Uh, also, we usually invested in uh, the project's token itself uh, or equity rather than NFTs itself they issued. So by far, uh, we also have invested in uh, almost 11 NFT projects related uh, and uh, including Recur, uh, Affinity from Engine, uh, Terra Virtua, and uh, NFT Bank, and etc. Yeah, that's it. Cool, that's quite a lot. <laughs> And Steve? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, this is Steve. Uh, I work for Block Tower Capital. Uh, I joined the Block Tower Capital three years ago. Before that, I worked for Goldman Sachs for eight years in Singapore and Tokyo as portfolio managers. In terms of NFT space, we have been active since 2018. And just to name a few uh, for the investment we made this year, um, the Affinity uh, is the one, uh, and then X Infinity is another one. Showcase is another one, and uh, Super Rare uh, a platform is another one. And before that, we have made a few investment in U.S. and South Korea and other different part of the Asia's. Thanks, Steve and 
again. Uh, I think Animoca do the most. <laughs> I mean, a lot of like gaming and NFT stuff on Animoca. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gen Kanai, and I support business development at Animoca Brands. We're a Hong Kong-based uh, games developer, but we also do a lot of investment. Um, we've been investing in the NFT uh, blockchain area since uh, CryptoKitties, and we were um, our first investment was our first partnership was the Asian. Um, rights, the license to resell uh, CryptoKitties in Asia. Since then, we've done uh, dozens, probably 30 plus investments. Uh, we acquired the team that is building Sandbox, uh, Wax, uh, a pretty significant investor in Dapper, uh, Harmony, uh, you know, Bitsky, Axie Infinity, OpenSea. Uh, we're partnered with Binance, partnered with Polygon, um, we've launched multiple uh, tokens uh, to support our various uh, projects. So we're very, very active uh, in all, all areas of uh, you know, blockchain and NFT. Cool, thanks. And I think the next question will be a follow-up follow question. So meanwhile, you guys are investor into uh, projects. Are you also like collecting uh, some of the crypto art, like NFT collectibles? There because uh, there's quite like two different things, but also like correlated with each other. So I, I think that'll be interesting for our audiences as well. And if you collect, like what kind of uh, NFT do you collect? And if not, like why not? I guess we'll still start from uh, Ray. Uh, yeah, I'm not a collector at all. I, I don't collect anything. Probably it's just a, a by nature, uh, by nature, I'm not that type of person. Uh, uh, so, which is why when I make investment in this NFT area, I only invest in the tools, platforms that facilitate this market to grow in as a whole, uh, right? So, like OpenSea is the marketplace, uh, WGG is the uh, a play protocol that enable the a much broader use, you know, usability of the NFT assets, uh, and Curio is the uh, insurance platforms that connecting the massive. Uh, users, uh, IP holders into this uh, this in industry. So this our investment still from the business point of view rather than from the single assets point of view. Mm -hmm. How about Ethan? Uh, Do you yeah. guys collect? Personally, uh, I'm a collector, but I'm not very active collector. So, I see. Uh, what, what do you collect? Yeah, I, I just own one piece of foundation artwork. Ethercard, uh -huh. uh, Sandbox Estate, and uh, League of Kingdoms Lands. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, I purchased Sandbox Land and uh, League of Kingdoms Island, uh, League of Kingdoms Lands at the very first pre-sale period because I personally wanted to help the project which we invested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I wanted to collect NFTs very actively, I think I should be more diligent to search variety of NFTs, uh, which has big potential to be sold higher price. So it more, right now it's more like interest over like uh, selling at a high price. Right, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm not that type of person. So also uh, I think uh, I need refined and decent taste and view to artwork, but uh, I don't have any. So, uh, but the reason that I invested in Sandbox land is that uh, the price of land can be combined with the contents uh, which can be developed on it. So I think uh, the price of virtual land is highly related to its size and uh, what contents will be onboarded. So uh, right now I contacted several content developers and looking for the opportunities for co-working to add more value to my lands. Oh, cool. That's very interesting. And how, how about Steve? Um, so as a firm perspective, we do not own an NFT collectible, uh, like Rui and Ethan said, I don't think that's, um, uh, for, for the, our investment mandate wise, I, I don't think it's the right, um, we don't think that we can make a good, uh, make a good investment in a particular NFT collectible. However, the personal side, I do own a lot of uh, NFT. So the reason being uh, in three folds. One is I'm uh, originally an art collector. I, I love arts. 
So uh, I want to support artists. Also, I like some arts truly. And then I really care about philosophy the artist has. So if I like philosophy artists and if I are art, I, I just try to buy a few things. But again, this I know that is risky. I'm, I'm not expecting huge markup on, on, on the purchase, but I just want to get involved in some of the platform I support, like super rare and such. So that's what I got involved. And then I do own some sort of like Abe Gochi, so which also we, uh, we invested in. And um, I, 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 I don't know, I'm 38. I grew up with the Tamagotchi and all other things. So I just uh, feel like I want to own it, even though it might end up with worth um, close to zero, but I still love it. I, I, I want to look at it. I want to, I want to give uh, some activities with the collectibles. So I, I, I purchased some of them and they involve in community how this NFT collectible combined with the DeFi, uh, DeFi landscape, which is quite interesting. So I think most of my uh, personal NFT investment is mainly from my uh, support for the, uh, the NFT project we invest and also sort of just curiosity of how this NFT collectible integrate with the other platforms. Thanks, and Ken? Um, as a firm, Animoca is very focused on collectibles, uh, so much so that we acquired a company called Quid, Q-U-I-D-D, that is a, a leading uh, collectibles app uh, on the app stores. And so they have brands like Marvel and Disney and Sanrio and Game of Thrones and, uh, you know, a lot of those brand names uh, as a collectibles app. Most of those are not yet NFTs, but we're working with those brands and trying to bring those brands uh, to blockchain uh, through that um, Quid app. Uh, so I have, a, I have a bunch of collectibles on uh, the Quid app uh, myself. I like collecting uh, some of the old TV shows that I used to watch when I was a child. And I also like collecting a Hello Kitty uh, in the Quid app. Cool, cool, thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, so I think uh, rolling back to the uh, investment portfolio. So uh, what kind of metrics do you guys look into? Because you all invest in, in a lot. So did, did your metrics pivot over the time or what has been your metrics when you're doing an investment in NFT projects? So I, I guess we'll still suck from right in the order. <laughs> Okay, so um, as I said, uh, when we make investment, we, we, we don't invest in a specific NFT assets rather than uh, from the business point of view, whether that business will support the whole ecosystem grow. So, uh, you know, I think what several key, key metrics that I'm looking at is first is the usability. I think a purely speculative um, NFT assets market will not sustain. And also the collectors, uh, as you know, just now Ethan, Jen, you know Steve and and Jen, Jen uh, mentioned, you know there's still a small group of people who uh, like collecting. And if you separate it into different genres of the assets, they're gonna be further limited. So I think increase the usability of NFTs. Uh, for example, uh, the you know you enable uh, NFT assets to be landed and use it in the game. To, ex to enjoy the gaming ex uh, experience, uh, that those NFTs become a specific, uh, you know, item specific thing for you to achieve another target. Then the kind of usability is uh, one of the exciting things I'm looking at when, when I'm choosing uh, projects. And uh, the, the second thing is the uh, user experience, you know, uh, how the normal users can be involved in this market with less difficulty um, and can enjoy the whole experience rather than just uh, expecting a speculative value up. So that the, uh, the user experience is another thing that I'm gonna look at um, uh, pretty, you know, as the core. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll stop there and let others just share their Thanks. opinion. And in Ethan? Yeah, uh, when I look at the uh, NFT investment opportunities, uh, I consider expandability of NFT itself. Uh, as uh, Ray mentioned, I think about the usability. So in other words, I consider potential usage of NFT. 
So for example, uh, the estate of Sandbox I invested in has potential to be the landmark depending on the contents integrated with. And I think uh, metaverse related NFT has huge potential for people to show their creativity by implementing their own contents on it. Also, uh, even though it is not related to uh, metaverse directly, uh, like artwork, I still imagine uh, if the concept or the content of it can be integrated in the variety of applications and platforms. So, uh, for example, uh, personally, I, I like EtherCars platform and uh, EtherCars will provide tools for gam gamifying uh, my NFTs. And uh, I will be able to mint new tokens with the special traits and host unique events directly on the EtherCars platform. So uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I believe there will be more and more platforms and applications which let us use our NFTs in their services and uh, it will bring a big bang to the contents related business. Thanks, maybe I'll, I'll rotate it again first since I, since I <laughs> talked a lot about Sandbox. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I think so. Uh, being a game developer, we invest in game studios. Uh, and in general there, we try and find um, studios that are profitable, but that need more investment uh, to do their next big project, uh, ideally a blockchain game. So in general, that's kind of our focus there. Uh, obviously, we, we acquired Sandbox and um, Hash came in as, a, as an investor on that. So uh, that's been a great partnership and growth there has been tremendous. Um, otherwise, we do a lot of investments uh, in the areas that I think everybody um, has already spoken. So we've invested in exchanges like OpenSea and Wax. Uh, we've invested in Bitsky, like uh, wallet um, applications. Anything that uh, is relevant to or required for uh, successful blockchain gaming, we want to uh, partner with lots of different chains. We don't know which chains are going to be uh, popular. I mean, we, we, we sort of are seeing some trends, uh, clearly. Uh, and I think we've been very happy with our investment in uh, Dapper uh, for that reason. So again, just different technologies that support uh, our thesis of blockchain gaming. Um, oh, and Steve. Um, I think everyone uh, made out good points, but uh, let me share uh, that in maybe four points. So when I look at the NFT investment, maybe one of these or multiple of these are actually capture uh, um, impact my decision. So first I would say stickiness. So whether this NFT project can create the stickiness or not is very important. I think um, so stickiness means that whether users want to come back to the platform or NFT service they want to use. So super rare, basically, um, there are a lot of uh, similar projects, uh, platforms out there. But when you th uh, thought about the arts, uh, I, I put more weight on our collection is a little still should have a premium kind of uh, sort of high quality kind of activities like a traditional. So super rare did a great job to making a reputation around it as people who want to buy, buy sort of quality arts, I think still a lot of people are going to super rare. So that kind of stickiness is very important for, for my decision. Second is the community. So for example, Abe Gochi or YGG, they are basically community driven. Uh, even though product might, might look uh, crumbsy and then still the growth potential might be weak, but in crypto, the community is so important and the community is the one that makes something that impossible possible. So we are betting on some project has huge community growth potential, which are those two. And third out of four is basically a, a distribution channel. So we invested in one uh, called the Super Tree out of South Korea. One of the biggest reasons that I, we invested in that is they have a huge uh, distribution channel through the Kakao or Line or many kind of uh, major retail kind of distribution channel. I think unless retail people get to use it, I think it's meaningless that we just talked about crypto potential. And lastly, I would say the team. I rather want to invest it in the project whose founding team has a direct experience in what they are doing. 
if someone is a sports uh, soccer player is trying to build up our collection platform, I would say no. But uh, if someone who did a lot of marketing experience, had a lot of fashion industry or how to build a community, then I will make a bet on their project who is basically uh, doing NFT Instagram, for example, that which is showcase we invested in. So I really care that direct invest, a direct experience of the team for that particular project, which because they know how to build the crypto into that uh, the business sector they are targeting. Cool, thanks. I, I think I also agree with the especially the community part. I think Navo mentioned like community. It's really a lot about like whether people will like want to invest or to buy like a. Uh, you need to swap uh, the, the, the NFT drop for it. It's also very phenomenal. And like MBA Top Shop is also have a lot of like collector because it has a quite a big existing communities already. And um, but like uh, the follow up question would be uh, something we haven't mentioned, but it also like kind of affect uh, what we talk about in your collecting uh, experience. Is that an NFT illiquidity issue? So, so right now it's a very often seen as a limitation of the NFT uh, collectibles. Like people think uh, there's no liquidity if you purchase it. So do you think it's a like obstacle uh, right now or do you think there could be a breakthrough about this li liquidity issues? So, uh, so, so Ray, uh, we'll start <laughs> on you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think you know, this NFT liquidity is a problem fundamentally it won't be able to solve because uh, that's what an NFT should be. There's a limited supply. When you only have a limited, let's say a hundred or a thousand of the, that supply, how you increase the, the, the liquidity. Um, uh, so, um, but there's several things that you can work on. It, based on, I think it's two angles. One is what's the purpose of having this NFTs? If it, the purpose is for trading uh, you know, for making speculative returns, yes, uh, liquidity is a challenge for you. But if the NFT is, is a collector, as what Steve just mentioned, if you are a collector, the purpose for you to, is to hold it, then the liquidity is not a problem for you. Second is, if the NFT has specific usability and the purpose of holding that NFT is use it, for example, in a specific game, you only be able to play the game if you have the assets in your hands, then what's the problem with the, with the liquidity? So from that point of view, the liquidity is not a problem. And if you're really want to betting on the, the NFT uh, market and you want to have the trading experiences, there are several uh, you know, metrics that can work around it. One is building the index of it. Um, you can say you know the sports NFT index. It can be a, a financial products uh, connected to the underlying NFT assets values, but it's a it's a finished product and the transaction volume can be created on top of that. It's kind of a derivative. So that's one thing you can do. Um, and I believe there's right now have you know a DeFi project trying to utilize trying to uh, you know accept NFT assets and collaterals. So still it's a uh, going into a different area uh, rather than the original purpose of the NFT creation. Um, it, so that there's some other features that uh, functions that you can solve the liquidity problem for for those purposes. So still, so, uh, for, that, that's what I'm thinking. Go ahead. Steve. So I don't I, no. So I was gonna say the liquidity is problem for speculators, but is opportunity <laughs> for the crypto. Basically, that's it. I think a lot of crypto crypto projects are trying to build a something that with the NFT, you can borrow money or you can use the NFT as a collateral to issue something and then you can make even real assets NFT. So I think the liquidity is actually the opportunity that we can take with the NFT in crypto space, but it's going to be a huge problem for those who just you know buy the NFT just to sell it within a week, just to, to hopping on the bubble. So I think for true crypto people, I think liquidity is opportunity in NFT space that you can play around it. That's, that's, that's my to, opinion. Good to know. And and how about Ethan? Uh, what's your opinion? Yeah, uh, I think lack of liquidity itself is NFT's characteristic. Uh, when we think about art market, uh, most of the artworks do not have much demand from the public. 
and only limited artworks have much high demand from uh, the users and public uh, because each NFTs and artworks are uh, different from each other. Uh, we can think every NFT or artwork has just one supply and uh, prices heavily dependent on its demand. Uh, when, when this speculative market is gone, uh, there will be uh, many NFTs which do not have any demand. Uh, even after fractionalized NFT tokens or NFT ETF basket concept is widely accepted, uh, most of the NFT artworks uh, will not gain much attention from the perspective of uh, public demand. So only limited popular uh, NFTs will gain traction from the public and uh, fractionalization will help to increase the supply of the specific NFT and lower the barrier to own it. So fundamentally, I believe providing many use cases with NFTs uh, you own in digital world will increase NFT market growth a lot. And at that time, uh, there will also be speculative point in F NF NFTs, uh, but it will be more acceptable to the public uh, when it is widely used in different applications and services. Mm -hmm. And so for again, I think everyone has made really good points. Uh, the only thing I would really add is that as a game developer, you know, we're clearly using our games as the, um, you know, reason to purchase an NFT. Uh, so you can collect it if you want, but we also offer the games where you can win, lose, uh, you know, even uh, make money uh, or, you know, make the token uh, for the game uh, or lose token for the game. Uh, and so we're providing that utility uh, via our games uh, to provide a greater incentive uh, to participate. So. Thanks, and this will be my last question, but also the big one. Uh, that where do you uh, how how do you think like we can do like a collectively as like investors or like people in this industry to bring like NFT into mass adoption or into more mainstream? I know we are all working on it, but like what what kind of steps can we take from now? to make it like more mature. And also uh, you guys all know like the crypto market is very volatile. And do you, do you think like the NFT market is actually correlated with like how crypto, uh, like how crypto market is? Like if the market is bearish or bullish, will it affect the NFT collectibles? Uh, I'd like to hear about your opinion into like the mass adoption and the correlation with the, the whole crypto market. And so Ray, so this is our last question. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, in a, from a long, long run point of view, uh, the NFTs should be you know, separated with the you know, crypto market in general. I think NFTs, right now, people when think about NFTs, more think of it as a token, uh, a crypto assets. Rather, I think NFT is a kind of a mechanism that you can uh, digitize some of the assets that you already have in the in, even in the physical world, right? So, for example, uh, because of the nature of the NFTs, uh, the create for the creators putting a you know digital creative art you know assets into this format will make them much easier to trace the distribution, uh, having more the rights control process. Uh, for them, if you understand the the music in, industry, for every piece of music product, there's uh, several players, right? There are some musicians, composers, uh, uh, label uh, companies, distributors, and every piece of this party, is, uh, every party is in in this ecosystem will take a piece out of this uh, um, uh, th this this piece of uh, uh, creative creative arts uh, works. So NFTs will basically enable them to track every every transactions, every distribution activities when uh, when they occurs, and the distribution become automatically uh, the original creators can have more benefit from the secondary third uh, you know uh, layer market. So those additional benefit can actually benefit the real world use cases. Uh, I think from now on, I would say. Um, connecting NFTs to the real world, to the real uh, physical assets are uh, the, the trend I would expect to, to see. Um, yeah. Thanks. And Ethan? Yep. 
fundamentally uh, to enter the mainstream, uh, I think NFTs should be embraced by regulations and policy in the short term. Uh, this is related to taxation issue and uh, should be admitted by the government to provide safety net to the investors who are willing to own the NFTs. Uh, also, lowering the barrier to own NFTs is needed to be widely investable. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, fractionalization of the NFTs or ETF basket type, uh, that type of financial product can help to own the NFTs. And in the long term, uh, as I already mentioned before, uh, more use cases are needed. And uh, the second question was correlation between crypto and NFT market. Uh, yeah. Correct. Right. So, uh, because most of the current NFT projects are built on top of Ethereum base, uh, the price unit of NFTs is ETH in many cases. So, I would say current cor correlation between uh, crypto and NFT are very, very strong. And uh, recently, we are going through abundant liquidity in capital market, we, which we never experienced before. So uh, that is impacting the crypto market and also crypto market is impacting the NFT markets as well. So uh, current NFT prices are highly dependent on uh, crypto NFT whales, not by the uh, m many number of uh, retail investors. Uh, I think there can be more corrections like a recent plunge uh, in NFT spaces, but in general, uh, as NBA Top Shot showed us uh, that Users are blockchain or crypto agnostic when they use the services. So if NFTs are integrating applications and showing more use cases, I think decoupling between crypto and NFT will happen eventually. Thanks. And Steve? Yeah, uh, just two questions. So for mainstream part, I think uh, we need to see we like to see that um, the NFT is uh, implemented or uh, integrated with the mainstream distributor. Um, so in, in, in Tokyo, as I would say the line or SoftBank or those kind of the, 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 the party that has massive distribution channel, if they integrate some sort of the NFT, that will be the kind of um, the huge trigger for the mainstream adoption. And policy that Ethan mentioned, luckily, I think Japan is the most progressive uh, in that NFT uh, regulation part. I think uh, I remember Japan, uh, the government already uh, announced to embrace NFT as one of kind of uh, in, in regulated asset or something like that, or even like uh, at least gives a lot of uh, freedom for the people to develop NFT in Jap the Japanese market, but agree that we need a more clear around regulation. Uh, second question, I agree with the Ethan, it's highly correlated with the uh, crypto market in general, uh, because still it's NFTs going through the speculative uh, the stage. Uh, but that said, I think NFT is uh, one of kind of real use cases to prove them by blockchain as a digital ownership concept. So I think DeFi and NFT and payments are the so far the, the strongest kind of a narrative for the crypto adoption. I don't think it's going to go away. So as we see more real use cases, as, as Rui mentioned, if we can uh, make the NFTs more integrate with the physical asset or real asset, I think that will grab more attention from people uh, to see the NFTs the real potential rather than speculated bad asset. Thanks. And yeah, that's lastly, uh, but just like, Jen, from your, from your side. From our side, in terms of bringing um, NFTs mainstream, our focus has been uh, licensing and partnering with major brands uh, that are globally popular. So uh, obviously Formula One, you know, we have a, a big focus on motorsports. So we've partnered with Formula One and MotoGP and uh, a number of those uh, top global racing um, series. Uh, but then again, you know, on our... Uh, with our quid business, we've partnered with Disney and uh, Marvel and those types of brands as well. So I would say for us, it's uh, we're focusing on finding the best brands and trying to work with the best brands and being those brands that uh, people around the world love to blockchain and blockchain games. Um, and then uh, regarding the correlation between NFTs and crypto, I think everybody has 
um, said very um, cogent um, things there. I don't really have that much to add. Cool, cool. Yeah, thanks everyone. I, I think like this session is very informative even to like one another, like to each of us here. So uh, I, I'm a coder here, but just also want to give everyone like just some last few seconds if you, anyone wants to say anything to our audiences. Okay, no, I uh, guess. I'll just, oh, okay. Uh, no, I was just, I just uh, moderated the session yesterday with the immutable and then uh, the flow guys and the uh, engine. So I want to say that uh, a lot of the uh, new retail people who's getting into the space and uh, of course they are fascinated with the NFT bubble. Uh, one thing I want to say is I, I personally believe that NFT is not a, uh, might be bubble right now, but I don't think it's just one time thing. So please, uh, those, those who just got into crypto and then they see that, oh, NFT is in a bubble or something, please uh, stay a little bit and to see that other thing that all the smart people are building a uh, fascinate uh, stuff around NFT. You'll be fascinated. Uh, so I just want to say, uh, please uh, watch the NFT space more uh, longer term perspective before giving up. Yeah, and Ray, do you want to say anything? Yes, and oh, thanks uh, for the yeah. confidence boost. <laughs> yeah, I would just say, you know, uh, I, I, I think uh, the same as the other investors. So we, uh, as the venture investor, we want to support the really uh, good entrepreneurs to achieve their visions. So uh, I agree with Steve, NFT has a lot of potentials, and not just uh, from the current the narrow uh, market point of view, but rather much broader opportunity. So for the good entrepreneurs, good projects, if you have a good you know, thoughts, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, happy to talk and, and you know, Yeah, there's all like fast funds here. So if anyone is interested in have a good project to pitch, I guess like it's not hard to find us. So mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. I, I guess that's, that's all. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for your time for this channel. Like thanks all of panelists and all the audiences. I guess we will make a close here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Crothers. I am the co-founder at Vivi. And Vivi is a product that brings the physical world of collecting that fans know and love uh, into the digital space. And uh, it is something that we refer to as collecting 2.0 because we really believe this, uh, this new NFT industry um, will become a huge part of um, <clears throat> the, uh, the collectible future. Um, so uh, as I just mentioned, you know, the collectible industry is changing. Um, many, many users out there now um, already buy virtual goods and virtual assets. Uh, and this is a, an industry that is uh, expected to reach $155 billion by the end of 2025. And uh, in 2019, we were already seeing 55 to $60 billion being spent on virtual goods. So um, this whole digital collectible NFT is a, uh, you know, ready for the, for the market. So um, a little bit about what we do. Um, we sell uh, digital collectibles that are backed and blocked uh, ownership associated with NFT. Now, we provide a whole range of uh, digital collectibles to our users and uh, with, a, with a big focus on 3D models. So as you can see on screen here, we have a beautiful version of uh, Batman number 100 from DC Comics. Uh, the, the, the model is very, very high resolution. It's a limited edition. Um, it can be interactive, it can be upgraded. And most importantly, as I mentioned, it is secured with blockchain uh, with, with digital ownership. So uh, Vivi, the, the company, has been around for many years, uh, almost three years now, um, and we spent a long time 
uh, developing the product, making sure that it was something that fans and collectors would really resonate with. Um, myself, I'm a collector, as you can see behind me. My business partner is also a collector. So we come into this industry trying to provide uh, a, a really high quality collectible experience for users. Now, <clears throat> Vivi, the app launched in January 2021. Um, since that time, we have had almost 300,000 users registered. Um, we have sold more than 502,000 individual digital collectibles and generated approximately 25 million uh, in revenue. Um, for the past couple of years, we have been uh, working very hard to sign up um, a number of brands around the world. Um, uh, as many of you may see, there is an Ultraman right there in the middle. We're, we are very big fans of Ultraman. Um, and so, you know, our philosophy is that we want to bring um, digital collectibles and NFTs uh, that fans already know and already love. <clears throat> and that is why we have, uh, you know, spent a lot of time um, signing up and partnering with more than 100 brands now um, who will be coming into the VV app uh, over the next uh, sort of one to two years. Um, <clears throat> to date, uh, since we launched in, um, uh, in January 2021, um, the app, Vivi app, has been very well received by the audience out there. Um, and right now we are ranking around uh, in, the, in the entertainment sec section of uh, the app stores, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, number four in USA, number three Canada, number three UK, number three Australia, and so, and so on. So the product itself has been very, very well received um, by our fans. Um, and, you know, we still have a 4.5 plus star rating um, because fans really enjoy um, the experience that we offer. Um, <clears throat> now, shortly, I'll give you a product demonstration. Um, and one of the, the key features within the, the VV product is the ability to put your favorite superhero, whether that's Batman or Ultraman, in augmented reality. And then you can take photos and you can take videos. And on screen uh, here, you just see just some examples of the amazing um, augmented reality photos that our fans have taken um, and, and just the huge enjoyment they get out of, out of this experience. <clears throat> and to date, um, since our launch in January, we have had more than 80,000 uh, photos, uh, AR photos like this, um, taken and shared to our, uh, to, uh, onto our app. So it's a really great way for our fans to engage um, with the product, to engage with, uh, with your brand, um, and it also helps, um, you know, get your brand promoted um, right across social uh, and not, not by us, but it's actually being promoted by fans. Um, and, you know, that is a, a huge opportunity and, and a very, very fun experience that uh, Vivi offers. So <clears throat> I just want to give you a quick demonstration of the product. Um, now, Really, as I mentioned, we come from a collector's background. So uh, for us, it was very important to take what already exists in the real world, what fans already know and already love, and uh, bring that into a, a digital environment. Um, and the whole idea around this is we want to make sh wanted to make sure that we were still hitting the emotional triggers that um, that makes collecting so much fun in the real world and make sure that is all still happening in the, in the digital space. So let me just switch over to the product. Okay, uh, move that over there. <clears throat> so um, in order for us to create a, uh, you know, a really good digital collectible experience, um, we have divided the app up into five main sections, which you can see across the bottom store, collection, feed, and market, and then uh, the user's profile as well. 
Um, so in the store, this is where we sell, uh, you know, your content directly to the user. Um, everything is limited edition. Um, so for example, with the Ultraman here, um, I believe there was 5,000 editions of that character, all sold out. Um, as you can see, as I scroll along here, all of our content is sold out because um, it's been very, very popular. Now, as I scroll down, um, I start to see content that the app thinks that I like based on, you know, what I've purchased in the past, what I've liked, uh, what I've shared, and so forth. Um, across the top here, in the latest drop section, is all of the most recent um, brands that we have released to the public. And I can tap on any one of these brands to view the collectible offering um, that is, is in this particular series. So this one here is um, DC Cover Girls from, from DC Comics. And we have four, four collectibles in the set, Mira, Supergirl, Catwoman, and Batgirl. Um, and I can tap on any one of these digital collectibles or NFTs to, um, uh, to view the collectible in more detail. So as you can see, I can like, I can comment, I can bookmark, I can share. Um, and then as I scroll down, I see, just see more details about this particular collectible. Like I can see how many editions are available, what the rarity is. Um, within VV, we have five levels of rarity, common, uncommon, rare, ultra rare, and secret rare. So this, the store is pretty straightforward. The user can essentially browse um, through all of the different brands and all of the different series that we, that we offer um, <clears throat> and then choose to buy them. Now, once a user owns a collectible, it will then appear in their collection tab. And as I scroll down here, we've got a few things happening. Across the top is all of my virtual showrooms. Um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to them in just a moment. As I scroll down further, I can see these are all of the collectibles that I own. Um, and I can choose to tap on any collectible to, to view that 3D model that I've purchased. So right now it's loading up the actual 3D model. Um, this one is uh, called Batman Who Laughs. And as you can see, the model is very high detail. Um, I can zoom in, you know, get right up close from any angle. Um, I can choose to take a photo or a video at any time I want. And this, this is how users can share um, uh, across social. And then also um, I can tap the AR button And then I can drop the collectible in the real world. And again, I can scale it right up. You know, I can move around it. I can rotate or move it around. And again, I can take a photo or video at any time to share um, across, across social channels. Um, so with the collectible themselves, you can do a lot of different things. So as you can see, in the same way that I would interact with the collectible in the real world, um, I can drop our, our digital collectibles or our NFTs uh, in the real world, and then fans can engage and interact with them in the same way that they would with uh, you know, any kind of physical collectible that they might purchase. Now, one of the other things that is really important to collectors is the ability to set up and to showcase their collectibles that they own. Um, you know, every collector I know, like me, has their, has their collectibles set up in their house <clears throat> and they love to show them off. And that's a very big part and very important part of collecting. So these virtual showrooms, um, which all our users have access to, um, allow and our users to, to purchase the collectibles and then set them up in whatever they want. So for example, um, I can go over here and I can fully customize the showroom. So I can tap on any one of these collectibles and I can move them around. Um, you know, I could scale it up or down. Um, I can rotate it to really make this experience, uh, you know, very customized to myself. Um, over here, we have uh, the DeLorean from the uh, Back to the Future. Um, and uh, I can do things like open the doors, move it around, and so forth. So the, the idea of the showrooms is really to allow users to have that 
same experience that they would in the real world. And we have our fans spend hours and hours each week in their showrooms, setting them up, decorating them. Now, the third part of the uh, app here is, the, is our social feed. <clears throat> Again, fans and collectors, you know, they love to show off. If they get that number one or they get that super rare item, they want to show that off on the feed. So as I scroll down the feed here, we can see that we've got some users that are advertising collectibles that they have in the secondary market. Um, this user has shared his showroom. So other people can go in and look at his showroom or other people can come in and look at my showroom. Um, we've got some brand advertising on the feed. <clears throat> and then as we come down a little bit further, we can start to see that there is some user generated content. Um, here is Batgirl. Someone's taken an awesome AR photo and shared it to the feed. Um, so the, the feed is really the community hub of where uh, you know, of where fans can interact, they can sell their items, they can share their photos, they can participate in discussion. And then the next step is the secondary market. So uh, this is obviously very important to uh, the collectible industry. And it allows our users to, uh, to sell the individual collectibles that, uh, that they have purchased. Um, there are two ways that uh, a user can choose to sell. Number one is with a buy now, which means I can buy now for say $50, or I can put it on auction. So um, it, it could go for you know, whatever the highest price is. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, with us in the store, um, it's very, very simple. Users can simply just browse through, look at uh, all the listings that users have, um, as you can see, we have a lot of listings. We have over 40,000 listings in the secondary market right now. Um, and since January, it's uh, generated around 15 to 20 million in, uh, in secondary market transactional revenue. And obviously as a licensor, um, you will get the opportunity to uh, participate in those secondary market um, sales by getting a, a, a small percentage um, uh, and for the perpetual sale uh, of these items. So uh, yeah, that is my quick demo on, on the product. Uh, let me just jump back to the PowerPoint. Um, and just to finish up, I just wanted to give some quick examples um, of our most recent sales. So we did a Batman black and white, um, uh, 19,000 editions sold out in under 20 minutes. Um, Similar with this Kripkins brand, 77,000 editions sold out in 20 minutes. Um, Ultraman 2D artworks sold out in 20 minutes as well. Um, so thank you very much for the time. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy the uh, NFT event and uh, look forward to perhaps hearing from you in the future. Konnichiwa. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, moderate this panel with amazing uh, projects uh, in NFT space. So basically, we do have uh, Mickey from Flow and Robbie from Immutable and uh, basically Wittag from Engine. Uh, actually, the Sandeep from Polygon is supposed to be here. So, but um, um, I think he will join some other panel uh, that we are planning uh, later on. So uh, why don't we start with um, the quick intro for each, each of you. Uh, you guys can do a very quick intro 
uh, what you guys, uh, what, who are you, and also what your project does in very simple form. Uh, let's start with the Mickey and Robbie, and then let's go to the WeChat. Okay, uh, I am Mickey. I am uh, SVP of Platform Partnerships at Dapper Labs. Um, you could think of Dapper Labs as two things. It is uh, a Dapp development studio, famously creating both uh, CryptoKitties and Ethereum. And NBA Top Shot is the uh, flagship app on top of Flow, which is the other part of Dapper Labs. Dapper Labs uh, created Flow off of our frustrations and learnings uh, of the Ethereum blockchain as probably the most experienced uh, Dapp developers on that chain, um, as well as the inventor of the ERC-721 standard and the NFT. Flow is a layer one blockchain, um, which was built from the ground up to support NFTs, collectibles, and gaming initiatives um, with three pillars in mind, scalability, uh, low to no cost, and uh, mass market uh, UX UI design. Robbie, please. Awesome. Uh, so I'm Robbie. I'm one of the co-founders of Immutable. We are a three and a half year old blockchain company. So I actually think we have founded um, just a, a short time after Dapper. Uh, and we had a similar start building content on Ethereum. Uh, so we, we built Etherbots, which uh, went viral, which is the first multiplayer uh, game powered by NFTs, the blockchain. All of the logic was on chain. I think running a match right now costs something like eight thousand uh, dollars. So we we learned a lot about similarly the, the limitations of Ethereum early on. Uh, I'd say where we diverge is um, we decided the best scaling solution for NFTs was to build infrastructure that scaled Ethereum uh, rather than competed or, or built a new experience. Um, and so we based at, we created a layer two scaling technology um, called Immutable X, which is basically a protocol that anyone can use to create or trade NFTs on Ethereum for zero gas costs. Uh, and we really, I, I think we completely agree with Nikki that ultimately what matters is uh, the user experience and the liquidity of these NFTs. So we're trying to bring that experience to uh, Ethereum by allowing anyone to trade or create NFTs for zero gas costs with the same level of security as Ethereum, um, with access to interoperability and, and DeFi on Ethereum, uh, and also while building these liquidity tools so people can trade um, what they really want to trade. And of course, we have our flagship game as well, Gods Unchained, uh, which is a trading card game led by Chris Clay, um, who ran Magic the Gathering Arena. Hey, so uh, my name is Vitek Radomsky. Uh, I'm the CTO of Engine. We are, um, we've been in the space for a long time. We've actually been around for about 12 years. Uh, we started in uh, blockchain um, sort of around 2017. And we built this first sort of NFT development platform for video game companies. Uh, we started out on Ethereum and we have a, a nice Ethereum community building on our, our tool set. Um, we have a wallet and uh, SDKs for game developers uh, and all kinds of people want to use NFTs. And now we are partnering with Polkadot. We're developing a, a platform called Efinity, which is the goal of that is really, uh, we believe that NFTs are going to exist on multiple chains. We want to establish standards and, and tools around cross-chain NFTs. Thank you. Uh, I was expecting more simple intro, but you guys covered a lot of things that I was going to cover uh, through questions. So I scrapped out all the questions I made. I'll, I'll, I'll just do more ad hoc. Um, so based on my knowledge, uh, the flow immutable and engine, uh, one thing that uh, for the NFT space is basically you guys are trying to offer either a base layer chain or scalable solution or many different services that users or developer can easily make the NFT or use the NFT or trade NFT, etc. But I think uh, in terms of uh, scaling solution part, let's, let's touch upon the scaling solution part first. So because each of you guys have approached the scaling solution, I think differently. Uh, so tell me a little bit about how you see the scaling solution right now and then differentiation of your own scaling solution. Very, uh, so we have only like 20 minutes to go. So please keep it simple and then make uh, the, the audience the most easy to understand, please. Yeah. So whoever you wanna go first. 
I'll, I'll shoot and uh, apologize for that uh, that long intro. That's that was my fault. I set the table. Um, so Flow is a uh, we have a unique, innovative uh, node architecture, uh, which separates uh, computation in consensus roles into four separate node types. Uh, we have an execution node, uh, which does all the computation. And then we have three additional nodes, which do all of the checks and balances. Um, it is uh, a scale it, it, that architecture allows for it to be tremendously scalable, orders of magnitudes more scalable than Ethereum, while also remaining uh, secure uh, and decentralized. Awesome. Uh, so our approach is pretty simple. We ultimately think at the end of the day, two things matter to NFT value, uh, security and network effects. And security is a bunch of things. It's how decentralized is it, how resistant it is to attacks. Um, and network effect is how many people want to trade on this system. I think ultimately that's what's going to govern uh, the, the, the kind of solution that most people use. Um, and so we said very simply to both, why don't we just build the best possible experience? Because I completely agree. Ethereum has terrible user experience. It has terrible um, scalability natively, but that's because it's opted to become truly decentralized and it's been building everything as it is built out is basically that the fundamentals of it is like you, you try and attack Ethereum, like good luck. Um, you know, that there's half a billion, uh, half a trillion dollars guaranteed on there. And so we said, well, why can't we just leverage that same security, leverage that network effect and build a scaling solution? And, and we use something called zero knowledge rollups with our technology partner, Starkware, that basically compresses uh, off-chain transactions or layer two transactions that users perform and then uh, upload them in a compressed proof back to the Ethereum mainnet. Okay, so um, yeah, scalability, um, it's an interesting topic because you have to think about the various things that come into scalability. Obviously, um, you know, computation costs, uh, what, what the, the, the security model is costing you. Um, and you know, in terms of throughput, I mean, you, 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 can, you can allow a lot of throughput. As you have more nodes, obviously, you know, the, the speed has to decrease. As more people use the network, more data is going on there, more resources are, are being, you know, shared by all these users and um, you have to start limiting it. Um, so, you know, we are, our, our philosophy is that purpose built chains and, you know, Ethereum has its place. I think Ethereum is, is gonna be huge for forever. Um, because anyone can deploy anything on there. Uh, but, you know, we, working with Polkadot and Parachains, that lets people build chains um, for, you know, specific DeFi purposes, specific gaming purposes. Um, and uh, we believe that that harnessing that, that aspect and building a standard that works across many chains and is flexible is going to be a really good path forward because it keeps things open and it will allow, you know, you new scalability solutions to come out. You know, we've seen ZK rollups, we've seen optimistic rollups, uh, you know, state channels, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so we can use that in tandem with, with multiple chains. Got it. Uh, thanks for sharing. Um, let's just uh, stay on the scaling solution. I think you guys have provide, uh, explained pretty well that how your own projects are solving the scaling solution. But let's say, um, let's put on the more developer kind of perspective here. So in the past, when I look at the NFT space, everyone come up with that there are a lot of amazing technology, but either it's not easy to use by developer or it's not easy to buy users, either one. I think there was a button next. So for each of your projects on developer perspective, who's watching this, who's considering whether I should use Immutable X or Infinity or Flow Blockchain, why the uh, developer uh, in NFT space will choose your own, uh, your specific scaling solution. Starting with uh, the other side, let's go from the WeChat. Sure, uh, yeah, we looked at all the different friction points um, and we've been talking to a lot of game developers and you know, their, their, their biggest thing is firstly, how are people gonna get uh, you know, a token? How are they gonna get this token to be able to transact? How are users gonna get this token? So we, you know, we, we looked at every single friction point and try to remove that or, or, or facilitate that. So for example, on Efinity, a game developer can, they know their clients, they know who's playing the game. So they can subsidize the transaction costs by staking some of their tokens. Uh, so they know their users, they know their token collections. Um, th those are ways to, to remove some of those barriers. Um, you know, fuel tanks and uh, various mechanisms allowing multi-sig uh, natively on the, on the chain. 
um, and not having the barriers that, you know, something like Ethereum is fully trustless. So every smart contract, every token has to have this, these big permission walls. Now, when we all start going to these native solutions, uh, removing all those friction points uh, makes it easy for users, developers, everyone to start building these, uh, these nice experiences. Yeah, so this is core to what we're building. Our thesis is very simple. At the end of the day, whether you're a game, whether you're a marketplace, whether you're an artist, uh, or whether you're a, a financial application who wants to build a business on NFTs, you are going to be vastly restricted if you're required to know, uh, you know blockchain language or, or um, anything required to build smart contract applications. And so that's why we're literally just a set of APIs. Uh, so if you want to mint or trade an NFT, um, you, you hit immutable X as APIs um, and you have guarantees around that it's creating this on on you know the the, the most decentralized and, and highest network effect blockchain. Um, so I think it's I think it's crucial to widespread adoption. I think people should be able to build businesses. You're always going to get people who are happy to get into the weeds and happy to you know build contact uh, like complex functionality. But at the end of the day, what we're doing here is defining a new asset standard to represent digital ownership of stuff. Like this is going to be far bigger than just gaming. It's going to be far bigger than just collectibles. It's going to dwarf any unique asset. Um, and I think it's very, very important to make that as easy to access as possible um, by an individual, by a company, uh, by, by anyone. Yeah. Um, Flow is a layer one blockchain. Um, not built off EVM, not built off Ethereum, because as we were thinking about moving uh, from Ethereum, um, we did research on all the layer twos, building a layer two ourselves, uh, and all the other layer ones that were existing or um, or existed or were being conceived of at that point. And for what we want to do and what we think the space makes the space great. Uh, is that we needed a layer one that was scalable, a layer one that was scalable without sharding, um, a layer one that was scalable that would enable true composability between smart contracts and applications. Um, so uh, we'd like to say that we're, we're a scalable blockchain without sacrifices. Um, second part of that is we were built from the ground up, from the first line of code with NFTs uh, and with these entertainment applications or collectible applications in mind. Um, with that, you get a lot of choices, a lot of features, uh, a lot of UX, UI design that could only be done uh, as something that was thought about uh, catering to this, uh, these types of apps from the ground up. So, you know, the beautiful payment uh, mechanism in NBA Top Shot that's possible because it, uh, Flow was designed with that in mind from the ground up. Uh, the fact that you never see crypto or you don't have to see crypto in terms of gas uh, or any or payments or anything else on Flow applications is because it was built uh, with mass adoption in mind from the ground up. So Flow has a concept where uh, anyone could sign transactions on behalf of anyone else. So and it's cheap enough uh, from a gas and account a creation perspective where developers are holding pools of tokens and being paying on behalf of their users. So um, uh, users never have to touch uh, crypto. And then, um, you know, we felt that, you know, sharding um, for lack of a better word, broke a lot of what made, made the blockchain unique and interesting and a, a beautiful development platform. So we felt through our research sharding almost created more problems than it solved at scale. Uh, and we wanted to stay away from that. So we have a you know single shared state blockchain that is uh, truly scalable because of the four node architecture. Thank you. Um, since we uh, talk a lot about a uh, little bit of technical, so let's switch the gear a little bit to user's perspective or uh, uh, use cases perspective. Um, can you guys share with us, uh, with the audience, that uh, if the normal crypto person or just non-crypto person who is entering the space, where would they experience your product or service right now? Or if you don't have it yet, then in near in nearest term, where would the users experience your product and service? Let's go by Mickey. Can you make it a little shorter this time, please? We have a lot, a lot of interesting topics we can cover today. 
I mean, uh, most yeah, m most notably, uh, users can experience what the Flow blockchain is all about through MBA Top Shot. Um, it was built as a flagship app by Dapper Labs to prove out what Flow, uh, what was possible with Flow. But beyond that, we have dozens of third-party DApps uh, alive and building on top of Flow, um, with multiple hundreds in the pipeline coming. Um, you've seen MotoGP, you've seen Vive. You've seen a uh, dark country game. You've seen a number of uh, third-party dApps go live on Flow, and they're continuing to go live. Right, Roby. Yeah, look, our um, strategy is really simple. Um, we don't need to do a bunch of heavy outbound. We just need to focus on building the best possible user experience because everyone kind of just uses Ethereum, and 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 you know, generally, there's a lot of inbound interest to that. Um, and so, I think we'd we'd have a you know, I, I think it's almost a slightly different market to kind of what um, Flow is Flow is looking at, which is like this this awesome bespoke experience for for IP, and um, this is sort of more like the you know the, the open ecosystem. Um, forgive me if I've, I've misappropriated that, Nikki. Um, but so yeah, it, for us it's very simple, which is anyone can permissionlessly use our layer two. Um, they can use any other features they want. You can use your own wallet. Um, you can use your own credit card providers, or we can provide a recommended flow. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're providing is secure scaling up to like you know tens of thousands of uh, NFTs per second and more on our layer two, um, and anyone can use it. Yeah, just allow me to just clear up that misconception quickly. Um, Dapper Labs is one thing with MBA Top Shot. Uh, you can view that as one way. The other half is a truly open ecosystem. We are mirroring. Uh, much of how we build our ecosystem uh, on how Ethereum built their ecosystem. So we're not just reacting to what is wrong with Ethereum. We've also taken what we thought was great. And there are a lot of great things. So we see uh, Flow as 2.0 or 3.0 of Ethereum, where we learned a lot and we took all those things that we learned and we approved upon uh, what was wrong in building this better, true open ecosystem. Great. Right. So um, yeah, on our end, uh, like if you're a gamer, you like games, uh, go to engine.io, go to our game section and check out one of the games. Um, you know, there's some, some really interesting ones being built. Um, as a developer, if you're building an app or a game, you want to uh, have a platform to do that on, check out the docs section of our website. And as a crypto enthusiast, um, if you want to read about what we're doing now this year with Efinity, uh, go check out efinity.io and think about you know, how we're, we're trying to do a new kind of cross-chain economy and, and, and system there. Great. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about business side this time. So we talked about technical and we talked about users uh, or developers. And now I will give you some question around business opportunities, let's say. So my question is, is it actually in twofold. So you can pick one of, one of two you like. So where do you see the most business opportunity in NFT sector right now? It means that if someone is trying to dive into grab some opportunity in NFT sector, well, where is the opportunity? Maybe from your project perspective or in general, maybe that's fine. Our second question is where do you guys see the most, the biggest opportunity for your projects? So where do your projects actually putting a lot of resources and effort to go after either just gaming community or either going UFC or uh, NFL, all those areas, or it doesn't really matter. You just go after whole Ethereum community. So, so basically I give you two questions, but whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whichever question you like to pick. Sure, so we, we can start from the WeChat. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think this is a, a really interesting space because it's constantly evolving. I think, um, some, something you, you should tap into is really how to, how to find some utility, some interesting utility in your NFTs and how to sort of add that magic into it. Because you have this amazing resource with any blockchain to you know, infuse history into things, infuse ownership into things, give people tools to trade and create a real economy outside of like a single walled garden with these NFTs. So uh, there's just such an un untapped potential here. And we're talking so many developers right now that are, that are trying to you know, tap into this right now. So there's, uh, there's opportunities to monetize, there's opportunities to, to create economies, to, to, to do all kinds of things. So um, explore that utility beyond just you know, NFT JPEGs in a sense, right? 
Uh, Robbie, you want to go? Yeah, um, so I categorize it into two. I think there's uh, NFTs where the digital value in here is in custody of the token. And I talk that about the, the NFTs we've really seen to rise of the, this year, which is, you know, collectibles driven uh, NFTs, um, you could say any of the digital art that's coming out. And that's because the value proposition is, hey, you, you own the token, there's nothing else that you need to be guaranteed from the real world. That is where the value lives and you can prove the original provenance. I think what we haven't seen as much is uh, utility or, or uh, NFTs with links to real title. So what about an NFT that represents like some actual value um, in, in the real world, whether it's like a, a physical asset um, stored in a vault, whether it's fractionalized real estate. Uh, and, and then I think there's a third fascinating one, which is we're starting to see the financial sector consumed by NFTs because a whole bunch of the topology of financial assets is actually unique assets. Like if you look at uh, term deposits, if you look at bonds, if you look at like the Wi-Fi insurance or hell, even Uniswap is a perfect example of this with um, them using NFTs to, to denominate LP tokens. So like I, I think the industry is going to be trillions. I think it's going to represent everything unique um, that's financial. The place we've really started is building a, a very custom dedicated experience to games because we think that's a market that is ready now. Like gamers spend $100 billion every year on items they don't own. We want to make sure they own them. I, I'm basically reacting to demand right now uh, from the world to get into the NFT space. We see multiple different interesting verticals uh, coming into the space, digital fashion, music, esports, influencers, art, collectibles, entertainment, gaming. Uh, I'm, I'm missing a few, I'm sure. Uh, but I think to, you know, to Robbie's point and to others' point, um, this, they have very early views on the space and they have very early views of what an NFT is. And most do not even think about utility. It's more art, creative, doing the drop and, and, and being done with it. The second all of these vert verticals, traditional brands, verticals, IPs, start thinking about how to really take their fans and add utility into the NFT space, we're gonna see a, a huge explosion of interesting projects. Sorry, since we have more time, actually, I have more uh, project specific question from my end. Um, so let's let's start with the uh, engine team. So I think engine, you guys build the whole ecosystem, uh, providing wallet, QR code, or explorer, how to mint it. And then now you guys are tapping into sort of Polkadot ecosystem. I think that might confuse a little bit of people in crypto space. So maybe I, I would ask you uh, once the affinity is launched, how are you going to balance your resources into Ethereum-based engine and affinity? How these two, uh, two different projects will communicate it? I think that's the one question, specific question for you. And for Robbie, I would say so that Veve or the Green Park recently integrate, announce or integrate your kind of uh, scaling solution. Veve is, I, I, love, I love David, but um, um, in, in terms of uh, the developer perspective, uh, since you guys, I saw that those new news, those developer from these two projects, why, why, how they say about their experience based integrating your scaling solution, if you have. And for Mickey, uh, I saw the news that you guys invested in this avatar kind of the startup. I don't know whether Depo Lab or Flow kind of, it's, it's um, the either side, but I see you guys are also tapping into metaverse space, which I'm personally very interested in. Uh, so I want to hear about your view on metaverse, if you have, and if you don't, then um, the, in, in terms of you mentioned that 30, 30 dApps are online and 100, more than 100 dApps on, on, on waiting lists. What, what would, can you pick like one or two uh, interesting one that you want to share? Okay. Um, so, yes, uh, the, the, you know, the, the obvious thing is, you know, Ethereum is not going anywhere. It's, it's huge and it's going to stay, I think it's going to be here for, for a very long time, probably forever. Um, the thing is, you know, with the way that people want to use Ethereum, with, you know, the, 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 the mass amount of DeFi transactions, gaming, all this stuff happening, it's obviously 
very difficult to do that directly on Ethereum. But we know that a lot of NFT activity was born there and a lot of NFT projects and all kinds of projects are being born there all the time. So we take the view that there is going to be different chains, different uh, solutions for everything. That's why we looked at, you know, we looked at layer two in the beginning as well. And we, we, we messed around with that for two years. We, we almost had a, a quite a good working solution at layer two, but we realized that we need to take a more open approach. So we, we started looking at Polkadot and, you know, the way that it's designed, um, each chain can optimize its protocol and its data storage and, and, and its state and everything for its use case. And we really strongly align with that philosophy. You know, if you're building um, something specific to games, there's a lot of things that games need to do where we can make a beautiful protocol for that. So our goal is cross, like make it frictionless to move cross chain between Ethereum to uh, any parachain to potentially other chains. Um, and so that's why we're, we're going this direction. Um, you know, Gavin Wood uh, was inventor of Ethereum uh, and Solid, Solidity language, and uh, he's now working on Polkadot. And uh, we think that their their way forward is 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 very promising. Awesome. Um, so your question, Steve, was about developer experience. I want to touch on the choice of scaling solution a little first, uh, and I think it's very important to talk about how ultimately um, you, you can't compromise on, on the fundamentals of, of whatever the consensus mechanism and, and level of decentralization of, of the solution are choosing. And we've seen this, you know, even with like the, the Binance downtime in the recent days, right? Where um, sure they've just cloned um, <laughs> the EVM, uh, but there's, there's lots of things that if you, if you don't recreate in the right way, you don't actually have um, a, a decentralized uh, ecosystem. And so I think ultimately when we made our choice was we said it would be much easier to build the best possible experience for people wanting to use NFTs by not trying to compete with Ethereum by saying, great, we're, you know, the, the, the hundreds of millions of, of dApps on Ethereum are now our hundreds of millions of dApps and, and we're building a, a protocol that they can use um, was always our thesis. Um, and I think, you know, uh, with Tech points out that the troubles that there was in scaling solutions for such a long time. I think even at the time Dapper decided to do Flow, there really wasn't a layer two um, thing in production. Like they, they didn't exist. Um, state channels has never, you know, no one's succeeded in, 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 in mainnet. Um, you know, Plasma never really worked and that's morphed into optimism. Um, and so honestly, um, it was the fact that we had seen an instance of Starkware in production succeeding that we said, okay, zero knowledge rollups are proven. This is the way it's, it's going to scale and we can finally productize this thing. Um, so I think that that was why we had confidence in going at that solution and, and, and obviously why we're, we're happy with where we are today. Um, in terms of integration experience, um, where, you know, I, I, the ones that I always like to share is Token Troy, which is a third party marketplace, integrated their entire marketplace um, onto MWX in like seven days. Um, and they have two mm. engineers. So uh, I, I think the benefit is as you get a lot of this ecosystem built around this API documentation, like our goal is to be the stripe. Like you can build on us in a day. Um, mm. So yeah, hopefully the, the developer experience is very good and, and we're, we're taking a lot of feedback. Great. So a couple questions for me. One was the, um, the metaverse. Um, Flow is branded the blockchain for open worlds. An open world in our mind is a metaverse. Um, you can't do a metaverse on uh, something that's not uh, a single shared state. And we built Flow specifically because we believe in the open world metaverse concept where mm. all smart contracts are being leveraged by other parties and the whole entire community is building pieces of that metaverse in a single shared state blockchain. Um, so we have built Flow specifically because we think uh, the metaverse concept is interesting and will eventually materialize. Um, so you mentioned um, that there are hundreds of developers on the waiting list. There is no uh, waiting list to get on Flow. They're just in the process of developing on Flow. Um, My bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's an important distinction because uh, people think Flow, some people think Flow is closed and, or you have to have permission. Uh, you don't. You can come in and build on Flow today, and you can go live on Flow today. Um, what we do do is we provide a free smart contract audit pre you going live to ensure you're safe, your users are safe, uh, the chain is safe because we did invent a new smart contract language cadence. Um, and then in terms of developers, I'd like to highlight, uh, you mentioned one, which is uh, Genies. That's they're building currently um, 
Others that I, you know, I like to mention, we have uh, very early adopters, um, Vive, it's a, it's a marketplace. They did the Ben Morrow art drop. He's the uh, Halo artist. He's made millions of dollars on Flow, dropping art. Um, Chain Monsters did a uh, their Steam game with they did a drop on Flow. They shattered, uh, I don't know, they five x their um, uh, their goal for for launch. Uh, and then Animoca with MotoGP, they did a drop on Flow that attracted somewhere between seventy and ninety thousand users for a very small drop. So. Things like that are uh, going uh, ultra successful on Flow, and, and it's not just Top Shop; it's, it's dozens of other open ecosystem developers. Great, you guys, you guys answered to my kind of weird questions very well. I appreciate it. Uh, so I have we have to close up. So I, I will give you some last kind of uh, wrap up questions. So again, uh, I've been in this uh, space since 2017, NFT since 2018. So. I've been seeing a lot of, you know, uh, success and failure of the NFT space. And for last four months or five months, a lot of new retail people are coming into NFT space, especially around NFT collectibles and NFT art space. And then I personally think that there was or there is uh, uh, still bubbles in it uh, in some sense. Uh, but so a lot of people are asking me, those are newcomers asking me, Steve, is NFT bubble? Hey, Steve, is NFT isn't, isn't just like, you know, speculation. So all, the, all of you who made a lot of achievement and contribution to development of NFT space, can, if you can give the one advice to this new retail who got into crypto because of NFT craze, what would you say or at least what would you tell them so that making sure that NFT is not nothing just about the speculation. So whatever you want to say is one sentence to those people. And then we'll close up. I'll say, think about the, doing something authentic that's reaching the fans directly, either through the content or through the utility um, in engaging fans. Don't just think about dropping some art. Think about how you truly engage that fan. Robbie? Oh, you're on mute. Ultimately, I think it's, you need a long-term strategy. At the end of the day, people saying it's NFT in a bubble, it's, just, it's a funny thing to me. It's like asking, um, is it, you know, banking standard, is it, is it a file format, a bubble? Like, no, it's just a way of representing information. Um, and we can do much more with that now. The way people are using it, maybe overblown in some instances. I'm, I'm, I can't guarantee whether we're going to see this meteoric rise in the short term, um, but there's certainly things you can do with this that radically transform and improve your business model. And I encourage them to look at that. Great. We tap. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take this from uh, people who want to utilize NFTs. I think, you know, um, when you're creating an NFT, it's you're, you're putting some of your your brand behind it. You're putting some sort of thing that that is going to live forever and people are going to hold, you know, they're going to they're going to want that to, to do something for them. So just think about it being a win win for both you and people who are going to have that NFT. Um, just think, you know, it's, it's going to be a living thing on a blockchain. So take that into mind. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we tech from Engine, Mickey from uh, Flow, Robbie from uh, Mirable. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hopefully, uh, those who are listening or watch this learn about technology of, of these three projects and business opportunities, how they see it, and then how we should think about NFT space. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Steve from Block Tower Capital, a crypto investment firm based in New York and Miami right now. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, it was Thank pleasure. you. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Nikki. See you guys. Hello, everyone. Konnichiwa. This is Juhi. My name is Juhi Lee. Uh, I'm a co founder of Emoji Games. Actually, you are looking. Overlooking this beautiful uh, Lake Lucerne and the uh, mountain Pilatus. It's beautiful weather today and you can enjoy this beautiful scenery over here. Actually, um, yeah, we, I have co-founded this Emoji Games nine years ago in uh, uh, Lucerne. And I wor I've been working here and uh, living here since then. I'm absolutely very happy. And actually today, I wanted to introduce about our new upcoming game. It's called uh, 
Castle Defense NFT strategy epic game. And this game is actually got, we got inspired by this castle. <laughs> Mackenhorn is the castle, uh, the name of the castle. And it's very, looking very similar, like our castle in the ca uh, Castle Defense. So this game is coming out uh, end of June, 30th of June, the beta version. So I'm very looking forward. Thank you. enjoyed our video. It has been a long time to create this game uh, since uh, almost two, two years. So you have to find the right partner for you. Uh, if you are a sponsor, find the right esports player. Uh, you will show the skills and histories of each esports player. So you can find the right partner. And of course, there's contract terms apply. But then we have our uniqueness in this game. Uh, not only you have to defend your castle, but you can attack other castle. So if you buy a castle and if you don't play it diligently, you will be in danger of losing your castle and land. Uh, if you sell your castle, then the profit, net profit will be shared by three parties, emoji games and player and sponsor. Of course, sponsor gets the highest portion. So I like to talk about a little bit about our structure, Pocket Arena structure. We use uh, this dual structure. Uh, even though our token POC is based on ERC20, we at the same time we use Hyperledger, a uh, private blockchain, which is open source. So it's free for users, free transactions, and super speed uh, for any game transaction, which is very important for gaming users for microtransaction. So Ethereum uh, gas fee uh, on the gaming market doesn't work at all. So because we use a private blockchain, we can uh, we are very flexible supporting other upcoming uh, NFT protocols. Uh, basically, we use uh, ERC721 for minting uh, NFT tokens, but we are already our structure makes it very uh, friendly, uh, easy to support other upcoming uh, NFT blockchain tokens. So uh, basically DLT uh, distributed ledger technology wrapping. So Hyperledger, it works perfectly. It's playable by anyone, by any device. That's the beauty of our games. 
because a lot of blockchain games out there you have to play only on your pc and you have to install Meta metamask so it's uh, the market is still very very small because most of people actually play on the mobile 90 percent so we have to solve this issue the html5 technology uh, we are focusing on that solves a lot of problems basically our uh, pocket arena model is a play to earn model uh, that's basically all the blockchain games uh, applies this model whenever user plays our games they will get uh, rewarded especially when they win the game because we have all uh, these tournament modes uh, so whenever they win the game, they get higher percentage uh, of uh, XP and they can claim it. They can redeem it with POKE. So you see our uh, titles that we actually aim to launch it by end of this year. Uh, at least 15 titles. The uh, game is already made and we just have to uh, customize it with POKE Arena SDK. So this SDK will be released to external parties from next year on. Emoji games, we have been developing many our own IP of uh, these high quality casual games. So Facebook has recognized as uh, their approved partner. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we also developed uh, an API for external developers who want to have this uh, social esports function and also this benefit of uh, blockchain rewarding by Pocket Arena. So we we'll run this uh, developers forum from next year. Uh, so we actually would like to be a uh, world biggest blockchain games portal in soon time. And now we have a blockchain portal, how it works. Uh, it's a social esports. Esports has been there for many years, just that this Corona pandemic makes it very made it very difficult to have this traditional way of esports that where you know a lot of crowd gather together and a big star player play with a, a luxurious costume and a lot of sponsorship this model is very hard to work in the future i believe in the future uh, what makes it popular is everyone actually play a little small game casual games and make a small fun uh, playing each other playing uh, tournaments and get a little rewards that's our model we are uh, working on. We actually created this solution and we have some users already and there are more games are being added. So uh, that's how it works in our uh, screenshot. And actually we can still play, already play in our Pocket Arena website. And uh, yeah, you can earn, uh, you can lose and you earn, make earn of uh, our Pocket Arena token. And uh, if you pay entry, and uh, developers will make uh, monetization out of it when they when their games are being played so that's also championship is planned last but not least i like to introduce about our nft game studio 
Our gaming studio uh, is already there. It uh, has been there since 2016. Uh, its name, uh, grand, branded mini games, uh, BMG Studio is called. As a gaming uh, gamification studio for many brands and marketers to create uh, their own brand games without coding. So it has been very successful and it's been still being used by many uh, brands every day. And we like to upgrade it uh, with NFT and blockchain version, of, especially for indie uh, character and game designers who desperately need of, of this venue for their character debut and to monetize it. And how it works? Well, basically artists, uh, they must have created some characters already and they can easily gamify it using our gaming studio. And then we could put NFT layer on top of it for the character and they can publish it and our users can play their games. And the more their games played and more XP they will receive. So this XP becomes their money. And also they can sell it to the NFT marketplace and of course, there will be uh, some star characters that can sell it high price. And uh, being the beauty, having the beauty of NFT is that the creator still gets 1% of license fee uh, whenever the game is played. Yeah, actually our journey uh, Emoji Games has been has started since 2005. So we are actually people of uh, about 40 people and uh, in the different spaces, uh, different places, headquarters in the Switzerland, the UK and South Korea, Canada, Thailand, Vietnam. So we are quite decentralized since many years. <laughs> so blockchain is our in our culture already. And uh, yeah, we've been always in a gaming gaming solution, a uh, little bit of fintech, and an SN5 expert in this market. So uh, here's our listing plan. Uh, because we have received this non action letter from Financial Watchdog in Switzerland, uh, FIMA is the name, and uh, that makes this project very safe and uh, interesting for uh, crypto investors. So we are currently we are speaking to a couple of European crypto funds and uh, family offices. So in conclusion, i like to emphasize this uh, to our dear friends in Japan. Uh, blockchain technology in gaming is driven by NFT, digital sets that represent in-game content. These NFT tokens are unique, rare, and can't be shared with others. In the long run, every game company will be forced to participate in the NFTs because the benefits are so strong for players. And uh, I'm very proud of that our Emoji Games has adopted this uh, NFT uh, as an early uh, pioneer. Uh, if you ever come to Switzerland, feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to take you around. And um, I'm also serving as a president of SACA, uh, Swiss Asia Crypto Alliance. So um, I can give you lots of information of how to do a blockchain business in Switzerland. So thank you for watching it. Sayonara.
Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this panel. I'm Mai, the organizer of this conference. I have been organizing this conference since 2018. I'm honored to have too many participants and wonderful speakers this year. So the next panel is what NFT will make the social impact happen. So uh, my friend uh, who doesn't know much about cryptocurrencies said uh, when he hears the word cryptocurrency, he always imagine price or uh, making money <laughs> like of uh, this, uh, like the speculation things. But I think it's not true. Uh, I mean, cryptocurrency and blockchain have great potential for creating a sustainable society. In this session, I would like to invite amazing panelists who are working to create a more sustainable society using blockchain. And uh, so we want to discuss and share with you the, their thoughts. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so thank you for joining uh, everyone. And uh, please introduce by yourself in 30 minutes. In particular, I would like to know what kind of activities you are doing in the context of NFT and charity. So let's start from Hugo. Sure. Um, well, thanks for, for having me here, Mai. Um, it's very exciting to, to, to talk about um, NFTs in general and what we're doing. But yeah, so I'm Hugo and I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Cryptograph and also an upcoming a new platform that we're working on, which is called MyNFT.com. But for the purposes of this, I'll talk mainly about Cryptograph. Um, basically, we started what we were doing in, in sort of late 2017 as NFTs were sort of really coming about on the Ethereum blockchain. And we wanted to come up with what we thought was a really interesting recipe for how you can use NFTs to not only uh, you know, create value for creators and uh, uh, businesses, et cetera, but also to create a perpetual passive income stream for charities. Mm -hmm. And we came up with this idea of a cryptograph, which is a, a perpetually passive income instrument for both creators and charities. Um, and so, I mean, in a nutshell, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a unique asset made by icons and artists um, from all around the world and highly talented individuals in you know, various sectors that we, um, uh, uh, that we want to you know, portray that talent in. And um, they create a unique one of one uh, piece of content. Uh, that's original. Um, they're always one of ones when it comes to cryptographs. And we're very into the idea of ultimate scarcity. Um, and uh, each one is then traded, well, it's initially sold through an innovative auction system that we've invented called the GBM auction system. But I won't go into too much detail there, but it's, it's a really cool way that incentivizes participation. So you, you can get rewarded uh, for bidding, basically. Um, and then it's uh, traded in perpetuity between collectors forever. And every single time it's traded, it generates uh, a, a, a royalty, if you will, for the original creator and a charity of their choice. And um, there's a few other things with the token that we've created. So you can't burn. I mean, if you burn a cryptograph, it has a special switch in it so that after a certain period of time in a dead wallet, it actually puts itself back on the market. So it's a sort of perpetual instrument by design which is a large part of our thinking behind how it works and um yeah we started so we launched it in july last year the the first three or four months were really great um and then gas fees went totally crazy and we've had to pause releases at the moment but we have a solution coming out for the gas fee problem this mm -hmm. month actually so we're going to start selling again um and uh, uh yeah we did we, we did some really great people all the way from you know vitalik through to Paris Hilton, and as you know, my Jason did a really cool one. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, it's been a, a really, really exciting time. And I think it's just the beginning of where this technology can go. And we at Cryptograph are doing a, a version of it with this idea of sustainable philanthropy and applying commercial models and blockchain to uh, charity as well as, you know, creativity. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such an exciting technology and there's just so much else going on in the space. So that's me and that's Cryptograph. Amazing. Thank you, Hugo. So actually, I bought uh, Jason Momoa's NFT. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Cryptograph for seven years at that time. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, great yeah. experience. 
And uh, so today, so I have good news for you. So I had interview by Japanese newspaper and today the newspaper published my interview and the first page. And I talk about the experience. Uh, I bought oh. the JSON Momo's uh, uh, <laughs> NFT at the, the cryptograph. Let cryptograph. me share awesome. the screen. Yeah. Can you see this? Wow. Yeah, this is first page. That's so cool. Oh, yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's great, great timing. And I just want, wanted to share with you. Yeah. Thank you. Super cool, Mai. Super cool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, then uh, Vanessa. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to this panel and really looking forward to talk with you guys regarding how NFT can really become a real drive of sustainable development. So quick introduction. My name is Vanessa and I am currently the project director uh, uh, I got used to it. <laughs> the published director of finance NFT and also a former project director of finance charity. Um, actually, um, uh, I've been working with my since last year when COVID hit the whole world and we worked together to support over 26 countries around the world with 2 million PPE supporting 1 million people. And during that fight, we, uh, we are doing, a, we, we did a fundraising in, in Japan and we engage a lot of crypto community players to really donate and fight for Japan. And some of them are uh, NFT, NFT industry uh, players. And they, they, they inspire us to figure that like actually NFT could be a really good way for fundraising. And it's a really good balance between creativity, mm -hmm. business and charity. And hence basically inspired by that, uh, when I was still in Binance Charity, we initiate a um, initiative called NFT for Good. Uh, during the COVID campaign, the control against COVID campaign. And um, starting from there, we are inviting, Binance Journey have been inviting NFT artists and all kinds of artists to leverage their thoughts and, re uh, and recall their thoughts about a lot of um, social issues and then convert it into NFT and maybe commercialize it and then donate the sales directly to, to NGOs that need support. And this uh, initiative has continued to become an important initiative that will be officially integrated into Binance.com's NFT official platform. Um, so Binance uh, NFT platform, the official .com platform, will be official live at the end of this month. So look forward to it and please stay tuned. And I would, I would be happy to elaborate more of how this platform could leverage the NFT for Good campaign uh, as a really important instrument to empower our creators and brands. So far, we've uh, this initiative and the Binance NFT platform to be launched in June has, has got a lot of traction. So uh, uh, currently, we have uh, a lot of um, engagement and got a lot of attention from NFT artists as well as uh, top brands from all over the world saying that they do want to uh, try to be on board and hope that they can convert um, the matches they want to develop and convert the creativity into a real drive of global sustainable development. Awesome. Thank you, Vanessa. So after we collaborate and so donate to Japanese uh, hospital, and so some Japanese NPO uh, will uh, get interested in the charity and NFT and the cryptocurrency donations. And so, yeah, today we are very, I am very happy to discuss the future collaboration and how NFT can support the donate. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> okay, then Tosan, please. Hi, thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Toshiaki Takase, and I'm the representative of TAUT. I've been in the blockchain world since 2016, uh, doing business development. And I'm working on a project related to NFT from around um, 2019. Uh, for example, we, we were building a system to distribute ebooks, uh, such as manga, as NFTs, and also a system for fans to receive a royalty of the sales of that manga. Uh, recently, we have been selling collaborative whiskey manga NFTs as a way to support restaurants uh, in trouble with COVID-19 mm. and using the sales to support them. Um, we are also supporting the issuance of social tokens and have uh, began to challenge ourselves to issue tokens to people who are doing social meaningful activities uh, that are not particularly business oriented and to make their activities sustainable. 
in addition, we are currently trying to create a sustainable donation system using NFTs. And we are trying to match uh, contents to be sold as NFTs with organizations that are engaged in social good activities. Um, we are passionate about creating a form of supporting using token technology, such as NFT and social tokens. Uh, thank you for today. Thank you, Toshi. And so, Toshi, you mentioned that you are creating the NFTs with cross-platform on-chain loyalties uh, distribution system functionality. And so, I, I want to hear about this more. So, please uh, share with us. No, uh, okay. Um, um, how can I say? First of all, the management of uh, NFT sales is currently depend on the uh, method of each NFT platform. And as a result, it is difficult to receive royalties on sales when trading NFTs across platforms. On the other hand, uh, it would be harm a hurdle for creators who issue NFTs to develop their own original contracts and also to deal with cross-platform trading so that they can receive sales. So uh, to solve this problem, uh, we, are, we have developed a contract that allows creators to receive a return on their sales even when cross-platforms and uh, providing it to creators. Um, how can I say, uh, as for charity, for example, if we receive royalties on an ongoing basis, we can split the proceeds between creators like 90% and uh, to donators 10%. As a result, every, uh, every time an NFT is sold, uh, a donation can be made. Uh, if this can be done, both creators and buyers of NFTs will be able to freely participate in donation, uh, create a, creating better cycle, I think. Thank you, Toshi. And I think the cryptograph also have a, uh, like a ERC-2665. It's That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, I mean, so, so royalties are really interesting. <laughs> Uh, part of, of NFTs because, you know, part of what the technology does is unlock this ability to create a perpetual income stream that's, you know, enshrined in smart contract uh, uh, code. Um, and the when we created Cryptograph initially, we were obviously, this was a core part of our, of our proposition because the whole idea of a Cryptograph is an NFT with a purpose that perpetually does good. Um, and so we we struggled quite a lot with the royalty problem because, as, as Toshi says, quite 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 um, you know clearly that you know if I have my my cryptograph right now and I and I buy it and sell it on cryptograph, great, fine. But if I then go and take it to OpenSea or I go and take it to another marketplace and I do it there, um, if we hadn't created what we had created, the royalty that would have been paid there wouldn't have been paid because the, the NFT can't reference the smart contract because it's in a different smart contract universe, right? And so we created a, 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 a standard um, which is called ERC, well, it's, it's EIP 2665 at the moment. We haven't still, we're still doing, putting it through the final ERC process because we just haven't had time to do it yet, but it's, it's functional right now and it works. Um, but what we did was we, in the case of Cryptograph specifically, because the royalty is such a core part of what it is as, a, as an asset and what it does, um, we implemented quite a hard version of the royalty function. So we actually implemented it at the transfer level of the token. So when it comes to a cryptograph specifically, if you wanted to move it away from the cryptograph platform or move it to a third party market base, you can't actually move it without first paying the, the, the fee that goes back to the creator and the charity. Now, there's a variety of, you know, disagreement and agreement on this in the space right now. I mean, it's a very forceful way of doing it, but because in our case, it's such an intrinsically important part of what we do, we've taken that approach. The other approach, which is also in our standard, which the developer can implement if they wish to, is that the creator of the smart con of, 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 the, of the NFT can stipulate what other platforms they trust 
if you will. So they can say, okay, OpenSea, we're happy to use, Super Rare, we're happy to use, I'm happy for my things to be sold in all of these other uh, uh, places. But um, what, and, and, and what that does, that says that the creator trusts these platforms to say what the actual selling price was when it sold on that platform to the NFT so that the NFT gets the right information and can pay out the right royalties. Because there's a potential, what we call Oracle problem here, where you know it's possible that if the platform was not was being um, uh, 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 malevolent, if you will, or not you know not 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 obeying the rules, if it sold for say a thousand ETH, the platform could say, hey, actually it only sold for one, and the NFT would only understand one, and then it would give you know zero point one back to the charity. But the, the, so so there's a variety of different ways of doing this. The two that we think are the are the best right now is. One, the creator gets to say which platforms they trust, and then we trust that those platforms will correctly give the right information to the smart contract and the NFT. And then the other is hard coding it at the transfer level. Um, and then the other way is sort of socially enforcing the, the, the royalties. But, you know, I think that that's a lovely idea, but I'm not sure how practical it is. Like if I was to say to you a few weeks ago, if gas fees on Ethereum were optional, would you pay them? A lot of people probably wouldn't, right? Um, and so the same, I think, goes for, 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 for royalties in many ways. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting space right now. Um, uh, there's lots of, you know, people innovating in, in, in how to do it. But, you know, eventually I'm sure there will be a, you know, cross-chain NFT royalty standard that will be developed, whether it's a, an amalgamation of lots of other people's works, whether it's the one we're doing, whether it, you know, whatever it, however it comes about, that will definitely eventually happen because it's such a uh, a key part to the to the technology. Yeah, totally agree with you. Yeah, thank you, Hugo and Toshi. And uh, yes, let's move next topic. Yeah, so I want to ask to Vanessa uh, because you have been uh, doing, you have been. Uh, working for Binance Charity, also now you are working for Binance NFT. And what do you think the difference between NFT donations and just cryptocurrency donation? Yeah, I think, uh, so thanks for asking. I think both of them have really like strong application and it could be really helpful uh, to helping um, getting helping the, the charity cost to be promoted to the society, getting more fundraised and then increase uh, and, improve, and improves transparency. For example, for the Binance Charity, we have, uh, we, have uh, we established the, the NGO in 2018 and the goal has always been um, trying to leverage the transparency technology blockchain to really empower the whole charity development and global sustainable development. And we've been trying to leverage a lot of um, blockchain technology, especially like including tokens and NFT to really like help the community in need to, to do fundraise and then to make sure that all the money could go directly to the end beneficiary without any middleman and transaction costs. Um, and for, for crypto itself, it has significant, whether it's, you know, pure crypto or NFT, it has its own uh, benefits in uh, global donation, efficient and transparency. Those are uh, and those are the advantages that all of them have. And in particular, um, for, for cryptocurrency, uh, comparatively, uh, it might be easier to really convert it to fiat in some cases, um, but it could only happen in, in countries where fiat channels are available. And for NFT, um, I think it has, it would add more spice or more cultural elements on top of the culture, on top of the token to make things a lot more interesting. And mm -hmm. the application could be broadened other than just being a, 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 a credit. Um, for example, like let's take an example. Uh, for Binance uh, and Charity, there's like a significant flagship, flagship project called uh, Pink Hair Token, where we donate um, Pink Hair Token to women's, uh, young women in, in Uganda to claim their uh, sanitary pads. And for, for, for and, and we, we usually just give them the token for the girls to redeem their sanitary pads from the wholesaler that we found, and then the wholesaler could claim it from, from Binance. Uh, it's easy transaction and with the fiat channels. Um, I think like if the NFT could be involved back then, uh, we could make it even more special. For example, like we could um, provide a, a detailed NFT 
where it comes up with a lot more information re regarding the whole campaign, regarding what this uh, lady needs. And also, uh, it could be a really interesting work for people to actually donate uh, to this program uh, so that the whole ecosystem would be more engaging and interesting throughout the whole uh, process. Um, so I think, and other than that, um, so that would be one element thing that like how NFT and, and, and cryptocurrency could be combined together. I think like if they could be combined together, the whole project would be a lot more interesting. Other than that, um, NFT could actually be an application uh, to record a, a, a lot of stuff other than uh, just donation. For example, when, we come, when it comes to charity, most cases, what you think about it, how we can fundraise more for the, for the, for the NGO, how can we execute better? But there's another group of people that we have not usually pay attention to. They are volunteers. How do we incentivize them? Of course, using social tokens, we could record their, their volunteer time, et cetera. Um, but other than this token to be transactable, the transactable token, is there any other way to record what they do in a fun way and memorable way? I think NFT could do that because uh, when we are pushing the NFT for good projects in, in China, um, we try to launch a, a project to incentivize um, volunteer lecturers to talk about sex education in remote areas of China. Because sex education is super important, yet it's somewhat the topic that people can really want to talk about. And uh, we kind of, um, we, and we launched, so that's why we launched the NFT for a good project and issue an NFT, a volunteer NFT uh noting down the thank you notes, the um, the design, have a really key design and noting down all the contributions they make when they become uh, uh, the sex education lecturer volunteer. So by having this NFT token, of course you can sell them for, for money, but at the same time, it's a really good document recommending, recognizing that you are a qualified educator uh, regarding the sex education and is also a proof of your bravery and courage to really talk about a topic that nobody wanted to talk about and support kids in, in, in remote area for things they really needed. So in conclusion, I would say that NFT has unlimited imagination space for in charity. Um, it could be uh, for artists to convey their creativity, auction it up and donate to charity they want to support. It could also be a really fun way for, um, for artists and charity to kind of like collaborate together, create something new and then for fundraising. At the same time, you could always, always cover different kinds of stakeholder in uh, charity sector to really fully activate them to be part of this ecosystem. So I would say that um, it, I, I think like blockchain, whether it's crypto or NFT would be a really exciting application for charity. That's my <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. And so maybe, you know, I have been the operating donation platform, crypto donation platform by myself, but that was really difficult to get to donate. But after I changed the donate uh, with NFT uh, mm -hmm. charity, so mm -hmm. much easier. I yeah. mean, because so if I ask to people, please donate, please donate, but so uh, no one... <laughs> <laughs> I know they don't feel engaged I feel like yeah that's something I haven't mentioned is that people who donate in money they they feel that it's more than just oh I want to support this social cause I want it to be memorable it's an experience that I want to have including like I'm actually knowing that first I'm helping people second of all I am doing something good presenting my own identity it's something that i take action to the build of my own entity and i think the nft could actually that's why i that add more cultural element into it to make the whole campaign more engaging that's why i think like uh yeah i think it's, it's a good sign like your charity and also for both financiality after we launched the nft for a good campaign we got so many supporters and it seems that people would love to convert what they think what they conveyed and build up their message in the way of art and then at the same time donate them so it's a really mm -hmm. interesting way. And I think it fixes a lot of issues. Because usually if you're an artist and want to donate to charity, it's pretty hard because you need really hard to find a way to sell a physical copy. But with the NFT, the whole bridge is like built and the whole platform is along with fluid. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Vanessa. <clears throat> and so Hugo or uh, Toshi, do you have any opinion or comment about this question? So my question was, yeah, how different from uh, NFT charity and cryptocurrency charity donate? Yeah, I mean, I would just add more to what Vanessa was saying there in terms of 
you know, just donating uh, uh, some Bitcoin or some ETH or whatever it might be is, is, you know, is the same in some ways as going to, you know, setting up a regular donation on your credit card for a charity that you like. You know, it's, 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 it's great and it's philanthropic, absolutely. But with an NFT, there's so much more potential because it's such a, you know, blank canvas to do things on that you could make that experience more memorable. You could turn it into a memento that they can have that's also tradable. You could create and add new access value and create a longer term relationship between the donator and the cause via this new medium uh, than if you uh, 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 just, you know, send some money every month or whatever, you know, with, with your credit card. And that's, I think, very powerful because, you know, it creates great, it can create greater engagement between the organization, the charitable organization and their donators it can give the donators something that they can have with them forever to memorialize that moment that also has value. Um, and, uh, you know, Vanessa touched on transparency and record keeping there as well. I mean, you know, the more information or metadata or whatever it is that you put into that NFT, um, the more you can track and see impact and what's happening. And yeah, it's just, a, it's such a powerful, tool you know an nft is this programmable canvas that you can do so much with and if you start getting creative about how you can apply that to the to the philanthropy sector i mean yeah i mean the the sky's the limit basically yeah thank you and and atosi do you have any comments mm, i'm totally agree with everyone but um mm -hmm. My uh, opinion is by my by combining donation with NFT, I think uh, we'll be able to create more interesting donation experience. For example, by linking a donation address to the NFTs issued by creators, I mentioned earlier, uh, anyone can easily participate uh, in donation. So alternatively, those who ask for donation will be able to increase. Uh, don donor uh, satisfaction by issuing NFTs as proof of donation. Furthermore, in the blockchain world, it is possible to know uh, when and what kind of payments the wallet has made and what kind of NFTs it has. So it will be possible to show the history of donation related uh, activities in the wallet. Uh, in this case, you will be able to help build new social relationships through NFTs, such as creating a community with friends uh, who share your activities. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Toshi, yeah. And so I, I, I'm very agree with you guys. And I think uh, people who have NFTs are easy to identify. So for example, I think it would be good to have a resource sharing, resource sharing society by giving tokens such as SDGs token. So only to those who have been holding charity NFT. Yeah, I, I really want to create a kind of this <laughs> place in near future. Okay, now uh, two minutes left. So at the last, uh, please, uh, Mm, message to everyone to see this conference. Yeah, so that's last message. Oh, okay, please start from Hugo. Yeah, so uh, again, um, thanks for having me. It's been lots of fun. Um, I ask everyone to definitely come and check us out at, at cryptograph.co and you can see some of the great pieces that we're going to be bringing out again from this month. And uh, no more gasless, I mean, no more gas problems with us either. We've got a new gas solution, which is going to be great. Um, right. And we've got a cool collector app that's coming out for everyone to showcase and um, keep keep your eyes open on mynft.com. It's going to be very exciting. And anybody who is looking at crypto or getting into NFTs right now, um, keep going down the rabbit hole. It's super exciting. As a technology, I think it's going to change so much. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there are a few places out there that I think are as exciting as this space right now. So get involved. Thank you. And the phrase Vanessa? Yes, uh, we look always look for uh, look forward to uh, having more creative minds to join us into the campaign to convert 
uh, creativity into real drive of sustainable development. So stay tuned for the Binance Anti Platform to be launched on June 24th. And then please definitely let us know if you want to join the Anti for Good campaign by reaching out to Binance Charity. We will, we will look forward to working with you um, to maximize your impact with the biggest crypto uh, community in the world and then uh, really support the global sustainable development. Thank you, Vanessa. And Toshi? Okay, thank you for having me today. Uh, I'd like to create a new form of social contribution using NFT and social tokens. And I look forward to everyone continued support. So thank you for today. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. And uh, so that was an amazing session. And I think this topic is very, very important for all of us. And uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hey, everyone. Welcome to our panel today, where we'll be talking about all things collectibles. My name is Travis, founder of High Street Market, a marketplace for redeemable limited edition products that uses DeFi technology to solve liquidity problems in all asset trading. Joining us today, we have two of our core members, Jenny, who started out in the traditional antique and art world at Sotheby's and moved her way into pioneering various sales and production models for digital art in the late 2010s. We also have Gary, a dear friend, but also the most deeply entrenched person I know in the old asset market. If you want alphas on trading card trends from basketball to Pokemon, he's your guy. So let's start things off with you, Jenny. Tell us a bit about your journey and how you ended up here in the metaverse. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny. I run a VR startup as well, and also I'm a digital art collector. Uh, so my journey actually started off is antique market. Uh, so in 2010, I was actually um, working at uh, Sotheby's. So back then I was uh, doing lots of art dealing on the side as well for Stoneware. Then later on, uh, because my background is in electronic art and film, um, after I moved to um, Silicon Valley, I get very excited about the virtual reality. That's how I got into the space and gradually transition into the more digital art. And in 2017, I started to uh, sponsor and um, producing and also collecting uh, VRR specifically and being uh, having multiple work being premiered at the international um, film festival and uh, multiple um, uh, institution and museum as well. So that's sort of my journey. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. So it looks like um, a lot of it kind of falls into place as technology develops. Um, a lot of these age-built industries are seeing a lot of changes because new newer players are coming in, digital natives are essentially reinventing um, the way art is created. So the way collections and production happens also uh, change with the times. So it's really interesting uh, for you to kind of see the old ways and then transition into the new ways. And we definitely will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, how about you, Gary? I know your your journey kind of is is, is quite interesting. You know, we met in India, and uh, it's uh, it's been quite interesting seeing you know all sorts of different endeavors that you've done. Obviously, corporate work to nonprofits. You know, what made you start collecting things? Like, what made you really um, start diving so deeply into this this deep water of collectible? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, with collectibles. It's interesting because, yeah, obviously, like we've talked about, you know, my work history and things like that. But with collecting, to be honest, it's one of the earliest things I've done in my life. It's by far the earliest hobby I've had. When people ask me, oh, how long have you been? You know, I'm 34 now. People ask me how long you've been in the collecting game. I say I've been in the collecting game for about 25 years. You know, it sounds ridiculous. But if you ask a lot of people in the industry, mm -hmm. this is really the truth uh, for a lot of us. Collecting really started out completely not as a business, but mm -hmm. rather just this was, you know, pre-internet sort of kind of, you know, dating myself here. But in a pre-internet world, this is the way we showed our fandom was, you know, we, I loved NBA at the time. Yeah. Um, I loved Magic Cards at the time. And sure, uh, <laughs> to a certain extent, maybe I was too stupid to play Magic Card at a high level. So I just collected the cards, right? And play the mm -hmm. cards. Same thing with Pokemon. Like at the time, you know, we never really assumed that it would become a business, but you know, over the last 20 years, um, frankly, I think even though our parents might say that it's a trend or we'll get over it someday, those things I said, NBA, Pokemon, Magic cards, I still love them to this day. So now that you know we are a bit older, we have a little bit more disposable income, 
this industry has also kind of you know exploded into a full on business, right? There's uh, yeah. places like StockX. There's places that can enable uh, things that really resemble you know the high end art market in terms of sales, mm. or can resemble the stock market in terms of uh, you know high volume liquidity for some of these pieces. And so you know it's yeah. now become something that uh, I can do really even as a profession. I think like, you know, talking about how things are resembling the traditional art market that we talked about earlier with Jenny, um, I think the two worlds are merging together in a very interesting way. And, you know, you talked about how growing up, that's kind of something you want to do. And then now you can turn it into a living. I think this speaks to the next question as well about demographics. Who's actually in these marketplaces? Um, you have... You have all these collectors that Jenny were talking about, but of course, like, you know, we always hear about these shoe flippers as well, you know, people you know, buying a pair of Jordans and then flipping it for five, six X, even more uh, on stock X like you were talking about, um, you know, just, just, just wondering, you know, is it, you know, you know, kids growing up and all of a sudden they now have money that they're just buying up all the stuff they couldn't, uh, or their parents wouldn't allow them to buy back in the days, so, you know, who's actually dominating this market? Who's playing? Who are the players? Um, I, I guess this is a question for you first, uh, Gary. Yeah, it's it's a complex question, but I do think there's a there's a clear way to look at it. So there's two ends of the spectrum, right? And you might be able to say this exists for a lot of things, like you mentioned with the the sneaker market. On one end, there's the collectors, those that are there really for their own personal enjoyment to you know fulfill a certain personal journey just to accumulate things that they want to accumulate for the brands that they like, whether it be NBA, Fortnite, you know, Pokemon, whatever. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, like I said, because there's so much money entering the industry, now the flippers have got into it, right? Some people even said that the recent, you could say a little bit of the plateau of mm -hmm. the sneaker industry is partially due to the fact that a lot of that money and a lot of that energy just went into flipping cards. So got you it. can definitely see it because the bot game has increased right now. Like all the big vendors of cards, you're not going to be able to buy off their site because people have, you know, botted the hell out of it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. these sites crash on day one. Uh, but in terms of the demographics and who makes it up, because of that, the market's also, you know, split up into different sections. So, you know, in terms of the cards these days, crazily enough, right, you can have cards that are sold for well north of $4 million for a single card. Mm -hmm. I would say there's a fair bet that's the collector market. You know, you're not going to get super liquidity on a $4 million card. Yeah. At the same time, you have NBA Top Shot, right, NFT, yeah. or you're going to have cheaper cards that are maybe like $10 a pack. For those, you're going to really see those botters. You're going to really see those flippers, the people that are happy to even just do a you know five-minute arbitrage if Got they it. can, just sell yeah. it flipping. It's all about a volume whenever it comes to something digital, right? Yeah, for sure. And um, the last point I'll just say is that in terms of the flipper market, right, I do say I don't want to generalize, but you're going to really see that 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 younger skewed demographic, right? You're going to yeah. see those like 16 to 17 year old hype beasts that need yeah. their parents permission to unlock their PayPal, you know, right. enter that kind of flipping side. But of course, there's people like that in the, the, the uh, collector game, too. But, you know, yeah. I would say these days, that's the biggest kind of new face you see at these shows. Is the, yeah. is, is the seller the young reseller flipper. the Gen Z's coming up with with all the new ideas and the new innovative strategies or even just things they learn on TikTok from from their influencers and stuff like that. Um, I think that's For super sure. interesting from from a demographics uh, standpoint. Uh, what about you, like Jenny, on your side from a traditional art market? Yeah, so I think for traditional markets, actually, definitely more centralized and, and, and regulated compared to, let's say, the, the shoe market, for sure. And because uh, it started off as, like, you know, there's uh, a very wealthy patron and uh, also the old money, the generation. For instance, when I start off in a more, in terms of antique trading or um, uh, auction houses, these are 200 years old, right? So sure. they, is there, is, they symbolize the, the wealth and social status in a way. I remember when I was working at auction houses, most people think that's, means like a certain social status, even for the training right. session, uh, uh, you know, our uh, HR will tell us that your clientele are millionaires and billionaires, right? So that's yeah. something always has to do with money, uh, this market, but also the foundation was built on uh, people appreciate the art and also the histo uh, historical value of the art. So from like even the antique side in, in, in terms of trading, these people are usually in their 50s, 40s, and they have a lot of uh, money, not just money, 
money, but also expertise, you know, to become a collector. Uh, so that takes a lot of uh, our training and, and, you know, travel around the world. Of course, it's also a small circle, you know, who you meet, things like that. But gradually, you see, it's very interesting. I, like a couple of years ago, I met this very young collector uh, at, at, at Forbes uh, 30 Under 30. He got on the list because he is a art collector. So I was really shocked, like, what does it mean? Because uh, back then, to me, art collector is a very serious word uh, because yeah. it probably takes 30 yeah. years. Yeah. If I back then, in, in my mind says, if I want to become a collector, first, I need to probably be a millionaire or a billionaire. And secondly, yeah. I need to acquire like this uh, 26 years of uh, expertise to say yeah. I'm a collector or this uh, more, you know, uh, have a good, uh, reputable, uh, uh, you know, collection. But now it seems very different. It seems like, you know, even for contemporary art, art market, because, you know, there's our PR move, you know, tons of collaboration with different type of brands. So uh, even artists are very different nowadays. So you see like this um, age, uh, people are getting younger, like they're in their 30s, uh, in their 20s. Yeah. And of course, some of them, their family are in the uh, in the in the art market as well. There's a couple of my classmates back in college. They're, uh, I didn't know that, but their family are uh, actually own one of these like the biggest art collections. So definitely, their kids will be kind of you know carry on that kind of legacy in terms of, you know running the gallery. You know have a little bit like young representing the young voice. You know we're giving voice to younger uh, artists. That's really interesting. So you're you're saying that from from a traditional perspective, a lot of the uh, younger ch younger kids and generations are coming in here, uh, more so inheriting and learning from their parents who are already art collectors. And for on Gary's side, I think it's slightly different, right? Mm. Um, on that side, uh, kids are kind of challenging their parents' perspective. Uh, perhaps most of their parents are not very into what their kids are doing and, and question a lot of the actions that they're 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 playing with online. Um, so this is quite interesting where you have both younger audiences coming in here, but from two different worlds, but they're kind of merging in the sense of, you know, that they're changing what collectibles are, the objects in which represent art. And I think that's something that's really interesting. And with the rise of virtual worlds, virtual concerts, and virtual everything, I think we're really seeing a new renaissance here. You know, speaking of virtual worlds, let's actually do a quick change in scenery. If you guys want to quickly follow me and get some fresh air. And welcome to Nanto in Taiwan. Fun fact, decades ago, oolong tea was actually invented here. And this area served as one of the largest marketplaces for tea in the world. Which leads me to my next question. With the recent rise of NFTs, how did the collectibles market change? Uh, maybe you, Jenny? Mm, I don't necessarily think this is like a huge difference in terms of the artwork, but definitely I think the market is very different and the distribution is different. And I think for NFT hype, it really, really uh, put a spotlight on the uh, digital art. So every day you open the Instagram, you're actually consuming digital content, digital assets, digital art but we don't pay for it, right? Because there's never this idea with ownership, but I think with NFT, that's something, uh, as a tool, it really changed that and changing the perception of that. I, I think that yeah. makes uh, NFT quite unique in this case. Interesting, so before NFTs, a lot of digital art, like the memes that power the crypto world, has been taken for granted because they aren't seen as laborious compared to, say, a traditional painting. But now with digital marketplaces, they somehow found value. What about you, Gary? From traditional trading cards to game skins, the digital evolution in alt assets actually differ quite a bit compared to art, right? From I remember the days just going to hotels to meet with people to trade, right? That yeah. I suspect in the fine art market does not happen. People do not trade Picasso's for Matisse, right? Um, maybe they do, oh. but but I we started from there to you know to oh. evolving to eBay to evolving to even high end auction houses that specialize in sports memorabilia. But along the way. I think it is, you know, the high liquidity is always a huge struggle. Um, it, these days, because the industry is so popular and you have rappers and actors yeah. that are all saying it, the athletes themselves will say, I collect myself or I collect my you know, fellow teammates. Yes. Uh, you know, at the low end, I would say, you know, $10,000 and below, there's a lot of uh, places like in eBay that's going to give you actually pretty decent liquidity. If you want to sell it tomorrow, boom, mm -hmm. you can make it happen. Uh, but at the high end, very hard, you know, it's going to take like a couple of months to, to move something like that. So where I think that, you know, the digital yeah. asset kind of game, um, you still, you know, I, I would say it still represents, like if you say the CSGO market, 
Um, yeah. It's kind of informally built, you know, it's not really kind of this blockchain. It's, it frankly has nothing to do with blockchain, right? No. It, liquidity was never built in mind when CS thought about um, the <laughs> idea of having skins. It's, it's actually very industrious young kids yeah. who built an informal market, right? right. So, but randomly, you know, you have skins that are worth you know, upwards of $10,000. And so yeah. um, to this day, uh, this is one of the biggest, biggest challenges by far, which is um, how do you create accurate pricing, right? Like mm-hmm. if, especially with, with cards, right, where you can collect 20, 30 different types of players, you view them kind of like stocks, right? Like if they win yeah. a good playoff game, you're hoping the price will go up. But if there's yeah. no liquidity, there's no data. And yeah. so who's to say, right, if John Moran wins a playoff game, is it going to pop his you know, thing, yeah. uh, his cards 10% today? I don't know. I wish I knew, but yeah. so yeah, I, you know, that's the hope. That is the hope of so many of these upcoming platforms. That's some really good insight over there. Absolutely. Liquidity is something the all asset world has struggled with since day one, and also the primary problem High Street is trying to solve with, with DeFi technology, of course. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you both for coming, and thank you everyone listening in the audience. Stay tuned for more news on High Street, and we'll see you next time. So hello everyone and thank you for watching this session. So some people say NFT bubble is finished, but we are not thinking it's uh, finished because the, this is just beginning. And so this session is mainly for NFT and DAO. So before NFT, many people are thinking DAO is very close to DeFi, but now that's uh, NFT and DAO, NFT and DeFi is more very closely. So today we are, uh, we, invited very interesting speaker from all over the world. So please speak, talk about yourself one by one. By one. So for example, start from the get Suji. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Suji and uh, founder and CEO of Mass Network. Uh, we also run the equity company called Suji Tech. Uh, so what we're trying, what we're trying to do is to bridge the web two and web three. Uh, so I've been involved into the so-called crypto, you know, crypto anarchy, like uh, these kind of group of people since 2015. So that's why I started to know the word uh, DAO, right? Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which imply you have a way to form a group of people with some kind of governance without involving in the existing current, you know, governmental system. Very, very amazing story, amazing uh, ideology. And then uh, there's small and slow achievement in this industry, but very, very small so far. And that's why I'm still here. <laughs> so that's my personal background. And we're many bridging the Web2 and Web3 from the, the mass network. Hey, Yusan. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, I, you know, the topic here is that the NFT bubble is not over. And I agree 100%. And I think that NFTs will become a trillion dollar market class very soon and multi-trillion dollar asset class within the next uh, uh, couple or a few years. Uh, And what's going to power this transition into a huge asset class will be infrastructure for, for NFTs. So NFTs right now are very similar to crypto in 2017. 
people have good ideas, they raise a lot of money, but there's nothing you can really do with your tokens. 2017, there were exchange tokens, which had some kind of utility, but people had a very difficult time to use their tokens. And so when prices stopped going up, they all dumped. We almost reached a trillion dollar market cap. And then we had a crash that lasted 2018, 2019. During that time, you had DeFi, which was built. And DeFi became the infrastructure, which allowed to have on-chain lending, staking, yield aggregating, um, synthetic positions, all the kind of stuff that people love to do in DeFi, which allowed a second wave to become much bigger. So I'm the founder of the Jenny Metaverse DAO, which uh, is a collective which owns NFTs and fractionalizes them on a platform called Uniquely. Uniquely, I believe, is the best fractionalization platform because it responds to a lot of um, game theory problems that some other platforms have. And my view is that fractionalization will be very important because this will be the foundation to everything else that happens in the infrastructure. So Jenny, the Jenny Dao uh, controls funds, which are going to be used for acquiring NFTs. The NFTs are acquired through, the decisions to buy NFTs are, are done through a community vote. Uh, anybody can offer proposals for the votes and anybody who's a token holder can, can vote on the proposals. Then uh, the funds themselves are held by a multi-sig, which is responsible for enacting the wishes of the community. So you've got uh, decentralization on, on multiple layers. Uh, and it's really going to be exciting to see what, um, what the community decides to buy. I think buying NFTs is very difficult. And as a communal decision to, to acquire these, I think it's going to uh, bring a lot more brain power. Okay, thank you. So the next, uh, Yudai-san, please explain a bit yourself and uh, the reason why you have so much interest about uh, DAO. Okay, thanks. Thank you for inviting me here to hear. I'm Yudai. I'm a co-founder of Fracton Ventures. Fracton Ventures is a company which is located in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, we have committed in Web 3.0 as education and we have committed to our DAO ecosystem. And uh, we are also we are in are researching on our investment DAO, or uh, how to uh, manage our DAO funds uh, from our DAO's governance, and also our uh, we are supporting on um, top tier NFT top tier artists our first minting NFTs already. So our uh, yeah, that's the uh, story of my company, and also my first interest in DAO was probably the DAO. Uh, the DAO was a really uh, huge name of DAO history, we think so. And also, after a few years, uh, uh, last year was a bubble of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, DeFi. Uh, the DeFi boom, behind the DeFi boom, many of DAO has activities or uh, was working on the discussing about uh, uh, how to governance or uh, to uh, make a new proposal, make a new progress for DAOs. Uh, since then, I was supporting on many of DAOs or as I as a one of members. And uh, many of DAOs are... Uh, yeah, I think that recently now, DAO and NFTs become more and more closely. NFTs becoming more and more very important aspect for developing the DAO more in the community feeling. So do you think that how NFT accelerated the DAO culture? Maybe um, I'll just comment on something, is that running a DAO for NFTs is actually quite difficult because buying NFTs is very difficult. Uh, you know, buying NFTs is much more difficult than buying normal ERC-20s. If I want to say I'll buy a million dollars of any altcoin and I'll have 20 people put their hand up, if I want to buy a nice collection of CryptoPunks, it takes a lot of time and research. Um, so the, the advantage of a DAO is that you surround yourself by people who, are, who really have a lot of niche knowledge uh, to, to understand all the different rarity traits between all the NFTs, um, which, which really takes a lot of effort. Uh, the disadvantage is that 
uh, when you when everything has to go through a governance proposal and community vote, um, it's it becomes uh, a lot more difficult to to buy NFTs because you're signaling to the market at what price you're willing to buy, and it's very easy to get front run, and it's very easy to um, to to have the price negatively influenced by your own decisions. And so what you end up having to do is, is uh, go mainly for private sales of NFTs, which is uh, more difficult than you would, for example, just buying uh, on, a, on a private basis. Um, so I think there's really advantages and disadvantages to having DAOs for NFTs. Um, but all in all, um, the whole concept of, of NFTs really is, is based around these communities. And if the community can make decisions, then I think it becomes more powerful. So I actually would like to cite some like some some quote from David Bowen. David Bowen is very famous, like uh, rock, rock and roll star um, back in the 90s. So in back in the 90s, when he's super, super famous, super like hot that time, he actually issued a bond for, for David Bowen. So you actually as a bank, it's a, it's a regulated security. Um, you can actually buy as a financial institute and buy David Bowen special, not NFT, some kind of like um, bond or some proof and you can earn some like interest or whatever from his revenue for his uh, certain uh, album and certain music. And then uh, we all know that thanks for the new technology, especially the peer-to-peer -peer network and, and all these ones, the, the the sales of the record just crashed. So he got he got a bad time. And then we with, with the new 10 year came, you know, like after 2010, 2015, with the Netflix, with all these kind of you know streaming media platform, uh David Bobin's like um income recovered. So the bound actually recovered. Uh, in my opinion, that's the first kind of NFT. Even though it's, uh, it's regulated security at that time, have some kind of generate revenue and related with some kind of IP. Uh, so, in my opinion, a DAO with NFT is is more like something. Um, not not only the investment vehicle; it's much more like something you can you can purchase. You can you can let it uh, run and become an evergreen structure. You don't have to worry about exit or whatever. You know, from from the LP perspective or the DAO member perspective, you can you can exit anytime enjoying any time the underlying asset might be some some great music great movie and i mean right now we only have painting we don't have like people it's not enough right so so uh i'm super bullish on this idea i mean just imagine that in minecraft you actually own a land and then this land will generate a lot of you know animals in the cyberspace and, and they can generate revenue and then you own this nft and the dao actually is the the DAO is the acting government of the cyberspace. So that's my feeling. And you know, in order to know which part of this world is governance under this this government, uh, you need an NFT. So, so in that in that in that in that perspective, every passport you know we hold is um, an NFT label that our government issued to us, and our government is yet another DAO in the physical world. That's my opinion. We are in order to we, we need to do something to achieve this, right? Um, and uniquely is doing good. And for from the mass perspective, we're trying to do um, trying to say, uh, hey, what if you can stay in the web two and do all the amazing thing? Like one example is the tweets, right? Every tweet actually should be part should be part of an NFT DAO or should be some NFT. And we also see, uh, we also saw Jack Darcy sold his first NFT for first tweet as an NFT for $3 million, uh, done by a company called Valuable, which we are actually an uh, investor. Uh, we're very surprised by this news because we don't really expect Jack will sell his NFT and we don't expect it's $3 million. But, um, you know, later on, you know, I believe some KOL will, will make their um, tweet uh, to a Twitter or Instagram a DAO and you can buy the DAO share. And then the asset is his, his or her tweets or uh, Instagram post or YouTube video, that's the NFT content. And then it's gonna be up and running, up and running. Uh, my, my, maybe some investor will lose money, like David, David Bowen's um, security, actually where people lose money. 
because he's not really that hard right now. Uh, but I, I think someone should have a try. Some mainstream, some mainstream artist, some mainstream um, pioneer are gonna need to have a try with this. That's my opinion. And eventually, um, um, every passport we hold, every ID card we hold, it's just it another form of NFT our government put on on our identity. That's my that's my opinion. Maybe it's a little bit different from other people. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to uh, say my answer from DAO culture side. It's a uh, DAO. It's not just a community. It's over the community. You know. So uh, I think uh, NFT can accelerate our DAO culture if NFT can uh, use as like as passport for entering to DAO or can show to uh, any of uh, exclusive or uh, uh, picture, exclusive movie, exclusive contents for NFT holders. So it means that NFT, if DAO can accept a uh, specific NFT or uh, in, in DAO uh, zone, uh, DAO can separate, DAO can create a separate community inside of one DAO. It's uh, a unique point, I think so. And uh, uh, it can be uh, used by our uh, NFT function. Uh, honestly, this is our first time to announcement that uh, we are, were, we became a partner of uh, Mintgate. Mintgate is our NFT our permission the website, uh, which can uh, um, be made, made of any of NFTs. So uh, it's uh, I my personality, my opinion is that our NFT can accelerate a DAO. Uh, scale for uh, uh, and it's not just our uh, art zone, art specific zone, uh, art or uh, any of other culture zone. Our uh, uh, DAO culture uh, will be uh, accelerated by our uh, NFT, our uh, NFT and the NFT functions. I think so. Okay, thank you, everyone. So, yeah, thank you. And actually, uh, we are not, now. I'm. The co-organizer of this event, uh, my and and I and my is now making the Kizuna fund charity funding the NFT platform, and we are thinking to making something like the how we say new special service for the only for the NFT holders. And I want to we want to not just for the one time service, but also like something a bit more between DAO and NFT community. So that's why I asked the uh, is. DAO governance token should be temp permanent or uh, is temporary one is fast group because the yeah for example I from a long time I talked uh, because the if it's only ERC20 uh we can't delete the very big holders percentage of the governance token. For example, if one person already keep the over 30 or 40 percent of governance token, it's very difficult to delete him. But in case of if it's a temporary power project and through NFT, it's more easy to adjust the balance after the token launch. How are people controlling the inside the DAO community, the power balance? It's it's a really important topic <laughs> around the DAO industry and DAO culture, I think so. And uh, many of DAOs are like a, a project that a founded company are decided to allocation uh, for uh, governance token mainly. So like uh, uh, mainly everyone wanting to uh, receive uh, more and more governance token uh, from project. So uh, it's a very uh, 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 common uh, investment thing is that uh, uh, every every crypto investor is really touched up early, five, high, early timing to the project and to invest in the uh, software or any of other investment terms to the token for getting a token and more and more so and, uh, but i think uh i i don't believe in or uh, uh this these or investors will support or are uh, more sustainable it's not sustainability for supporting of, of the project i think so so uh yeah like uh, i think open and fair is the key point uh of our uh, dao and uh, web 3.0 or uh, economy and the system and culture so are uh, the if uh, this community will want to uh, choose a, a fair and more than a currently system, uh, the like uh, airdropping to for NFT holder is uh, sometimes 
it might be a uh, better than currently uh, allocation system, I think so. In the real world, you have one person, one vote for in a democracy. Mm -hmm. And you elect your president or your prime minister, one person, one vote. Uh, it, it wouldn't be fair in a democracy if one person has two votes. In blockchain, unfortunately, I don't think the democratic system is good because you should, the whole concept of, of blockchain is based on economic incentives. Bitcoin works because of economic incentives, which makes sure that the, that the miners reach consensus, that it, you know, everything is based on, on uh, economic incentives. And same with proof of stake, it's all based on staking an amount of money, which is where, where you would suffer if you act badly uh, towards the community. Um, and as in, for the Jenny DAO, we don't have a one person, one vote system. We have a one token, one vote system. Um, and w when you have that, a person with more tokens will have more say in the decisions of the DAO. But that's really how economic incentives work. And if people want to have more say in the DAO, they should buy more tokens, which helps to support the value of the token, which helps to bring more people in the community or people in the community to stay within the community. And that creates the economic incentives for the DAO to continue forever in the future. Yeah, I mean, usually at the very beginning, democracy, well, we're not going to work. <laughs> that's, the, that's the crucial fact that um, I actually want to mention uh, two parts. One is like the, the, uh, the theoretical scenario, which I work along with people in the Radical Exchange uh, Foundation. They're highly influenced by the book Radical Market, which from the book, um, Glenn and, and the, other, the other people uh, have the idea of cogitative voting that um, it's something like you can vote more votes if you if you have more more um, token. Let's say token. Let's say if you have hundred token uh, and you, and and you can vote ten votes, and you have only one token, you can vote one. So you you're basically doing a square root of the token number. You can do all other like uh, parameters. So basically, that's something very cool. There's a uh, mathematical and economy uh, e economic ideology behind that says uh, or suggests that cogitative voting might work in some cases. And then later with the help of, you know, uh, of the foundation, Vitaly Buterin joined the foundation as a board member. And I also joined the Radical Exchange Foundation as a mentor for the fellowship program. Uh, they start to experiment the cogitative funding on Bitcoin so that if I am not really rich, um, I want to donate for this project for $10, 10 die and the other people don't need 400 die. Uh, the 100 die uh, will only count as 10 compared to uh, 10 die counts as three. You know, you do the square root. There's other parameter uh, adjusting, but that's the basic idea. So far it's working okay. And, uh, but the real case is we already see the very problematic part of this kind of voting and especially the on-chain governance for DAO. Uh, uh, I'll make two um, uh, examples in the real world. One is about the uh, same thing about the Gitcoin, right? Gitcoin token and GTC community. Uh, like last month, Vitaly donated a lot of Dodge coins, not really Dodge coins, like Dodge families. Um, and uh, if you just sell it, the Akita community will be very angry. If you don't sell it, um, well, that's no point for donation. Uh, then people started fighting in the Gitcoin uh, forum. Uh, I'm not involved in the fighting, but I followed all these comments. It's very interesting. There, another example is in the mask um, in the mask network. Uh, you know, during our ITO initial Twitter offering, we need to do a lot of voting on the Twitter. We have this voting DAO. You need a snapshot, and you can do that on Twitter. Um, the the bad thing is. As, as, as I mentioned that people don't really care about the, the real um, outcome if they don't have interest. So there was, um, there was a front, front running bots that actually um, tried to earn money in the ITO and we detected 
we able to freeze money from the boat, but we don't want to just use the admin key and and you know we store our money. We want to do a vote, and people just don't vote because okay, if you we if you freeze the money from the contract, we don't have we don't have benefit. We want to have small benefit, right? Probably one dollar. I don't want to vote for one dollar, and I don't care. And then this voting actually don't satisfy the minimum voter and minimum quorum, and then. It ends up we we don't we don't lock the funds from the from running bots. Um, so I say it's still quite early. You know, most of people have never voted in their life. The the only voting they probably did is for the AK before the eight, which is good. You know, they they vote for something uh, people lo- they like. Yeah, yeah. And uh, honestly, you know, I I feel um, still a long way to go. There still need to be some kind of governance um, governance structure that you have to you have to select people and you have to debate and then you have to delegate your vote power to that people that's the key for the pos that's why i'm quite supporting the shifting from pow to pos because you have a delegation you have the more than politics over the on-chain governance yeah thank you everyone it's uh there's very very good discussion today and so it's almost time so if you have some comment for the viewer please explain talk about a bit and shortly, please, or one by one. I think uh, doing an FT conference in Japan is very cool because first of all, Japanese people, you know, I lived 10 years in Japan and Japanese people love collecting things. I think it's really part of the culture. They love cute, beautiful things and they, you know, everybody has uh, collections of all kinds of uh, stuff. Um, and um I think a lot of the early uh, NFT community really came from from Japan. Nowadays, uh, NFTs are hot, and you know they, it's really become a global phenomenon. But for the past three years, it hasn't. And you guys, my son, if you're a 2018, if you're we're in NFTs, you're a super OG. Yes, I um, am. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think uh, Japan can really. Uh, Bring a lot to the world, uh, and and you guys have been there uh, a lot earlier, and you know a lot more than a lot of other people do. I mean, like we we all know what is mountain gox mean. Back in the early days, it's the trading card, <laughs> not for Bitcoin, right? It's for the it's for the trading card, the the first generation NFT in the physical world. Then it turns into a Bitcoin exchange. Then now we have NFT. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a little bit about more, little bit specified about Japan. I mean, I, if, I think like virtual YouTuber, VTuber, uh, VTuber, uh, like uh, Kizunai, like, you know, this kind of VTuber should be a DAO, should not be a company because, I mean, that's a virtual person, right? And uh, she might be able to live forever because we when when the ai is, is advancing now you can generate the audio from 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 her past video so he, she uh, kids and i will live forever and she's the queen of her um kingdom right and that will be something like a DAO. then then when you donate to her or, or purchase some virtual content of kids and i you are actually buying you should actually buying some nft to show your loyalty for the queen. And every Japanese anime uh, idol or anime character, especially VTuber, should become a DAO owner, should be running a DAO, and all the fans can can put money in and can interact with her, him or her, or it um, from the global perspective. And that's something I think very unique in Japan. I mean, in the, in the, in the end, we will all become virtual being, we will all become cyberized, um, cyborg, and starting from Japan. Well, like like Ghost in the Show, that's my opinion. I mean, if not really in Japan, I, I really don't really think it'll be other places in the, in the next 10 years. So, I mean, uh, I think Linker is also in today's conversation, right? So yeah, maybe we can do some experiment like virtual YouTuber down and, and every people join are already fan, yeah. It's very interesting idea. Let's start from today. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, please let you listen. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm totally agree with these are uh, opinions. So yeah, I'm I'm 
as as a Japanese, I think uh, Japanese culture is really a、uh, uh, fit for、uh, NFT spaces. I think so. And、uh, now Japan is a、uh, COVID affecting and、uh, a huge. It's bringing the huge damage to、uh, many of ca-、uh, cultures and、uh, industries already. Uh, so our、uh, uh, foreigners can't go to our、uh, Japan directly, but NFT can、uh, provide to our、uh, any of countries people directly. In this timing, it's super amazing technology, and I think so. And、uh, Japan has a lot of IPs, are like、uh, Kiki or、uh, Pokemon, or so so many famous IP in Japan. And so、uh, Japan will、uh, shift to or uh, uh, shift to and find a way how to collaborate、uh, NFT scene、uh, with our、uh, Japanese. A、big IPs are for making a new or contents and providing to new make a new value, or including a NFT and DAOs. So it's it's really、uh, amazing and it's really a key point of our Japanese culture and Japanese、uh, soft contents are for for the future. I think so. Yeah, and.、Uh, I think I, I I'd like to say one more thing. Our NFT is a movement of ownership. Our model, our from our currently our streaming or some other are just using our contents model. So our ownership, our every everyone are have touched our this ownership based model. Are in first time if NFT are everyone knows our NFT. So it's a really beginning of time on NFT to are making a new culture and then making a new movement. I think so. Should、uh, invite Maria Kondo to the NFT conference and clear everything from your house、mm-hmm. and only have everything in NFT version. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yes. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yes. It's done. So yeah. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for joining Non Fungible Tokyo 2021. So, that was the most amazing conference ever. So, I have been organizing this conference since 2018. And the first conference、uh, in 2018, the, at around only 50 people joined. But so, this year, 2,500 people attended. So that means、uh, 50 times more、uh, attended. Oh, that was amazing. Yes, and、uh, yeah, NFT is borderless, and we can gather i n g、uh, from all over the world, and we can、uh, make a fun. And、uh, so, yeah, of course, I will organize this conference next year. So please join and let's keep in touch. Yeah, thank you again for support and joining us. Bye bye.
Oh. Uh -huh. 